in. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to this uh, third day of uh, our this year's. Thank you very much to, the, to those who have been following us uh, yesterday and the day before yesterday. Thank you very much for, for engaging in the debates, uh, in the discussions, in our reflections. Thank you to the speakers and the panelists. And uh, for now, I'd like to invite to the introductory remarks and uh, welcome Ward uh, Volodymyr Turchinovsky, the Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences and someone who is, who is in charge of that conference uh, for the inspiration for us for today. Thank you. Yeah, uh, welcome. Uh, welcome to everyone. I'm really very, very happy. Um, uh, to welcome and to greet you all. I was thinking of um, what image uh, uh, would uh, fit best uh, when thinking of the conference, and I wasn't able to come up with something better than than a journey. I think this is this is what exactly this conference is. It is a journey. We are traveling through um, through time. This is our third um, day of the conference, and there is still one day ahead of us um, tomorrow and we are traveling um, through space as well from one city to the other city from one continent to, um, to a different country and as well as you our uh, viewers um, who are watching this conference and participate in this conference from very very different uh, places and locations throughout the whole world very warm welcome uh, to all of you i think i hope um, i know in fact that you are also enjoying this um, this travel we had, um, I believe, an excellent um, day yesterday with um, very insightful presentations. Um, I was particularly happy with, uh, with the students of uh, the Faculty of Social Sciences who did their presentations um, yesterday. And these were ethnic politics and economics students, as well as the students of, um, um, of our School of Public Administration and excellent contributions um, on the both parts. And uh, we had an, we had a fantastic panel from our colleagues um, uh, from the uh, from the Angelicum um, yesterday as well, uh, and very deep and profound um, thoughts we um, we heard um, in an interview which um, um, which we had with uh, uh, Austin Ivory uh, yesterday evening. So that was uh, that was a very full day and. For those of you who um, uh, didn't have a chance to watch all of this. Uh, I very cordially invite you to um, to our to the conference webpage where we post all the materials, which will be available for all of you. Um, so you can certainly take advantage um, of the ideas, thoughts um, uh, expressed um, uh, at the conference. And today we have another um, excellent day, uh, full of um, very interesting uh, speakers and presentations. We will have um, the students of our law school. Um, sharing with us their, um, their thoughts, ideas, and skills. Uh, we are very much looking forward to um, uh, a presentation from Notre Dame, from our um, colleagues and partners. Uh, we, uh, we are awaiting um, another um, interview, which Jose Casanova um, uh, will take uh, and will, um, will be interviewing uh, Catherine Marshall um, this evening. And certainly, we are very much kind of looking forward to um, another panel on human rights, um, followed by uh, followed by Lviv Lab format, um, another kind of very innovative um, format which we introduce uh, with our partners from Tuvier Misto and Lviv Lab um, as a part of this conference. So I'm wishing you all the best. Enjoy this uh, this kind of intellectual um, feast, and please do have some kind of emotion attached to it, as we all humans uh, would love uh, to do. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to the program. So step by step, we begin to unfold that wonderful and astonishing picture just just outlined by uh, Professor Torchinovsky, and we start with the. With, with with another panel um, offered by by the students of UQ, uh, particularly of of UQ Law School, on the legitimacy and permissibility of of the restrictions of human rights in the times of the COVID uh, pandemic. So for the next hour and a half, if I'm not mistaken, I'm I'm turning it over to Taras Leshkovich, who is the senior lecturer of of UQ Law School and his students. Thank you very much, uh, dear colleagues, 
ladies and gentlemen, listeners, viewers. Uh, I'm extremely happy to convene this third day of our annual conference on integral human development in the digital age. And uh, today we will begin with the mock parliamentary debates, as was already mentioned, on the quite relevant topic, especially in Ukraine, uh, on the permissibility and legitimacy of restricting human rights due to COVID pandemics. Uh, this is indeed a relevant topic for Ukraine, uh, where series of restrictions have been imposed since March 2020, uh, and in most cases was hardly any public or political debate. Uh, the quarantine measures imposed by the governmental regulations were heavily criticized by some of Ukrainian human rights organizations. The issue was even submitted to the Constitutional Court's consideration. However, the court quite conveniently avoided deciding this issue on the merits and uh, closed this aspect of constitutional appeal regarding the constitutionality of human rights restriction on procedural grounds. There was not much of a debate in the parliament, uh, either in March when the initial lockdown was imposed or later during the subsequent amendments to the legislation. Um, as reported by the SYNC Global Health Organization, while the COVID challenge is undeniably a serious threat that required a rapid and strong response, we need to ensure that states do not normalize oppressive surveillance and undermine human rights. Uh, the WHO declaration of the coronavirus as a global pandemic on March 11 prompted many countries to announce a state of emergency, thus opening the door for governments to exercise extraordinary powers. A uh, UN policy paper titled COVID-19 and human rights, we are all in this together, released back in April 2020, also emphasizes that human rights are key in shaping the pandemic response, uh, both for the public health emergency and the broader impact on people's livelihoods uh, and lives. Human rights put people center stage. Responses that are shaped by and respect human rights result in better outcomes in, be in, beating, in beating the pandemic ensuring healthcare for everyone and preserving human dignity. But they also focus our attention on who is suffering most, why and what can be done about it. They prepare the ground now for emerging from this crisis with more equitable and sustainable societies developing a peace. The world is facing an unprecedented crisis. At its core is a global public health emergency on a scale not seen for a century requiring a global response with far-reaching consequences for our economic, social and political lives. The priority is to save lives. In view of the exceptional situations and to preserve life, countries no choice, had no choice but to adopt extraordinary measures. Extensive lockdowns adopted to slow transmission of the virus restrict by necessity freedom of movement and in the process freedom to enjoy many other human rights. Such measures can inadvertently affect people's livelihoods and security, their access to healthcare, not only for COVID-19, to food, water and sanitation, etc. Measures need to be taken to mitigate any such unintended consequences. Having said that, that and without taking much more of your time, our today's mock parliamentary debates will focus exactly on this issue. To what extent and in what way can the state restrict human rights in order to combat the spread of the virus and save lives. So according to the rules of our debates, Ukraine is currently in the process of deciding on adopting new quarantine measures to combat the spread of the coronavirus disease. There are two factions within the parliament, the majority coalition consisting of members of few political parties and uh, currently having 55% of the seats of the parliament and the opposition party controlling in total 45% of the seats. Both factions have the opposing views on the matter. The majority coalition argues that in order to save human lives and stop the pandemic, we need to impose strict lockdowns and that following the constitution and the legislation is important, but can temporarily be sacrificed or suspended in times of crisis. The opposition party has a different view and claims that adopted quarantine measures should be carefully tailored to the challenge prioritizing respect to the rule of law and human rights and emphasizing the necessity to comply with existing legislation. So according to the rules of our debate, at the beginning, the majority coalition will have 20 minutes to present their opposition. After that, the opposition will continue with their argument, also having 20 minutes for their speech. 
Then the parties will have the change, chance to exchange questions to each other, beginning with the opposition party, posing questions to the coalition. Each question will take up to two minutes and the coalition will have up to five minutes to reply. After that, the majority coalition will have their chance to ask counter questions to the opposition. And at the end, uh, each party will have up to 10 minutes to present their final argument and close the plenary session. So with all of that, honorable members of the parliament, with this, I commence our plenary session and open the discussion of permissibility and legitimacy of restricting human rights due to COVID pandemics. Both parties have submitted their proposals in time, which have been duly regist registered by the Secretariat of the Parliament, and we now open the oral deliberations of the matter. Majority coalition, the floor is yours. Thank you, everyone. So the coalition wants to start the procedure. Uh, first of all, we must say that in February 2020, the world faced a disastrous and deathly disease. And it was unexpected, it was lightning-like, it was rigorous. No one, could have, no one could have known that something like that would happen. The world wasn't ready, both legally and economically. And we have to say that very soon after, the World Health Organization proclaimed this situation the world pandemic, which strictly imposes some obligations on the states. And a lot of countries have failed to make prompt and rapid measures and restrictions and impose restrictions in order to save people's lives. We'll see during our speech how it influenced a lot of people in different countries, in different regions, with various legal and political systems. It's a disaster we haven't coped with right now. And we're still tackling it. We're still fighting with it. And we strongly believe that if the strict lockdown is imposed in Ukraine, and if the strict lockdowns were imposed in the other countries, which we would demonstrate by strengthening our arguments, the world would have a better place right now. The countries would be opened, the borders will be opened, and the state would function and get back to normal again. It's important to note that <clears throat> no country was ready for such a threat, actually not living alone in Ukraine. And there were and there, is, there are still no laws that regulate state's actions during the pandemic. The collision actually stipulates that considers that the strict measures is the best way to protect our country from this pandemic. And we emphasize the importance of strict, uh, of strict, uh, pardon me, <coughs> a strict lockdown to protect our lives and to protect human lives, notwithstanding being followed by adaptive quarantine. So we cannot talk about rejecting the strict lockdown, but because the price is too high and we should consider this as the only way to save lives and to save our economy as we will deliberate later so first of all let's start with the right to life we want to refer to the opposition party that we do not object that ukrainian legislation and the constitution stipulates that the right to love is important and we do not neglect international laws and we do not neglect their importance. But talking about proportionality, talking about the price of people's life, we do consider that the price is very high and we need to strive to save people's lives in the most rapid way, in the most rigorous reaction as possible. Because we believe that the, the right to life is the, of the highest value for every state, for every authority. Uh, that is why we consider and we do take into account that the right to life is enshrined in various treaties. For example, it's Article 3 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's Article 6 
of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. It's also enshrined in different treaties, like the Convention on the People with Disabilities in Convention on the Rights of Children. It is also enshrined and set forth in the Constitution of Ukraine under Article 3. We do realize it. And we do realize that in Article 8 of Ukrainian Constitution, we have the rule of law and the principle of the rule of law. But we have to say that as the coalition party, as the government, we believe that the primary goal of the rule of law is to defend the people's lives. It, it doesn't depend on whether that's formal or substantive theory. We, we think that the rule of law is the right to life. And we strongly advocate for imposing a strict restrictions in our country, since it's the most effective and the fastest way to protect Ukraine. Firstly, especially in the winter period, due to the fact that most of the hospitals are overcrowded and many inpatient beds also are crowded. There is a lackness. We believe that only by imposing the restriction, we can save our lives. Secondly, a person can be a transmitter of such a disease since there are no symptoms and fighting with the enemy, if it's invisible, is much more harder. And we consider that waiting at home, stay at home for a while to live better life in future is the best idea in such situation. Also, also, I was the main argument that vaccination is not the reason to putting strict lockdown to an end. Because Ukraine has very little access to the quantities of such vaccines actually. And mainly all the vaccines are supposed to be given to people who are over 16 years old. However, in our hospitals, our hospitals are overcrowded with people who are much younger. We have a situation when the vaccines will be given to people who are already at home, who are staying at home, but we have a trouble with younger population. And that's why the strict measures is the best way to protect the lives of older people and younger people, elderly and younger people. So our position is to protect lives by imposing a strict quarantine measures and we'll show later how the strict quarantine measures saved lives in many countries and we want to do the same in Ukraine. Moreover, if the health argument is not enough for you, it's really worth noticing that the vaccine takes two shots to be efficient and it doesn't obviously mean that the person terminates to be a transmitter of the virus. So we want to refer to the opposition that we are not against adaptive quarantine as the final. But we think that firstly, we have to have strict lockdown while the vaccination is taking place and while we have the overcrowdedness in hospitals and then we can move to adaptive quarantine as the consequence of it. Moreover, we need to bear in mind that adaptive quarantine has uh, much more disastrous consequences on the mental health of humans. What we mean of what we mean under it is basically that uh, okay, you may say that people have lost jobs during the strict lockdown. That's true, but that happens everywhere, not just in Ukraine. The thing is that adaptive quarantine like people have unrealized hopes because they are said that you have to sit at home for three weeks in a particular region and they are hoping to return to their workplaces. They are hoping to renew their activity. But what if the government says, no, you have to sit one month more? Don't you think that it will be really detrimental for people in terms of psychological unreadiness? In terms, in terms of being hopeless, we do. Also, we strongly believe that strict lockdown is a, is a vital strategic thing and it is much more beneficial than adaptive quarantine. 
actually. Now, we would like to explain our position with examples from the different countries, and we will show that restrictions is a better position, it's a better situation, and we'll show with fact that, okay, for me, we'll show how the different measures, whether it's a restrictive quarantine measures, whether it's a strict quarantine or whether it's adaptive quarantine, and we'll show the difference We'll explain you how it was, and uh, we'll show you what is the better. We'll start with the situation in Italy. So, does the opposition uh, still doubt that strict lockdown is necessary? Numbers don't lie. To strengthen our position, and just to refer to the arguments that we have analyzed only just some region, some particular legal system, no, we didn't. We took countries with different political background, with different religious background, with different regional peculiarities. And if to start with Italy, we all know what happened there. We all saw those pictures where people were in metal coffins in military lorries. And it was dreadful. We do not want to happen this over and over again in Ukraine. Speaking about Italy, people were celebrating some national holidays, tourists were allowed, they didn't impose any strict lockdown right away. And what we saw, thousands of victims, hospitals are overloaded, Italy was craving for, for doctors from all over the world, even Ukrainian doctors were sent there to help. When they saw this situation, and they were shown in Ukrainian news, their only message was, we have to impose the strict lockdown until it's too late, and we have no one to lose anymore. But then, what we see right now in Italy is that they are still under restrictive measures. There are still some things where people and not all cafes, not all regions are open. That means that, yes, they did impose strict lockdown, but it was much later, and it was too late, and they lost a lot of lives. So if we look at the diagram, we see that 90, almost like 96,000 of people died in Italy, just because they didn't impose strict lockdown in time. And if they did, just 21,000 could die. Do you see this difference? We clearly do. No. Let's take a look at Great Britain. Actually, it has stood apart from other nations with its relaxed response to coronavirus and it didn't impose the strict quarantine measures. And what do we have now? Uh, because of that, we have a number of 121,000 compared to 23,000. And I suppose government of Great Britain admitted its mistake and now strict quarantine measures are imposed however even now in january 2021 they imposed a strict quarantine measures and even despite the fact that there is a vaccine at this moment so if such countries as great britain that has access to large quantities of vaccines still imposes strict quarantine measures what we do now in ukraine do we have to like make it easier for quarantine actually we believe that the strict quarantine measures in ukraine should be imposed until most of the people have a vaccine and in our reality it is not impossible in a closer future okay and let's look at the third country which is turkey we chose it just as an opposing country to those where where the state did not impose strict lockdown at once. So, the Turkey had the most fast-growing outbreak of virus, of COVID-19. It was much larger than China, it was much larger than the UK. And what did the Turkey do? They imposed strict lockdown right away. Turkey is, is a state famous for its one of the most severe measures in the world, as their response to COVID-19. So what happens there? Basically, people couldn't go, basically, local people couldn't go out for three months during weekends. 
they still have a curfew from 9 p.m. Uh, in the evening of Friday till 6 a.m. in the morning of Monday. So all the shopping malls are closed. All the markets are closed. Local people cannot go out even on weekends after 9 p.m. So what do we see in Turkey? This gave the result. Very soon, on the 1st of March, we hope to hear the decision of the local authorities and of the government of Turkey that those restrictive measures will be taken down, most of them. Because such severe lockdown, such strict lockdown, was so efficient that they can now, they can now take most of the measures away. And they can now work with tourists, they can still draw a lot of tourists to their country, and people can move freely. And what we see, that just 28,000 people died in Turkey. Compare those numbers with Great Britain and Italy. Now let's take a look at some more countries. Here we get Norway, Finland and Denmark. Actually, they were playing the same game and here results. But we would like to put a special emphasis on Sweden that uh, actually has been famously relied on some voluntarily measures, actually. And from the beginning, they allowed public gatherings of up to 50 per persons. And uh, now, step by step, the government has tightened its belt, actually tightened the quarantine measures, but what we have, this number is actually 12,000 of persons actually died and 10,000 persons could be saved if the quarantine was much more strict than it was in uh, Sweden at those time. But now we have that Sweden actually rolled up new restrictive measures in Sweden, but we would like to emphasize that even now when they imposing additional restrictive measures, this life couldn't be saved. Actually, 12,000 people died and this number could be 10,000 lesser than it is. But we actually anticipate that the opposition will argue that economy actually sacrifices uh, in such situation when there is a strict uh, quarantine. And we would like to show you this slide. It is actually a comparison of gross domestic product of second and the third quarters. Actually, as you see, uh, countries as Singapore, Germany, this country where actually the strict quarantine measures were imposed, and in comparison with Brazil and Italy, where um, adaptive quarantine actually was imposed. And we would like to show you that this actually graphic show you that even between the countries that uh, the countries that impose the strict quarantine measures and the countries that impose the uh, adaptive quarantine measures actually have the same damage to their economy but one thing is not the same actually the people's life actually countries that impose the strict quarantine measures have much more less deaths in their country and they don't have to be as uh, actually people of their country and economic impact wasn't so high and there is no such a difference between Italy with its adaptive quarantine and Singapore with its strict measures and with Germany compared to Brazil. Actually, here we have to measure all the situation, not in money, but in people's life. And we would also like to emphasize that, yeah, Sweden used the theory of herd immunity and they believed that voluntary measures will just lead to herd immunity and the quarantine will disappear. But don't you think that herd immunity is inhumane, is unethical? We do. And to sum up our speech today, we would like just to finish with the expression of Kant, which clearly shows that people's life are of the highest importance. Moreover, we do believe that probably the opposition will say that some of the rights were violated, some of the human rights were violated. But let's think about the EU. Ukraine is still in the red zone for the EU. So our people cannot enter 
the, country, the countries of the European Union. And what we see, we see that Ukraine has been having adaptive quarantine so far. And now we do have adaptive quarantine, but we are still in the red zone. We're still not allowed to enter the EU using tourist visas. Isn't it also kind of, in your opinion, violation of freedom of movement? Well, we believe that the EU takes measures just to save people's lives and to make sure that uh, Ukrainian citizens are, are not a threat and that Ukraine does take vaccine. So, if Europe closed borders for us, if Europe closed borders for other states, we do not think that we can say about violation of human rights to the freedom of movement. So the coalition considers that the strict lockdown is a must for now. And then we can proceed with adaptive quarantine. Thank you. Thank you to honorable representatives for expressing their position. And I would now like to invite the opposition party to express their views, their arguments. Honorable representatives, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as uh, the preliminary argument, please pay attention to the fact that our colleagues were talking about the strict lockdown, but they didn't even have a mask in their hand. So, dear ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mikola, and on behalf of the opposition party, I would like to invite you and welcome you on these debates regarding the intensity of the COVID-19 restrictions in the Ukrainian context. <clears throat> All our presentation is built on three main blocks. The first one relates to the governmental authority to introduce the restrictions in question, and I will present it. The second one would deal with the irrationality of the restrictions suggested by the majority coalition. And the last one would contain our suggestions about the current time. <clears throat> so, about the first block. As all of us may know, in Ukraine we have a very interesting document called the Constitution. And unfortunately, sometimes it seems like the majority coalition does not know about this document and the obligation this act imposes on them. By introducing the harsh quarantine measures, the government de facto restricts the freedom of movement, the freedom of assembly, the right to entrepreneurship, the right to labor, and many other rights and freedoms that do constitute the fundament for the democratic development of our nation. Article 64 of our Constitution enshrines one fundamental rule. The specific restrictions on human rights and freedoms may be established only under the condition of martial law or a state of emergency. The aforementioned rights and freedoms cannot be restricted by the arbitrary decisions of the government. But nevertheless, our majority coalition goes on suggesting the restriction of these rights without even introducing the state of emergency. Again, it is unlawful for the government to impose the restrictions of human rights without introducing the state of emergency. We do not have any state of emergency, and we know nothing about uh, the possible governmental plans to introduce it. So we can take for granted the fact that our government has no authority to impose the lockdown now. The coalition's position that following the constitution and the law on emergency situations is important, but they do temporarily sacrifice, they can be sacrificed in times of crisis, goes beyond all bounds. Under Article 19 of our Constitution, the bodies of state power are obliged to act only on the grounds within the limits of authority and in the manner envisaged by the Constitution. When the coalition asserts that it is okay to break the Constitution, it is unacceptable. As the citizens of Ukraine, we shall not tolerate 
any arbitrary acts of government, even if they have the legitimate aim. Such words and decisions of the majority coalition shatters all that tiny hopes of the last years about establishing the rule of law in this country, which would have the very serious repercussions not only for us, but also for those who come after us and for those who come after them. The rule of law is the shield that guards the democracy and the sustainable development as the guarantee of our prosperous future and disregard to it shall be not only slap in the face of our citizens, but also the great disrespect for our international commitments that defines us as the democratic state. Rechstadt, am I right, the honorable ladies and gentlemen from the majority coalition? By acceding to the European Convention on Human Rights and to the International Covenant of, uh, on Civil and Political Rights, Ukraine has undertaken the obligation to derogate from its obligations only when there is some officially proclaimed public emergency. By acceding to them, we have promised Ukrainian citizens and the international community that the human rights and our international obligations are not just empty words. But the lockdown the majority tries to lobby is contrary to these obligations, as it is clear that Ukraine did nothing for the quarantine measures to comply with Article 15 of the European Convention and with Article 3 of the ICCPR. And one should understand that the obligations could not have burdened our authority. It was not hard to introduce any state of emergency or notify the respective bodies of the international organs about the derogation. It is mere governmental negligence and failure to comply with simple requirements of treaties. And unfortunately, that, would, that will also have repercussions. <clears throat> As the ECHR mechanism acts to the full extent, we can expect thousands of potential judgments where Ukraine would be found guilty of non-compliance with its obligations, and it would be quite a serious burden for the Ukrainian budget. I hope that this our position would be heard by the majority coalition and the decision to introduce the lockdown would be reversed in order to maintain the legality in Ukraine. However, we cannot be sure that the majority coalition would listen to the arguments about legality. So, what should we do next? How could our citizens be sure that their rights and freedoms will not be violated by their own government? The question is simple. Under Article 55 of the Constitution, the rights and freedoms shall be protected by the courts. And it is very interesting because the Constitutional Court has already reviewed the lawfulness of the restrictions, but due to the rapid change of the governmental act regarding the restrictions, it was made too close to the case. However, due to the heightened scrutiny because of the possible violation of uh, human rights and freedoms, there was quite a serious possibility that the court would have struck down that act. And is there any sense to adopt the new act, even a harsher one, if in a few weeks it can be struck down? We believe there is no. However, we can presume that the mentioned arguments would not be enough for the government. So we will proceed to the arguments why the strict lockdown will bring us more harm than good. Thank you, everyone, and I would like to welcome my colleague Anna. Uh, thank you, Makola, and thank you, dear coalition, for your position. And I would like to talk mostly about the economic issue. So, first of all, uh, the coalition told us uh, that uh, the economic crisis cannot be omitted in any case. Yeah, because this is pandemic and we cannot uh, just help the economy to grow it. But I would like um, to say that we can lead this crisis to a total disaster like um, default, for example, or we can try to take all of the possibilities that we have to look at our needs at, and at real threats to look into the reality and try to come up with the best solution of what we can. 
We cannot track our citizens like China, for example. We do not have very strong institutions, for example, and this is our reality. But for the other case, we can do something. Okay, let's look at the pandemic. Uh, our Ministry of Health uh, taught that for today, one million, uh, one uh, hundred and sixty thousand people are recovered from the coronavirus. It means that they gain their immunity. So uh, all at all, we are all gaining the collective immunity. So we are not at the same conditions as we were at the beginning of the pandemic. Now it's different. The coalition says that, OK, now we have this uh, quarantine that are not very strict, but we have a strict lockdown. And what do we have? We don't uh, get um, we don't solve the problem at all, and we cannot do that. Uh, any country in the world can say that, um, okay, and from that, uh, from now, we um, have zero uh, people who can even potentially have coronavirus. Because this is issue, and we cannot solve it, like close our, our eyes and just put this strict um, lockdown for every uh, part of Ukraine. Uh, next is that a pandemic is not spreading like uh, uh, the same in all the regions. In some regions there is ups uh, and in some regions there is downs of that pandemic. That means that if we want truly to do our best and as a coalition state, and we totally agree with you on that point, that human life should be the biggest value and we also value human life the most and that is why we want to look at that problem in more complex way because pandemic is not just about coronavirus it's also about other spheres that are affected by the pandemic it's about lives human lives in general and we cannot uh, just secluded pandemic and say okay we put a strict lockdown on that and other lives uh, that can be affected we just say, OK, we will solve that problem later, later on. OK, so we understand that in different um, regions, there is different uh, spreading of coronavirus. And we cannot just say that in all regions, we need this strict lockdown. Another is about people and that mostly people are used to the coronavirus. We are not afraid as much as uh, it was at the beginning of the pandemic. Because now, even um, looking to the uh, strict lockdown in January for um, weeks, uh, we see that people were still meeting, still doing their things. A lot of cafeterias were working. It wasn't uh, just a case and you put the strict lockdown and people were sitting homes. Yes, some of them adjusted to it. Some of them just say, OK, no matter. Uh, I, I don't want to do that. And how you will track them? How do you, how do you expect uh, to force people sit at home? Yes, okay, you can force the business not to work. And then what do you have? You have a big hole in the budget because there is no taxes if business is not working uh, in, a, in a normal way. Okay, uh, let's look at our economy. Now, Ministry of Finance says a 10% um, of uh, is uh, like our unemployment rate is up to 10% when in developed countries there is up to 3% in like normal state. Um, so we have such a problem with unemployment. Okay, what next? Um, also, uh, like UN um, Office of Humanitarian Affairs taught that 80% of households in Ukraine has lose part of their incomes or lose their incomes at all. So they are living for their savings. 40% of them were fired. At least one member of the household were fired because of this pandemic. Have, um, let's look at our outside investors. What are the biggest investors of Ukraine? It, it is its own citizens that are living abroad gaining money there and putting this money into Ukraine to their families. Now they are all here in Ukraine, yes, because um, policies of other countries say that please foreigners go home, something like that. And now we have a lot of people who are unemployed, who um, 
who have no savings because one year is passed here in Ukraine and they need to to have something to do. What is the worst situation? It's when you have no possibility to gain money to supply your basic needs. And do you think that if people were just uh, without food or with um, little money, with no healthy food, would they think about restrictions about their uh, possible health problem with pandemic or would they just do anything to get the money protest rising criminality and everything like that because if we just close our eyes on economic issues we and think only about the pandemic is it won't work like that because pandemic we need to uh, think of it in uh, in the whole system okay and um, one more about tax holidays. Even if we have such tax holidays for business and you can say that, OK, it's not uh, a very big issue, we can help our economy. But economy and um, business is not just about uh, taxes. They need to pay their workers, they need to pay rent and so on and so forth. And if we destroy economy, um, we don't have more money to pay for the people who are also in the hospitals. About the pandemic, our hospitals and health system is not overloaded. We have uh, no data that now we, as my colleague McCullough said, that now we have some extra state and uh, like all of our hospitals are full and overcrowded. It isn't. And as I said, we gained the collective immunity. And in different regions, we see different uh, spreading of pandemic. So maybe it's not a good idea to put the strict lockdown just because we want to solve a problem at all. Maybe it won't solve at all. Maybe we need to think of more adaptive one to adapt uh, our um, lock to adapt our restrictions to the real streets and real needs of the people and to the pe people's reaction. So the best way is just to give people possibility to stay afloat, not uh, to think about where to get food. Thank you very much. And I would like to give the speech to my colleague Anna. Thank you, Anna. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, we understand that public administration is a very hard work and we are grateful that the majority coalition is ready to have such a debate and is trying to find a compromise. Okay. <laughs> compromise. So uh, we would like to present you our vision of uh, the quarantine which comprise four stages. Step one, taking into account everything mentioned about and uh, reject the idea of the strike uh, quarantine. Step two, to draw out a new project of the adopting quarantine that would be consistent with the principle of portion proportionality. Step three is to introduce measures to protect the most vulnerable groups of people. And step four is to concentrate not on the quarantine measures, but on the process of vaccination. We were to heard uh, that yesterday the first person in Ukraine had been vaccinated. And it would be great if the government put a bit more efforts uh, into the fast spreading of the vaccine. So, we want to make a conclusion. According to the Human Rights Watch position, restrictions should be grounded as proportionate and necessary for the reacting to the specific peril under specific circumstances. Uh, professor of Criminal Law Vyacheslav Navrotsky had a very nice quote which in English could be read as follows. There is no need to use a sledgehammer to crack a walnut. Introducing the street uh, lockdown in Ukraine is the same as to trying to crack uh, a knot with sledgehammer. No correlation between the peril and the reaction. We hope that the majority would take all mentioned facts into account and uh, change their minds. Thank you. I thank to both parties for presenting their positions. That was quite enlightening. And now I would propose that we move to the questions. Uh, so the opposition party, you can take a microphone and please pass another microphone to the coalition. Uh, 
to the majority coalition. And now you have the opportunity to ask the first question. Yes, please. Uh, as I said, my name is Marta, and uh, the first question to majority coalition a party is that you stated that in order to save as many lives as possible, strict lockdown must be a solution. But uh, this statement is actually empty uh, because uh, all Ukrainian people would be grateful uh, if you conducted a, a, at least fact, uh, fact, uh, fact check uh, before making such important statement. Uh, you should uh, at least take into account the Oxford University statistics, statistics which says that uh, our uh, March-April restrictions were one of the strictest in the world in, const in context of uh, correlation to the number of infected people. So the question arises, uh, how can you explain the great difference between your statement and uh, grounded researches which, uh, which clearly state that um, providing uh, strict uh, uh, quarantine uh, measures are, mo uh, are more trouble than it was. And uh, what, uh, your, uh, what you ground your position? OK, thank you for your question. <clears throat> First of all, we would like to know that having your mask in your pocket is the same effective as adaptive quarantine. And uh, actually, we can explain such a spread of coronavirus in March and May because <clears throat> due to the fact that despite the restrictions, many people went to church. Actually, we had uh, religion holidays in our country and due to that fact, that was a spread of uh, this coronavirus. But you should estimate the fact that without strict restriction in March, our country wasn't actually ready, our healthcare system wasn't ready to uh, protect us and actually that strong restrictions, that strict restrictions, pardon me, were vital in our situation in order to prepare our healthcare system, prepare our hospitals and to build additional actually places for people. Okay. okay, I will now invite the second representative of the opposition party to pose the second question to the majority coalition. Okay, thank you. My name is Yuri. I'm representative of the opposition party. You already mentioned in your speech that we need a strict lockdown before we get some vaccine for everybody in Ukraine. So my question is, is it rational to you the pounds to stabilize economy when we, we when we can use it for vaccine for inf information campaign about their effectiveness and about social distancing and so on how do you think so we need to emphasize that ukraine has special funds uh, to tackle COVID-19 and your argument about taxes is not uh, related to the truth because yeah uh, people do pay taxes and taxes go on various um, f taxes go into various fields but according to the state budget we have a separate fund as a speedy reaction to COVID-19 so these are not the money that are used for the economy these are separate money Thank you, representative of the majority coalition, uh, member of the opposition party. Please you. ask your question. Uh, 
my name is Elzara and dear ladies and gentlemen, my last question would be about my own personal pain about the Crimea and the occupied territories. So as a Crimean Tatar, I know that due to uh, your restrictions, all my friends and all my people are blocked in the occupied territories. They are already feel like in jail in Russia and you give them no choice to come back. In fact, you uh, tear them of Ukraine even more. And by the way, uh, the last quarantine had me locked down in Crimea without the uh, right to cross the border and return to mainland Ukraine. So my question is, do you believe that it would be fair for our people from occupied territories if you adopt the strict lockdown one more time? So uh, thank you for your question. And uh, the answer would be this, the following. So uh, we of course, Crimea and Donbass are Ukraine, and they belong to Ukraine. But uh, we do not have we do not have control over those territories, and the Russian Federation has effective control over Donbass, and we have the state of occupation, which has been proven by the uh, Prosecutor General of the uh, International Criminal uh, International Criminal Court. And um, yeah, it has been proven by the uh, European Court of Human Rights. And we have to say that due to the fact that we do not possess effective control over these territories, neither local authorities nor uh, NGOs have access to facts which what happens on those territories. We do not possess information whether there are enough masks, whether people keep social distance, whether there are any restrictive measures there. We do not have this data. We cannot get this data, as well as many others, for example, on ecological situation, etc., etc. So we find it reasonable to make people who come from occupied territories like Donbass and Crimea to sit and to have uh, like isolation period of two weeks because we didn't have the access to the data and we cannot make sure that these people are not transmitters. Moreover, you're not obliged to sit during two weeks. You can pass COVID test. And we do realize that it is a burden for people who come from those territories, probably due to economic issues. But there is special funding and there are NGOs which finance COVID tests for people who come from Donbass and Crimea. Thank you. Thank you to the opposition party for their questions and thank you as well to the majority coalition for answering them. And now we will turn the table and offer the majority coalition the possibility to ask questions to the opposition party. So the majority coalition, please ask your first question. Uh, so, in your speech, you propose to vaccine people, but uh, is uh, uh, the effectiveness of uh, vaccine proven, actually? And please, just try not to answer in with simple yes. Well, um, it was a very interesting question, and um, I plan to answer yes, but um, I think that we should all remind the fact that in your speech you mentioned the fact that the vaccination is effective. You mentioned that. So, I know nothing to add. Thank you. Okay, thank you. The majority coalition, your second question. So, uh, the second question, uh, well, we had such an argument that um, there are people who cannot, that there are people who work abroad and who cannot return to the European Union due to lockdown. But first of all, don't you think that they cannot return not due to the strict lockdown in Ukraine, but due to the thing that the EU closed borders with Ukraine and we are in red zone for the EU? And don't you think that adaptive quarantine in regions such as, for example, we do have it right now, we do have red zone in the Kapatka region and Ivan Frankivsk region, 
where um, everything is closed, so um, all restaurants, all cafes were just to take away. Don't you think that it is a sort of discriminatory matter? And it is a sort of discrimination, and also um, it is it is a sort of Uh, that these are discriminatory measures. Uh, that uh, the thing is that um, the economic situation in these regions is becoming worse as well, and your argument about economy is falling apart. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will begin answering, and then my colleague will continue. Well, first of all, um, I would emphasize on the importance of economic issue because, of course, that people are here, and of course, we cannot, uh, for example, influence on the politics um, of uh, you. Yes, and that is why we need to think of them here now in Ukraine. And if we just uh, block the oxygen of uh, the business in Ukraine, you think that uh, that people would find a place to work. Um, and um, of course, uh, you say the strict lockdown is a good and effective way. Um, but uh, from the other ca case, can you truly track the people? Can you truly influence on that situation? Um, as you think that strict lockdown will um, make people sit home or it will just make the business um, falling into even bigger problems and people will still uh, doing what they want because it's not the beginning and people are used to it and um, yes yeah, so um, as and i want to add uh, you mentioned that uh, our citizens can go abroad because you close uh, borders for them but it's not uh, true, because if you have a permission uh, to work in EU countries, you can go. But we, our citizens can go abroad and uh, work because you closed our borders. How they could do so? Like Mikhail Sagakashvili do? I'm not sure they would uh, do so. Okay, thank you. Our last question is actually, firstly, we would like to know that actually economic crisis could not be emitted in times of pandemic. And our main partner, actually European Union, closed the border to us. And actually, while we are in the red zone for European Union, we cannot have actually free trade with them. And we cannot actually, not a free trade, we cannot actually have it's sufficient trade with those countries and actually the main idea is to stay home for a while to lower actually those statistic of deaths those statistic of new uh, actually people with uh, positive results of coronavirus and actually to be again to be again not in the uh, net pardon me <clears throat> not in the red zone but actually to resolve issue with the european union and the main question is whether it's actually more logical to stay at home for a while, actually to deal with coronavirus in Ukraine in order to have again sufficient traffic with other countries and with the world. Yes, and actually, uh, thank you for a question. We do have a strict lockdown and we do sitting homes and now we have our situation that is not solving and now we need to your words even emphasis on the importance of economic issue because if we will even more weaker here in ukraine economically what we should do with all of that uh, people uh, and to make it adopted quarantine measures is much more not discriminative uh, because um, it we need to think um, complex uh, in complex way about the picture which we see not just about the pandemic and uh, of course as i taught um, if people are hungry they won't think about um, um, the health issues that, that potentially can um, be dangerous for them one second uh, thank you, colleagues. I'll continue. So, uh, Srihi, you mentioned that our main problem for economy is um, the 
absence of our economic uh, contacts with the European Union, okay, it is well, we accept it. But don't you think that if we don't have any economic context with the European Union, you, as the majority coalition, should look for another opportunities for our citizens to raise our economy. And by imposing the strict quarantine measures, the lockdown, you're just making a headshot to them. I also wanted to add is that you. Um, EU uh, doesn't open as uh, borders for us, not just because we don't have strict restrictions or strict quarantine measures. They don't uh, open border because we have a lot of uh, infected people. And uh, uh, strict uh, quarantine measures, as I, uh, we can uh, revise to my uh, to, uh, statistic and fact check, which we made, and you can also make uh, via internet, that uh, strict measures uh, doesn't uh, equal to the lower uh, inf uh, lower uh, of infected uh, people. So, um, yeah, thank you. If this is always the questions, then now I will invite the majority coalition for their final argument. So we have heard the opposition parties and we have heard all the arguments that they gave to us. And we would like to respond to some of them in our final argument. First of all, we do not really know which fact check you did, but we used the official data by the Ministry of Health, which proved that strict lockdown in January was efficient. Before January, we had about 10,000, uh, not 10,000, sorry, we had a lot of cases, but after strict lockdown in January, we had about 3,000 cases a day. So it has been officially proven that strict lockdown in January was efficient in Ukraine. Second of all, uh, we have to add that, yeah, the economic crisis is a thing and it happens everywhere due to uh, due to pandemic it's a global thing it's a global issue but on the other hand we do believe that adaptive quarantine poses a bigger mental threat to people as people are not sure as they are hopeless moreover we do believe that people sit without jobs and strict lockdown can give people abilities to develop because strict lockdown opens there are a lot of courses there are a lot of universities there are a lot of ngos which are active and helping people in strict lockdown as well and adaptive quarantine they are waiting for their enterprise to open they can wait for month they can wait for two how long should they wait no one knows thirdly we clearly saw that the opposition is neglecting the life of people because all those arguments about economy, about people being hungry, well, is it better to see your relatives in coffins? Is it better to go to the cemetery and not being able just to say goodbye to them, but not have enough like money? Moreover, if you have a lot of possibilities to develop. So we ask you to think about these words, which have a really emotional thing to all Ukrainians. And the last thing that we would like to emphasize is that, yeah, Ukraine hasn't made a derogation to the ECHR and to ICCPR. But the thing is that, well, as many countries didn't, Italy did not, Spain did not, France did not. Let's think why. So if we take the countries who made derogations to ECHR, these are countries like Romania, these are countries like North Macedonia, these are countries like Latvia. Why did other countries, uh, why didn't they make a derogation? There is no, we want to emphasize that according to legal argument, there is no exact opinion that the derogation should be formal. The ECHR there was a case, Turkey versus Greece, where ECHR 
took, took its position and it said that it cannot clearly define whether this argument on whether this argument that um, derogation formal requirement of derogation is necessary and if such formal requirement hasn't been made it nullifies derogation so there are a lot of legal doctrines there are a lot of positions and we cannot fully rely to your argument because as we see many countries many developed many developed many democratic countries did not make a derogation ukraine as well but does it mean that we shouldn't protect people's lives no we have to thank you thank you honorable representative of the majority coalition i will now invite the representatives of the opposition party to present their final argument for our today's debate I'm grateful for the Honourable Lady for the closing arguments, and I'll try to answer them shortly. The first point about our data and the data you mentioned about, which is originated from the Ministry of Health of Ukraine, I would like to answer that our data um, originates from the Oxford University. And here is the question for our constituents. Who do you rely on more on the ministry of health of ukraine or to the oxford university this is the first point the second point you mentioned that uh, the adopting quarantine um, imposes a threat for our voters because they know nothing about their future and the lockdown is the great possibility because they can just use, for example, Coursera or Prometheus and so on. My dear friends, I don't see any logic and I would like our constituents to emphasize on this issue. <clears throat> this, uh, the third point, you mentioned that why should Ukraine do a derogation when Italy and other countries did no derogation? And here is the issue of the rule of law. And here is, I think, the main, the principal issue of the rule of law. We should not look to Italy and to the other states of the European Union, of Africa, of Asia, and so on. We are Ukraine, we are state, and we should have rule of law. Please adhere to the rules about the formal derogation. Uh, the Honorable Lady, please open the European Convention on Human Rights, Article 15, and check it again. It is written that the derogation should be communicated to the Secretary General of the Council of Europe. It is formal derogation. This is the point. So, I hope that everyone enjoyed our debate. And on behalf of the opposition party, it was a very great honor to take part in them. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Representative, and as the Speaker of this great Parliament, who by default has to remain neutral, I will not express my own position on the matter. But with this, I would like to close the debate as the Speaker of the Parliament and provide maybe some final remarks as a teacher of the course. Uh, yeah? Probably not in back. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, so, I would like to thank all the students who uh, took part in preparing the course, whether you were presenting or helping or asking questions or answering questions. Um, thank you all. This was quite great. The debate remained more or less civilized. There were some provocative comments, some ad hominem attacks, but as it often happens in the parliaments, you remained within the boundaries of the parliamentary traditions. So thank you all. Uh, thank you to all the uh, listeners and, and viewers of our debates. Thank you.
Uh, thank you very much to, to all panelists and to uh, Taras, who has been moderating this, this session. You're now having a little bit more than one hour, uh, or a little bit more than half an hour uh, uh, for, for a coffee break. And then strictly at 5 p.m. Uh, here in Kiev, in Lviv, in Ukraine, 4 p.m. in Rome, and then 10 a.m. in Notre Dame. Uh, uh, we are going to meet here again for, for another panel hosted by our partners in the United States of America, the University of Notre Dame. In the meantime, for those who are watching us um, uh, on, on YouTube, there are going to be interesting uh, promotional promotion videos um, broadcasted there and you're well while you're enjoying your coffee you're most welcome to to watch uh, so thank you very much once again and and welcome back in 45 minutes thank you я мрію, щоб мої однолітки мали бажання залишатись жити і працювати в Україні. Моєю мрією є стати міжнародним волонтером ООН. Хочу подібний університет. Хочу, щоб це був е, як український католицький університет, а тільки український київсько-татарський університет. Тихою, невтомною працею любити нашу країну. Мене звати Нєрі Шевківа, я студентка магістрської програми з медіакомунікації УКУ. Я не українка, я кримська татарка. Зростала в мусульманській сім'ї. Мабуть, завдяки цим людям, тому що тут твориться така атмосфера, відчула себе більш відкритою світові. Мені дуже-дуже сильно хотілося так само ділитися тим, що є в мені. Ми сподіваємося, що кожен, який проживе, провчиться, попрацює у цій обстановці, буде виносити саме цей дух, дух довіри. Створення отого середовища, в якому панує поряд зі свободою, відповідальність, заклик служити, заклик свідчити. От, от це поєднання є для мене фантастичним. Історія цього університету – це велика мрія, яка зростає і реалізується сьогодні. Такий університет хотів започаткувати ще митрополит Андрей Шептицький. Митрополит Андрей Шептицький домагався цього університету. Свої два виступи в австрійському парламенті, два рази він туди навідався і кожного разу він говорив про університет. Після 18 років ув'язнення та вимушеної еміграції патріарх Йосиф Сліпий засновує Український католицький університет у Римі. Саме у ньому зросли лідери, які після легалізації Української греко-католицької церкви започаткували УКУ в Україні. Від самого початку університет постав з ідеєю відродження в Україні богослов'я. Разом з цим дуже сильним акцентом, який від початків був, це була історія, осмислення минулого. А далі університет реагував на потреби. Український католицький університет пропонує вступникам 10 бакалаврських, 17 магістерських і 2 докторських програми. Філософсько-богословський факультет. Гуманітарний факультет. Факультет наук про здоров'я. Факультет суспільних наук. Факультет прикладних наук. Львівська бізнес-школа. Мене звати Анастасія, я студентка першого курсу програми культурології ОКУ. Мені дуже подобається камерність університету, те, що ОКУ – це така ще маленька спільнота, яка ще тільки розвивається, але вже досягає дуже великих успіхів. Університету довіряють. Щораз та частіше він стає майданчиком для співпраці. 
Тут у людей зростає почуття гідності і поваги до інших. Молодь опікується дітьми зі шкіл інтернатів, налагоджує співпрацю Сходу і Заходу України, їздить до військових та цивільних у зону війни, організовує гуманітарну допомогу для потерпілих, розвиває життя церкви, проводить спортивні змагання, організовує пізнавальні подорожі. Мене звати Богдан, я навчаюся на другому курсі комп'ютерних наук. Цього року я час від часу допомагав пані Марії з Вадіком, і вони для мене відкрили свого роду новий світ. Тому що раніше до таких людей я ставився з якимось незрозумілим мені страхом і упередженням, але зараз я розумію, що то є така сама людина, як я, яка може багато чого донести і відкрити для мене нового. Дуже важливі досвіди для молодих людей відбуваються поза аудиторією. Фактично, університет стає тим середовищем, яке постійно молоду людину мобілізує, спонукає, заохочує, відкриває перед нею двері. Ми розглядаємо студента в центрі як клієнта цього університету. Так? І оцей підхід клієнтоцентричний до студента – Дуже нас підштовхує до того, щоб надавати найкращу якість. УКУ вже переступив рамки Львова і Галичини. Ми маємо Донбаску, Діаспору майже, маємо Харкова, маємо Зодеса з різних районів. Але дуже важливо, що у курс збирають, це знаєте, як магніт цих всіх людей, і на час відкриває можливості на цей зовнішній світ. УКУ розміщений у трьох локаціях Львова. Навчальний корпус по вулиці Свінцицького, будинок над озером на вулиці Хуторівка, та університетське містечко поблизу Стрийського парку. УКУ також відкриває нові навчальні програми у Київському центрі. Наш головний стиль – це мислити глобально, а діяти локально. Доброго дня! Як справа? Віталій Коваль – випускник Львівської бізнес-школи, засновник аграрної компанії «Толока». Атмосфера сама в УКУ, вона постійно дає поштовх до того, що ти маєш ділитися. Якщо в тебе щось вільне звільнилося з техніки, дай оголошення, почни обробляти поля інших. Дуже важливо використовувати цей ефект синергії. Якраз ця ідея була покладена в тему моєї дипломної роботи. Ми, не побоюсь цього слова, багато що ми є агентами змін. Люди беруть приклад з успішних, а успішні – це ті, хто йде органічно по своєму розвитку. Сотні гостей з цілого світу долучились до святкувань під час подячного тижня. Богослужіння, пізнавальні лекції, дискусії, виставки та презентації витворили простір вдячності і призадуми. Головною подією тижня стало відкриття центру митрополита Андрея Шептицького. Тут були два роки тому, як почали будувати храм. Аж сьогодні мені стерчать волосся на шиї. Побачити, що здійснило таке, це таке чудо, я би сказав. І відчуваю по дусі, що я є свідком от того чуда, того заповіту Андрея Шептицького і Сліпого. І я на такому піднесенні не вмію словами того сказати. Одне, що ми казали архітекторам, знаєте, наша естетика є делікатна, філігранова. У нас яєчка помальовані, ми у вишивках. І ви подивіться на цей фасад. Це є відповідь Стефана Беніша на наш дух. Архітектурний стиль, звісно, що церква є традиційна, а центр не є. Ми знаємо, бачимо, що кошер вільний, тобто люди інтуїтивно читають технологію цієї споруди, люди відчувають зв'язок між ландшафтом і інтер'єром, тут є маса терас, несподіваних ракурсів для людей, тобто маса кутків, де людині може бути по-різному, скажімо, формувати різний настрій до навчання. Для української архітектури це є просто непересічна подія. Our standards, what we would expect, this is a very good quality, very good craftsmanship, and it's better than I expected. 
люди приходять сюди, щоб діти були в гарному середовищі, щоб діти бачили, як має жити в спільнотах. Ну, це таке місце, насправді, в якому об'єднується навіть те, що часом здається, що воно не має можливості об'єднатися. Студенти, що мені подобається, дуже позитивні. Дуже дбають про Україну. Вона не є тільки прийти і навчитися, і, і, і те створити свою кар'єру. Складається враження, що навчання – це круто, і це, це дуже правильний посил. Якраз в Україні цього дуже не вистачає. І мені здається, це будівля номер один в Україні свого плану. Я хочу запросити сюди на сцену пана Константина Джима Тимертея, який став головним жертводавцем цього будинку. People come to me and, and, and uh, congratulate me and, and, and thank me, but what can, be, what can be bigger than to know that my name and my wife's name, my family's name, is associated forever with uh, that great Ukrainian saintly man and hero Метрополітен Андрей Шептицький. Січень 2020 року. 100 випускників шести магістрських програм востаннє входять до університету в якості його студентів. Є вузька галузь, яка мене цікавить – це соціологія з використанням великих даних. Я хотів би присвятити своє життя, хоча б його частинку, саме дослідженню людської поведінки і покращенню деяких процесів соціальних, які зараз відбуваються. Університет мені насправді дав багато вміння мислити, вміння бачити в людях добро і вміння зберегти християнські цінності. Я знаю, як реагувати на людський біль, як допомагати, але при цьому і піклуватись про себе. Це називається фахова соціальна робота. Я завжди відчував бажання рухатись в академічній траєкторії, але після Майдану, після окупації Криму мене якось викинуло за межі, за межі академії. Я брав участь у війні, у революційних подіях. І коли я нарешті зміг трохи адаптуватись, вже знайти роботу і стати трохи на ноги, я зрозумів, що тут є університет, який мені видається найкращим в Україні. Середній бал ЗНО вступників до університету постійно зростає. Це стосується як вже сталих, так і щойно започаткованих програм. Попереду у нас багато-багато різних наборів бакалаврів справа, але ви завжди залишитеся унікальними, тому що історія, як правило, пам'ятає тільки перших. 50 молодих осіб з восьми регіонів України стали першими студентами бакалаврської програми справа. Через те, що в мене з самого дитинства така Загострена, загострена почуття справедливості. У мене е, тато правник, і е, я ним дуже пишаюся, я хотіла би бути як він. Абсолютно більшість цих молодих людей мали можливість навчатися за кошт держави. Але обрали вони приватний університет. Чому? Це рейтинги, це найвищий рейтинг в Україні. Тому що у КУ це є європейські стандарти з християнськими цінностями і етичністю. Ну і колектив, тобто вчитись з розумним, набагато цікавіше. Адже це досвід, за яким люди їдуть з усієї країни сюди. Чи є можлива в Україні правнича освіта європейського зразка? Пошук відповіді на це питання триває. Зміни в українському суспільстві, які творяться завдяки університету, завдяки студентам, викладачам, випускникам університету, вони є неможливі без зміни правової системи. А змінити правову систему можна лише змінивши юридичну освіту. 
близько половини студентів університету отримують знижки в оплаті за навчання. Тарас Курилко отримує соціальну стипендію. Така ситуація. Все так не буде. Надіюсь, що буде краще, що вернеться і буде тут. Батько Тараса на заробітках у Польщі. Мама живе у селі Хватів і працює у ветеринарній аптеці. В 2014 році тато Тарасів добровольцем пішов на війну. Ну, то для мене був шок, бо я не сподівався і не думала, він же ж не молодий. Ну, 50 років, то вже, знаєте, але йому було шкода тих молодих хлопців. Тарас є організатором найбільшої студентської акції «Ніч в оку». Загалом нам вдалося на кожній такій події зібрати близько 150 студентів. І, як на мене, такий досвід такого проекту показує на те, наскільки активне студентське самоврядування в ОКУ, наскільки воно є багатогранним, обширним. І то нам ми вдалося побачити, що все ж таки, скільки багато проєктів існує в університеті і як можуть вони співдіяти разом. І це був дійсно унікальний досвід. Що це вона за університет, в якому храм займає центральне місце? Десь, якщо якийсь є важливий екзамен чи якесь практичне заняття, перед яким трохи хвалююся, то це таким стає якимось прибіжжям. Трохи втамувався, приземлився, подякував за ті якісь знання, чи навпаки там, поділився переживаннями з Богом, і тоді стає якось легше, стає якось розуміння того, що ти йдеш вже назад за руку з Богом на той екзамен чи на те практичне заняття. У храмі відбувається постійний процес творення нового. Цього року група митців завершила оздоблення мозаїчного купола церкви Святої Софії при мудрості Божої. Також і в час карантину храм залишається місцем, де зустріч спільноти, де молитва завжди триває. Карантин ускладнив життя університету, але ненадовго. І та, от, до речі, тобто, от, як поч... е, в нас четвер е, сказали, що карантин, а вже в п'ятницю у нас почалися зум-лекції. Опитування показало, що 90% навчання в онлайн перевели без втрат. Почати дистанційне навчання для мене, якихось технічних моментів, у мене не було зовсім проблем. Викладачі на нашій програмі досить швидко відповідають і з ними можна комунікувати без жодних проблем. Але насправді дуже багато речей почав набагато краще робити, друкувати англійською. Це дуже круто, тому що приходили на англійську, ми здебільшого говорили, а тут треба дуже багато ще писати домашні завдання. Абсолютна більшість студентів та викладачів переконані, що навантаження зросло. Ми хочемо бачити молоду людину, яка буде приходити в 25-му році на свою роботу чи в 30-му році на свою роботу, і буде абсолютно готова і професійно, і морально, і етично, і психологічно, і навичково діяти, і взаємодіяти в цьому невідомому новому світі. І це є один комплекс задач, перед яким нам вже раніше постав так, і лише криза зараз пов'язана з пандемією і з економічною кризою тільки пришвидшила це думання. Ще задовго до карантину УКУ інвестував у розвиток онлайн-освіти. Основною базою стала система CMS УКУ. Ще до карантину у ній було 134 онлайн-курси. Цього року ми запроваджуємо практику навчання на свіжому повітрі. Для цього ми встановили тент, в якому зможе одночасно навчатися до 20 студентів. Для безпеки студентів та викладачів всі приміщення в університеті переобладнані для того, щоб дотримуватись норм фізичної дистанції. Випускні урочистості бакалаврських програм цього року відбулись онлайн. Привіт! Радий вітати нас усіх на цьому випускному. Яку я почала думати, не просто транслювати щось почути раніше. Я провела неймовірно кількість часу в центрі Шептицького, в аудиторії, в трапезні. Випускний у нас виявиться нестандартний, але кожне нестандартне завдання також і нестандартний досвід. Один, два, три. Звершилося.
Пам'ятаємо, що зараз ковід, так, правильно. Обнімань немає, я вже ще листи, листи жести. виправдав і перевершив всі мої очікування. Я коли вступала, я дуже сумнівалася. Мене мама казала, що ти робиш? Ти йдеш з державного університету, де тобі дадуть точно класний диплом, крутий. Я казала, мама, я знаю, що я роблю. Тому що я йшла за класною атмосферою, враженнями, новими, цікавими людьми і знайомствами і крутою, крутою системою освіти. Взагалі складно визначити найбільш цікавий предмет, але те, що він був найбільш викликаючий, це публічні комунікації. Це про те, як треба говорити, як треба сказати, про те, як треба постійно вчитися і працювати над собою. Це було дуже, дуже цікаво випробувати себе в різних ситуаціях. Найкорисніший предмет для мене це стало юридичне письмо про те, як писати коротко, зрозуміло, чітко і ясно, думати про того, кому ти пишеш. І я зараз, напевно, найбільше ним користуюся в роботі. Е, в майбутньому точно допоможе, тому що нам давали не тільки хард-скіли про те, що таке право, про, те, про різні галузі права, про USPL. Ми дізнавалися, розширювали свій світогляд і вчилися софт-скілів. Зокрема, про те, як говорити і писати, а це взагалі просто потрібно. На своїй програмі, можливо, єдине, що було таким невеликою проблемою для нас під час навчання, це те, що у нас завжди мінялися пари, в нас був дуже гнучкий графік, от, і під нього треба було дуже гнучко підлаштовуватися. А взагалі мені все подобається. Така тема, яку я писала, це просто вона приводила в шок всіх, коли я говорила. Я писала про штучний інтелект, про праву регламентацію штучного інтелекту. І ніколи, напевно, навіть не знала, що це таке, якби не потрапила в оку. Мій курс і уявлення про право взагалі кардинально змінилися і розвернулися з них на голову. Це було викликом для мене таку тему обрати для мого наукового керівника і, напевно, для всіх, хто слухав мене на захисті. У нас є е, юридична клініка в школі права. І завдяки пані Христині Ковсеній, менеджерці, юристи створили гру, комп'ютерну гру про фінансову грамотність і, і настільну гру. І нам завжди будь-які наші ідеї дозволяли і допомагали реалізувати. Нас семеро аж поїхало в Нідерланди навчатися в Роттердам по програмі Erasmus+. Ми цілий семестр там були, вивчали предмети, які ми самі обирали, і писали паралельно магістерську роботу, і нам дуже-дуже сподобалося. Напевно, я побажала і майбутнім студентам, і, і викладачам, які тут, продовжувати надихати один одного, мотивувати один одного, працювати, відкривати якісь нові можливості, рухатися в тому ж напрямку, в якому насправді тут всі рухаються. Але єдине таке найбільше побажання – не забувати відпочивати. Тому що за дедлайнами ми іноді це забуваємо. Протягом чотирьох років ми набираємо найкращих студентів в Україні. Кожного року наші студенти мають найвищий середній бал зі всіх предметів, з всіх вступників по комп'ютерних науках в Україні. Талановита дослідниця Соломія Леню мала можливість обирати свою майбутню альма-матер з-поміж кількох найкращих університетів світу. В першу чергу, як мені допомагає університет, то це саме дає цю базу математики, базу програмування. Разом з командою студентів факультету прикладних наук Соломія здобула друге місце на міжнародних змаганнях Microsoft у Варшаві. Якщо в ОКУ займатися тільки академічною діяльністю, то тоді може стати трішки скучно. Нас не перенавантажують тут не потрібними знаннями, і, відповідно, це залишає в нас місце в голові і в часі, в нашому розпорядку для того, щоб вивчати щось інше. Наш диригент, пані Олена, вона завжди каже, що ми, тобто співці, ми є проповідники, ми цим маємо доносити Слово Боже до людей. Студентський хор став окрасою святкувань у Філадельфії, де церква піднесла владику Бориса до митрополичого служіння. Чотири тридцять три випускники бакалаврських та магістерських програм склали свій останній іспит. Участь в урочистостях взяв митрополит філадельфійський Борис Гудзяк. 
до університету я буду, очевидно, далі приїжджати, але він стоїть, він стабільний, він розвивається, і я можу просто сказати, він переростає мене і моє. Раніше нагороду університету Нотр-Дам одержували президент США Джиммі Картер, свята мати Тереза з Калькутти, засновник спільноти Ларш Ковчек Жан Ван'є. Цього року нагороди удостоєний президент УКУ Борис Гудзяк. In the face of innumerable challenges, genocide, and political oppression, he and his colleagues have made the Ukrainian Catholic University a center for cultural thought, Christian witness, and the education of a generation who can bring healing and hope to Ukraine. Осередком багатьох студентських ініціатив є студентський уряд. Уряд студентів нашого університету виявив ініціативу, яка була підтримана дев'ятьма іншими університетами з різних куточків нашої країни щодо програми студентського обміну. У нас трохи інше самоврядування, ніж в інших університетів. У нас воно таке більш креативне, бо в нас такі базові потреби забезпечені повністю. Нам нема потреби ходити і бігати, там, домовлятися за пралки, чи за я не знаю, там, аудиторії, щоб були чисті. І для того, щоб бути активними, ми придумаємо щось, щось інше. За останні п'ять років кількість студентських організацій зросла вдвічі. Сьогодні їх 16. Ми маємо на меті активізувати власне, музичне життя спільноти УКУ. Збір коштів для онкохворих людей через соціальні ініціативи. Ми допомагаємо бабусям і дідусям, які мешкають в будинках престарілих. Кожного разу ми складаємо нові оригінальні питання, беремо інформацію з різних книг, з фільмів. Розвиваємо спортивну культуру університету. А також займаємося з малозабезпеченими дітьми у світлиці. До університету вступають щораз то більше студентів зі Сходу та Півдня України. Будівництво нового колегіуму є відповіддю на зростаючу потребу житла для студентів. Сподіваємося, що новий корпус колегіуму імені патріарха Йосипа слугуватиме багатьом поколінням українців як місце здобування знання і мудрості, та буде пам'яткою нашої церкви на славу Божу та добра Христової церкви українського народу. Вже у вересні 2020 року в новому колегіумі житимуть близько 300 студентів з різних куточків країни. Я дуже люблю наше крило через те, що у нас дуже душевне якесь завжди виходить. Найцікавіше – це дивитися на людей, які, які зі Сходу, і вони знають літературну українську мову, яку вони вивчали в школі. І тут вони приїжджають до нас і чують такі слова, як «бульба», і вони такі, якою мовою ви розмовляєте. Починається дружба, починається таке будування нації. Для Олега Рязанова УКУ став четвертим університетом. Вади слуху не дозволили йому надовше затриматися у попередніх. Можна дуже багато разів переконувати людину з інвалідністю, що вона нічим не відрізняється від решти, але треба бути свідомим ось того, що я можу все, але дещо я роблю інакше. Я запросив його на каву піти поговорити. Ми говорили, як він ступив. Звичайно, знайомство з першокурсником. Вже допиваючи каву, він мене просить. Каже Михайло, гори голосніше. Я просто на одне вухо не чую. Друзі, одногрупники організували цілу кампанію зі збору коштів на новий слуховий апарат для Олега. Я був дуже вражений. Ну, напевно, це, це дуже важливий момент, коли цінності в певному середовищі спрацьовують у такий спосіб. Три фундації УКУ діють в Америці, Канаді та Великій Британії. І ще 21 комітет у шести країнах світу. Ця мережа підтримки Українського католицького університету постійно зростає. Цього року вперше бенкет на підтримку університету відбувся в Австралії.
Daj Bože, daj Bože, щоб ми мали ту сильну громаду. Ми її маємо тут. Тому good luck. Thank you. УКУ – це глобальний університет. Свого часу патріарх Йосиф Сліпий створив велику мережу філій університету у шести країнах світу. Український інститут у Лондоні є однією з цих філій. Ukrainian Institute London is a window into Ukraine in the UK. It consolidates the community, but it goes well beyond that and forges partnerships with the leading British institutions. It serves as a platform for debate and engages most influential speakers. And it's very clear to me that uh, it can be very hard for Ukraine to find a voice for itself in the world, to overcome existing stereotypes and develop its own narrative. And that's why the work of the Ukrainian Institute London is so important. Випускниця магістерської програми з прав людини Христина Деркач залишає свою працю в успішній юридичній агенції і йде працювати у зону війни. Тут вона допомагає людям без документів повернути свої громадянські права. Для людини відсутність документів означає те, що її життєвий шлях ламається. Ламається навіть частково не через неї, а через конфлікт, який стався. Крім того, що ти юрист, ти і психолог, і мама, і хто тільки хоче для цієї людини. Тобто ти насправді остання надія цієї людини для того, щоб їй допомогти. Маркіян Прохасько мріяв написати книжку про Антарктиду. І ось мрія стає реальністю. В УКУ у нас була ця постійна практика, і вона дуже допомагає в житті будь-де. І це теж допомогло мені здійснити цю мрію, тому що мати ідею, вміти її висловити, обґрунтувати, пояснити. І це начебто не випливає з історичної освіти, але це випливає з історичної освіти в УКУ. Випускник програми «Історія» Павло Бакунець у 2015 році став мером Яворова на Львівщині. А вже через три роки крадяни довірили йому представляти їхні інтереси у Верховній Раді України. Одне з основних правил життя в УКУ для студента було – ти повинен зробити все сам, не можна домовитись і не можна давати хабарів. Це мені допомогло як міському голові Яворова. Люди повірили в це і побачили, як це працює на практиці. Депутатами Верховної Ради України 9-го скликання стали ще шість випускників Українського католицького університету. Добро – це безкорисливо ділитися тим, чим ти можеш поділитися. Добро – це розуміти, тримати руку на пульсі і не зупинятися, як би важко тобі не було. У нас є певний перелік магазинів, які складають такий умовний маршрут. Кожного дня відповідальна особа з того чи іншого магазину відписує про готовність передати нам їжу. У випадку того, коли магазин готовий нам передати їжу, так, він відписує в чатику. Відповідно, наш координатор бачить, що в такій локації такий магазин може передати їжу. Наприклад, до 13.00 ми збираємо повний перелік всіх магазинів, які згідні нам передати їжу. Після того формується маршрут, і вже волонтер, який виходить на маршрут, він знає конкретно, в якій локації йому треба заїхати, щоб зібрати продукти. В Україні є дуже багато різноманітних проблем. Значна частина нашого населення проживає за межею бідності. З другого боку, українці входять в десятку країн, які викидають які або продукують найбільше сміття в світі. 
Значну частину того сміття, власне, складає органічна продукція, так? І значну частину тої органічної продукції складають продукти харчування, які би можна було врятувати. Власне, тарілка є таким універсальним інструментом, який одночасно мінімізує от таких дві проблеми. Тобто ми, рятуючи продукти від потрапляння на смітник в межах терміну придатності, передаємо їм їх малозабезпеченим особам. Добрий день. Ви від тарілки по продуктах. Добре. Ви до нас, як ми вас чекали. чекали. Ми є унікальним таким проєктом, тому що ми виконуємо одночасно і еко, і соціальну функцію. І, власне, от в, такому, в такому ідеальному симбіозі так, от тарілка продовжує функціонувати станом на зараз. Практика продовольчих банків вона є загальносвітовою. І в різних країнах Європи і Америки такий інструмент, як продовольчий банк, він дуже дієвий і активно впроваджується. Ідею продовольчого, створення продовольчого банку в Україні вона належить Ростиславу Косюрі. Це львів'янин, він народився тут у нас у Львові, до шести років він проживав тут в нас. Пізніше разом з батьками він був вимушений приїхати в Німеччину. Там проживав близько 20 років і, власне, Німеччина є тою країною, в якій культура продовольчих банків дуже розвинута. І, власне, він після певного часу вирішив повернутися назад до Львова, побачив, що Є проблема, так, яку можуть вирішити продовольчі банки, і чому б не спробувати. Так, ми стараємося зробити культуру продовольчого банку загальнонаціональною. Тому що уявіть собі, якщо б декілька тарілок було у Львові, якщо б в кожному обласному центрі була своя власна тарілка чи декілька тарілок, скільки їжі ми б могли врятувати і скільки людей, які перебувають потреби, ми б змогли нагодувати. Тому дуже важливо власне, бачення і розуміння тарілки як такого дуже-дуже хорошого інструменту, який може зробити дуже-дуже багато добра. Аня, можна я попрошу тебе, щоб ти забрала продукцію, а я просто тут буду з машиною, раптом би хтось виїжджав? Ясне туди. Ось такі баски. А там, а там є якісь овочі, фрукти? Нема нічого такого. Там Червона рибка. Є. Добре. Я почула це від своєї знайомої з пласту, і це мав бути як мій пластовий додатковий проект для того, щоб перейти на інший ступінь в пласті. Але так сталося, що ступінь став мені неважливим, а організація вийшла на перше місце. І я вже давним-давно забула, що я хотіла робити тут, а зараз займаюся всім, чим тільки можна. В моїй сім'ї якась вийшло інше ставлення до продуктів. Я тепер завжди всіх контролюю, щоб вони часом чогось зайвого не купили. І е, всі якісь мої родичі і друзі також часто запитують про проекти. Так що е, в цьому залучена, можна сказати, що не тільки я, і все моє оточення. У нас була дуже важка початкова комунікація з нашими сусідами, тобто за браком інформації, за браком розуміння діяльності продовольчого банку. Вони, ну, практично всі виступили проти відкриття тарілки ту саме тут. Нам довелося провести таку зустріч, зустріч знайомства з ними, так? Ми запросили всіх таких активістів, так? Розказали їм про проект, відповідно, були запрошені представники міської влади, які пояснили, що Тарілка на цілком законних засадах користується тим приміщенням. Так? Також ми залучили представників духовенства, які могли більш з релігійної точки зору пояснити, так, що тарілка – це про добро. І, ну, як мінімум, так, релігія будь-яка вчить так, добром ділитися. І нічого поганого немає, що якісь молоді люди тут організовують власне, таке маленьке добро. 
І за результатами зустрічі ми отримали дуже позитивний фідбек. Тобто люди, які прийшли нас насварити, чим ми тут займаєтеся, що ви хочете тут зробити, в результаті стали нашими прихильниками. Є молоді сім'ї, з, власне, конкретно з того приміщення, які тут нам приходять, допомагають по ремонту, систематично передають якісь кошти. Тобто нам вдалося, власне, переломати отакий стереотип, тарілки тут на місці. Так? І я сподіваюся, що зовсім скоро весь мікрорайончик, де ми знаходимося, буде теж нашими або волонтерами, ну і швидше за все нашими відвідувачами. Так, ну ми сьогодні об'їхали сім магазинів, зібрали дуже багато класних паштетів, я бачу. Є сосиски дуже класні, є багато молочної продукції, є фактично цілий кошик овочів. Маємо навіть тут імбир, якщо бачите, є баклажани, огірки, помідори. От. Частинка є хліба, різних паніні. От. Ну і є різні солоності, картопля, тобто, в принципі, досить непоганий такий продуктовий кошик, якщо можна сказати. Привіт, як справи? Файно. Добрий день. Сергій. Аня. Е, відкривай багажник, будемо тебе заховувати. Кожного дня ми маємо іншого партнера, благодійника який займається харчуванням малозабезпечених осіб, кому ми передаємо нашу їжу. І, відповідно, обирається якась така точка зустрічі, де наш волонтер передає їжу представнику тої чи іншої організації. Е, вівторок друзі твої приїжджають. Потім... Чудово. Та. Не дзвонили, я, ти я, будеш я, теж на зустрічі? Чи ні? Та думаю, що так. Угу. Як, якщо треба, якби, може бути присутні. Бо горять вони, я думаю, що вони зроблять класно, як Добре. в Києві. Потрібно буде їх вести. І тримати як безмолесно і координувати дії. Ну, ми залучили там близько 7-8 місць зараз є на зв'язку, що, що хочуть розвивати. Окей, окей, добре. Все, щасливо. На зв'язку тоді. Є люди, навіть які кажуть, ми от живемо в Києві, але ми хочемо приїхати до вас, щоб зсередини подивитися, як воно виглядає. Я думаю, ми ближчим часом знову ж таки будемо мати таку зустріч. І я думаю, після того, як людина вийде з нами на маршрут, побачить, власне, от загориться тою ідеєю. Точно можна говорити про те, що ближчим часом в Києві буде теж своя тарілка. Зараз ми йдемо до багатодітної сім'ї такої, яка живе в досить таких складних умовах, і веземо їм продукти. Оскільки вони зверталися і просили про допомогу, завдяки такому проекту, як тарілка в супермаркеті, ми маємо змогу допомогти таким сім'ям. Це є, це є класно, це є добре. Це є е, надія навіть в мене, коли до мене дзвонять люди. Хтось дзвонить, треба цукор, хтось дзвонить, треба там ще щось. Я допомагаю людям, які вже 15 років не виходять з хати. Дай Боже здоров'ячка. І вам теж. Я не сам, я з друзями. Привіт. Заходьте. Що, уроки прямо тут робимо, так? Пішки. Я ще зайнятий, передзвоню. Ви просто будете приїжджати і в один день забирати кульочки. Домовились? Домовились. І все. Це авокадо, напевно. Це буряк. Або буряк. Авокадо. <реш> я буду йти вже з друзями. Я радий був вас бачити. Будемо допомагати частіше. Вот, вот там лампочка така. Яка? Дивно. Вот така. Яка? На, вот там, наверху. Ну, і що? І там... Там світло є. Є світло. Люблю тебе дуже. Добре, ми тоді вже будемо йти потрішки, не будемо вам цей. Велике дякую вам, що ви зайшли, що ви допомогли. На здоров'я. Це завдяки... З усиллям багатьох людей ми можемо так якось. Dear ladies and gentlemen, 
Welcome back to the third day of the International Conference um, Integral Human Development in the Digital Age. We are moving forward with our conference agenda for the day. Um, and now I have a great honor uh, to announce our next panel discussion devoted to integral human development, the pandemic, and the need for a new social ethics. This session will be delivered by the Notre Dame University, a partner of this conference and a long-standing valued partner of Ukrainian Catholic University. I'm truly convinced then that in OKU Notre Dame partnership, we form the basis for friendship and solidarity and for empathy in service to um, human and society. So I'm now very pleased um, to welcome a moderator of this panel, our esteemed friend and colleague, uh, Mr. Clement Sedmuk, Professor of Social Ethics and Interim Dir Director of Nanovic Institute for Europe European Studies, Kiev School of Global Affairs. So dear Clements, um, a question of the year 2020. <laughs> Do you hear me well? I can hear you well. Perfect. Perfect. I can hear you well. Perfect. Perfect. So, so I cordially, cordially invite, invite you, you to take, to take the floor. floor. No. No. Thank you so much. Good morning from South Bend, Indiana. And solidarity. So my name is Clement Sedmark, and as mentioned, I serve as interim director of the Nanovic Institute for European Studies here at the Kiel School at the University of Notre Dame. And I will be the moderator, which basically means I will be the timekeeper for the one hour that we have together. Integral human development is the defining motto of the Kiel School of Global Affairs. We are so grateful that we have been asked to contribute to this conference on this very topic. Our panel today will offer an interdisciplinary discussion entitled Integral Human Development, the Pandemic and the Need for a New Social Ethics. We have wonderful and distinguished panelists. I'm so grateful that I can introduce them to you in the order of their speaking slots. Dean Scott Appleby is the Marilyn Keogh Dean of Notre Dame's Keogh School of Global Affairs. He's the founding dean of this new school, the first new school at Notre Dame in nearly a century. Scott Appleby is a distinguished historian of religions with a PhD from the University of Chicago. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and of the American Academy of Political and Social Sciences. And he has built the Keogh School around the idea of integral human development. And he has built the school from scratch. There was no building, no curriculum, no cohort of students, no global affairs faculty. And now we are talking in a busy building with colleagues and students about IHD. Welcome, my dean, and thank you so much for being with us. Julia Kowalski is an assistant professor of global affairs and a concurrent faculty member at, in Notre Dame's gender studies program. Julia is a wonderful colleague and teacher, respected and loved by all. A cultural anthropologist by training, Julia completed her PhD in the Department of Comparative Human Development at the University of Chicago. She has been conducting fieldwork in North India since 2007, focusing on issues of gender, kinship, women's rights, personhood, gendered violence, and everyday institutional practices. Professor Kowalski will bring her unique expertise and fieldwork experience to our discussion on integral, integral human development. Thank you so much, Julia, for being with us and welcome. Father Jim Lee, CSC, is a Holy Cross priest, a fellow of the Nanovic Institute for European Studies, and currently the interim senior director for academic initiatives and partnerships for the University of Notre Dame London Global Gateway. He has also served at the University of Portland as an associate professor of psychology and at Stonehill College, where he served as vice president for mission. Father Jim holds a PhD in psychology from the University of Minnesota. A week ago, Father Jim Lees has been named interim president of the University of Portland, effective July 1st. Father Jim will bring an educational, psychological, and spiritual theological approach to integral human development to the panel. Thanks so much for joining us in this busy time, Father Jim. 
Professor Catherine Bolton is our fourth panelist. She's Associate Professor of Anthropology and Peace Studies. She earned her PhD from the Department of Anthropology at the University of Michigan. She has been working in Sierra Leone since 2003, focusing on issues of memory, poverty, morality, and post-war development. She also currently serves as Director of Doctoral Student Studies for the University of Notre Dame's Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies, where she is a core faculty member. Kate Bolton has written two amazing books based on extensive field research. I Did It to Save My Life, Love and Survival in Sierra Leone, 2012, and Serious Youth in Sierra Leone with Oxford University Press, 2019. Professor Bolton will bring her research expertise, her commitment to human dignity, and her sharp intellect to our panel. Thank you so much, Kat, for being with us, and may your dog be free to bark if he so feels. The idea of the panel is straightforward. Each of the panelists will offer five to eight minutes with an extra minute for the Dean of opening remarks, and then we will end the discussion where we are also happy to work with questions from the audience. Please feel free to feed us questions through the chat function, and I will ask those questions to our distinguished panelists. We will end on time at 11 a.m. Eastern time to respect people's busy schedules in the understanding that there is a life after the panel as much as there is a life after the pandemic, especially if we take integral human development seriously. Dear Dean Appleby, may I give the floor to you and may I please ask you for your reflections. Thank you. Thank you, Clemens. Let me add my greetings to our friends and colleagues at Ukrainian Catholic University and at Georgetown University and at the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas, the Angelicum. We are delighted to be a partner in this international conference on poverty, migrants, pandemics, and the idea of a new social ethics as part of your series of conferences on integral human development in the digital age. And here we are. So what then is integral human development? For the moment, let us define IHD as the state of a society in which the irreducible dignity of the human person and the cultural and spiritual, as well as economic and material human flourishing are central to political and social life and upheld by the rule of law. Within this definition, we echo Catholic social teachings, affirmation of a preferential option for the poor, the marginalized, the most vulnerable in our societies. At the core of IHD is the conviction that the dignity of the human person is expressed in work and economic activity, but also in cultural richness, artistic creativity, religious belonging, and spiritual practice. Most profoundly, human dignity is expressed in our relationships with and obligations to nature, family, community, and ultimately to all of humanity. As Dean of a Global Affairs School that has made advancing IHD its mission, I must also ask, how can a university community contribute concretely to realizing this lofty vision? The pandemic has sharply focused our faculty's reflections on IHD and given, and given them a practical urgency. And so we aspire to see the debilitating impact of the coronavirus from the perspectives of the besieged women, children, and workers most affected by it, to raise awareness of the radical changes now required in sensibility, lifestyle, and political economy, and to explore practical, concrete, achievable means of making these changes and thereby advancing integral human development. We have done so in part through our Dignity and Development blog series, which you can access page on the Keogh School website. There you will find approximately 60 essays of roughly 1,500 words each by scholars and practitioners of anthropology, peace studies, development, social ethics, theology, global health and global politics, the psychology of the family, and much, much more, all of whom address two questions. How does the lens of IHD illuminate and make a difference in how you conceptualize and conduct your work? And how might the pandemic offer new challenges, but also new opportunities for fostering a more just and equitable world, IHD style? Perusing those 60 essays, you will find leanings toward a new post-pandemic social ethic. Nuggets like the following. 
social entrepreneurship expert Michael Morris notes that during the pandemic, the poor have borne a disproportionate amount of the cost in terms of infections and death, scarcity, and vulnerability. Our ultimate principle as a society is a value for life, but we must, but we routinely make trade-offs, such as when we send soldiers to die for some cause, put firefighters in harm's way, or charge people money to get a flu shot, he writes. So what are the trade-offs we are willing to make in addressing a debilitating virus? How do we factor in the real cost to the most economically vulnerable in society? This is a discussion, Mike continues, we seem to avoid, but it is important that the trade-offs we have effectively made through our responses to this virus be acknowledged, explored, measured, and justified. It is difficult to make evidence-based decisions when we oversimplify decision options, ignore the diversity of society, and leave out major cost components. Development economist Alejandro Estefan takes the problem to scale by noting that developing countries face three key challenges to overcome that are absent in advanced economies, lack of access to international credit markets, labor informality and exploitation, and stunning drops in the price of the goods and services workers provide. Exploring remedies, Estefan suggests that low-cost technologies could improve the lot of the working poor. Online higher education is perhaps the single most beneficial revolution that could come out of COVID-19, he writes. The crisis has a disproportionately detrimental effect on low-skilled workers, and technological progress threatens to erase many of the jobs that require only secondary education. Online higher education may provide an affordable alternative for low-income individuals. Engineer Tracy Kajuska Korea notes that COVID-19 has proven expertly equipped to do what disasters do best, highlight vulnerabilities in systems, processes, and infrastructure, whether they be physical, social, or economic, particularly those we had long chosen to ignore. She warns against complacency. Quote, disaster risk reduction practitioners, myself included, routinely advocate for sunny day decisions. That is, please let us invest proactively in addressing systemic vulnerabilities and reducing exposure in order to protect communities before the storm. Both measures help mitigate the risk of hazards like hurricanes, earthquakes, and even global pandemics. The pandemic, she hopes, may bring home the fact that every dollar spent in proactive mitigation against natural hazards can save up to $11 in prevented losses of life, property, services, livelihoods, and mental well-being, all ingredients of IHD. Finally, policy scholar David Courtright, while lamenting the many offenses against IHD of the Trump administration policies, also sees in the pandemic unprecedented international cooperation among technicians and scientists in multiple countries as they share data and findings in the search for a coronavirus vaccine and more effective testing and treatment. We also see increasing recognition of the last year of global interdependence and calls for greater internationalism. As Pope Francis and others have observed, COVID-19, quote, knows no borders and can only be contained through coordinated global action. The UN Secretary General, leading economists, have called upon greater measures to expand lending for developing nations and the poor and to support low-income workers. Courtright asks, can we envision a post-COVID-19 shift toward improved global governance, a rebirth of internationalism to strengthen our defenses against pandemics, to protect the dignity and development needs of all people, especially the most vulnerable? Well, as I conclude, this is just a sampling of the richness of insight on display in the Dignity and Development blog series, to which every one of us on this panel has contributed, save one. So, Father Jim, we expect your 1,500-word essay within the next week. And so you ask of IHD, pandemics, and a new social ethic. My reply recalls the laconic response of Mercia Eliade when an unsuspecting University of Chicago undergraduate strolled into his office one day many years ago and asked the great historian of religion, please, 
to, quote, summarize the themes of your work. Young man, he replied, go read my books. When you have finished, come back and we'll talk. Professor Eliade, by that point, had written 60 books, not 60 blogs, but the principle still applies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, thank you also for advertising the blog. Uh, Dean uh, Volodymyr Tonikovsky also it, uh, contributed to the blog. We are grateful for that. That's an expression of our uh, friendship with the Ukrainian Catholic University. Um, and uh, now the floor is open for Professor Kowalski. Julia, please fire away. Thank you. So hello, everyone can hear me, I hope. Yes, we can Great. hear you very well. Great, wonderful. Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon. Um, and like uh, like Dean Appleby, I will extend my thanks to Clemens for inviting me to participate on this panel and to our hosts um, at this conference. So I'm going to build a bit on what Scott has already said about integral human development and the pandemic by sharing some insights that come via my own anthropological research on how gender and kinship have informed development processes around the globe. And you know, in the spirit. Clins, rather than talking about the findings from my field work with you all, I'm going to talk about some of the insights that this comparative work have has led me to um, within the United States, um, insights that the pandemic has really underscored, I think, for many of us. So in my understanding of this uh, complex concept, integral human development, um, this approach invites us to consider what it means to be a developed human in a context that gives our lives meaning and purpose. Because development carries so many multiple meanings, this concept invites us to think across scales, considering everything from the scale of international development, but also the scale of individual development from infancy to old age. And so not only for scholars of human development and other topics, but I think for many of us through visceral lived experience, the pandemic has really called into question assumptions about individualism and independence that are at the heart of mainstream expectations about development in both societal and individual terms. And these are expectations that are supported and enforced by a range of powerful institutional actors, both you know, within the United States where I am speaking from and around the world. So just a few small examples, um, assumptions about the importance of national sovereignty and independence at an international scale, um, especially as a frame for economic development, have been called into, into acute question by a pathogen that does not care about boundaries. Um, it doesn't matter if we vaccinate at a national scale, if across the border there's a population that can't fully vaccinate um, due to resource restrictions. At a slightly, slightly more local scale, the pandemic has made visible the precarious infrastructure that had allowed caregivers, particularly women, to participate simultaneously in productive and reproductive labor. That is to earn a wage outside of the household while also fulfilling unpaid expectations about caregiving for children and elders at home. We now realize the enormous economic and political importance of the infrastructure of intergenerational family care because this infrastructure collapsed spectacularly as a result of social distancing measures. The impacts of this collapse in the United States, particularly for women who experience intersecting oppressions due to class, race, and gender, are already clear. Um, data on unemployment in the United States at the end of 2020, for example, showed that nearly all of the jobs that the economy had lost in that period of time were lost by women. And uh, most uh, most of all women of color who frequently work in undervalued fields such as home health care and the service industry. So a system that was built to recognize workers only as abstract independent individuals has shown itself to be unable to cope when all of the various forms of invisible labor that sustained such independence suddenly surge into view. Along these lines, the pandemic has revealed other less obvious ways that this fixation on independence might impede more integral understandings of human development, in this case at the scale of the individual. So for example, in the United States, there has been enormous, enormous controversy over whether or not residential colleges should reopen to host students in person for classes and to house them in the dorms where they all live uh, so very close together. So, much of the public debate about this decision focused on difficult questions about the economics of education, the epidemiology of COVID, and the value of face-to-face -face learning, all really important questions for us to address. 
But underneath these concerns is another set of issues that are rarely openly discussed in the United States, which is that the pandemic threatens valued pathways to adulthood, especially for the relatively elite families who send their children to private four-year colleges. So this, this specter of children learning or college students um, learning in their parents' basements threatens a valued path to adulthood by making it more difficult for students to cultivate independence in a socially recognized manner that requires them to separate from their households of origin and live warehoused in an institutional space. And I know I'm speaking to an, an international audience, and so I, I will pause here and recognize that this is not a model that shapes how people think about college um, outside of the US in the same way that it does within the US, of course. So the pandemic, in other words, has profoundly threatened American scripts for what a developmentally appropriate pathway into adulthood should look like. And indeed, policies and practices regulate the relationship between spatial independence, whether that's college students in a dorm or aging adults um, living at home, sustained by home health care aides. Um, so these policies and practices regulate this relationship between spatial independence and personhood across the life course. But they often obscure the complex interdependent relationships that actually sustain such seemingly independent lives. So I think that as we think about a new social ethics, the pandemic really invites us to reflect on how these fault lines and desires for independent autonomous personhood might bring into view the multiple modalities of risk that are at stake in producing seemingly independent persons. So the pandemic invites us and really forces us to ask, how might we better recognize and honor the relations that sustain our seeming independence, whether that's at the scale of the individual, the state, for the nation. The kind of dignity that we talk about when we talk about integral human development is a relational achievement. It's something that we rely on relations with others to achieve. And as the pandemic has reshaped American life in ways large, large and small, it underscores the extent to which this individual personhood model fails to really fully and richly account for those forms of relationality. Um, and in turn, turning our gaze to interdependent relations can really broaden our ability to ima imagine more sustaining futures. So as I, I said at the start of my, as, of my talk here, I come at these issues as a cultural anthropologist. And one insight that anthropology, along with other disciplines in the social sciences, brings us is that you know, comparative work can teach us that other, other worlds are possible and other modalities for organizing society are possible, in part because they already exist. Um, and so to end on a positive note, one thing that the pandemic has also underscored is uh, the rich and vital social movements in the US and around the world that are already organizing around questions of how to sustain and nurture and value interdependence. So I will pass things back to Clemens. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julia, uh, for your reminders of uh, what the pandemic told us and taught us. The big reveal was the title of the first blog by Dean Appleby. And also ending on a positive note, we really appreciate that. And now we hope for some more positive notes from Father Jim Lees. Please, Reverend, the floor is yours. Thank you, Clemens, and greetings all. I'm delighted to be a part of this esteemed panel, and uh, I want to thank all the sponsors of this conference. I'm particularly delighted to connect, albeit virtually, with the Ukrainian University, Catholic University, where I've had the pleasure to visit and participate in a previous conference sponsored by the Nanovic Institute. It's a pleasure to see so many familiar faces. My work for Notre Dame takes place in London during ordinary times, and as these are not ordinary times, I'm currently living on the main campus. But in London, Notre Dame has a team of about 20 women and men on the staff who work for what we call the London Global Gateway, which is the headquarters for the work of the university in the UK. When the pandemic struck and our staff immediately proceeded to work from home and I, re I returned to work from campus, um, there was a sudden inevitable rethinking of the normal structures um, of our activity uh, and the immediacy with which um, we might expect things to be produced or, or accomplished. Suddenly it wasn't productivity or outcomes that was first on our minds. It was quite simply a focus on the health and well-being of each of the individual members of our, of our team. We in leadership were suddenly asking, how will each manage, particularly those with children or elderly parents living in? How will it uh, work as their homes become their new workplaces? What kind of capacity will they have? Do, there, do they have any family or friends to whom they may need to attend beyond their own? And do they have those who can attend to their needs? Questions I'm embarrassed to say we would typically not have asked. It was suddenly a dramatic reorientation 
to the human person and their respective circumstances. It was quite simply at the heart of the question of integral human development. It may not have run as broadly or deeply as the ideal, but it was truly a reorientation. In his excellent article on the Keogh's Dignity and Development blog, Patrick Calderon makes a broader analysis of this reorientation on a national and, and global level and the respective responses in the wake of it. Our government and other nations are providing subsidies and stimulus monies to assist those who are hungry or who might otherwise lose their homes, their jobs, their businesses. Leaving us to wonder, given the human need that existed before the pandemic, why wasn't this happening already? In Fratelli Tutti, Pope Francis says, and I quote, the pandemic momentarily revived the sense that we are a global community, all in the same boat, where one person's problems are the problems of all. Once more, we realize that no one is saved alone. We can only be saved together. And that's the quote. The interesting result of the global pandemic is that there seems to be a sudden awareness of human need, and more than that, an awareness of the urgency of addressing it. I am not an economist or a politician, but this past year has clearly made us all rethink our assumptions. How do we maintain the stability of our micro ecosystems, the, the worlds in which we live, and more broadly, our political and economic order as businesses are struggling and folks are suddenly losing their homes and livelihoods? Suddenly, the attention of the efforts of those who study such things and practitioners and politicians who are in a position to affect them has led to a recognition that we need to attend to and enhance the human. There is a sudden appreciation that life comes before profit, as Calderon says, which should also guide us in normal times. My area of research has been in the realms of moral psychology. How do we reason to the good, even secularly and societally determined? Why, when we know what the good is, do we often fail to do it or choose not to? It's a curious thing that the pandemic has caused some people who have long known of the adverse conditions that people experience and didn't feel as great a need to attend to it then, do now. Or at least they didn't appreciate the urgency that seemed to now. Moral psychology also attempts to assess levels of moral reasoning with the emphasis not so much on what we choose, but why we choose it, why we choose to do what we do in the vein of Kohlberg's theory. I might hope that the pandemic has changed perspectives and perhaps hearts so as to suddenly have all of us understanding the importance of the pursuit of integral human development, but I fear not. It may indeed be that for some in positions of power and influence and authority, that they may be doing what we might call the right thing, but for the wrong reason. In of those who are poor is in the interests of the rich and the powerful and the well-positioned. And I don't want to be cynical here, but it may be that they just don't want their world to fall apart or our economic order to crumble. And yet clearly we hope that at the same time they have a growing appreciation for the effectiveness of their actions, not only in holding the world together, so to speak, but also in safeguarding the lives and livelihoods of every human person. Um, from Fratelli Tutti again, and I quote, we cannot fail to mention that seeking and pursuing the good of others and of the entire human family also implies helping individuals and societies to mature in the moral values that foster integral human development, end quote. It is this movement toward a new social ethics that would have us reflect on the moral dimensions of social structures and systems, issues, and communities. Radically change the thinking of many, whether in leadership on various levels and, and realms or in our own homes and parishes and families. This is where education around integral human development becomes so important. From Fratelli Tutti again, I would especially like, quote, I would like especially to mention solidarity, which as a moral virtue and social attitude born of personal conversion calls for commitment on the part of those responsible for education and formation, end quote. The potential venues for this education and formation are vast, particularly in our Catholic colleges and universities throughout the world, as Dean Appleby mentioned earlier, 
In London, we have, we offer a course for our undergraduates visiting from Notre Dame, which I co-teach called the Catholic Social Teaching in the Charitable Sector. It's a course which requires each student to participate in an internship at a nonprofit in Greater London, which attends to some aspect of human need. And the classroom portion focuses on USD and integral human development as the foundational motivation for an institution like Notre Dame to promote and pursue such activities. There are other venues as well. One on a slightly broader scale might be seen in Fratelli Tutti itself, or in Cardinal Turkson's talks around the world, but certainly at the United Nations gathering in Geneva in 2017 on integral human development. Or closer to home in London, Anna Rowlands, a theologian and CST scholar affiliated with the Center for Catholic Studies at Durham University, who provides regular programs for members of the British Parliament on matters related to CST and IHD. Perhaps one of the most impressive adopters of integral human development in the educational realm is the Keogh School right here at Notre Dame, which has at its heart the mission of the advancement of IHD through research and policy and practice across a collection of nine centers and institutes representing an array of disciplines. It's been said, but it is a powerful opportunity to further deepen uh, conversations and education around, around this important topic. And I'll end with an urging that we find new and creative ways to promote IHD. on the topic are ourselves in our living you know, human development in our lives and in our homes and our families and in our parish and civic communities. It is our charge and our challenge. Thank you. Thank you so much, Father Jim. Also for reminding us of the role and potential and responsibility of Catholic institutions, Catholic universities, and uh, helping us to rethink the moral dimension of our institutions. Professor Bolton, Chet, we are so looking forward to your contribution. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Clemens, and thank you everyone for um, joining this panel. Um, I have two unenviable tasks. One is following all of these fabulous presenters. Um, and the second was given to me explicitly by Clemens. He said, could you connect the micro and macro? is a sort of code for you have trouble disciplining your thinking. So what's on your mind? Um, so I'm going to do my best to connect with the thinking that I've been doing about COVID and my own research in Sierra Leone, which will actually come in at the end. Um, and the way that these comments are going to be structured is the fact that I'm a scholar of structural violence. So I attempt to seek out the hidden abode of, of suffering and where the pandemic has revealed prejudices that already existed, but were otherwise normalized and accepted in society. So COVID has revealed more precisely the assumptions about whose lives matter more that govern decision-making around healthcare around the world. So these assumptions are unsurprisingly ageist, they're racist, they're classist, and they're also ageist. Ableist, but they are also deeply nationalist, with this moment more than any other revealing what, what we call the me before you attitude that governs the global north's approach of establishing an ethical stance that judges us not just on the number of people who live or die, but the fact that we don't sacrifice the most vulnerable to this disease. So in the early days of the pandemic, um, it was revealed that there was an ethic of care that explicitly prioritized otherwise young, healthy people um, in a way that made it clear that normal people whose lives were threatened, so-called normal people, were prioritized for care over those that were disabled or immune immunocompromised and already sick. And I'll just give you some examples of how this unfolded. So in March um, 2020, a hospital corporation in California suspended prescriptions of hydroxychloroquine to people with autoimmune disorders. Um, this was when hydroxychloroquine was still touted as a possible cure for COVID. And in their letters to these people, um, they were not asked if they wanted to suspend their prescriptions. They were thanked for their sacrifice of these drugs um, so that they could be used instead on COVID patients, as though a drug were more important for an unproven experimental use on quote unquote normal people than it was for a proven use on those who already needed it. In that same month, um, 
Andrew Cuomo secretly moved elderly COVID patients who were deemed stable from their hospital wards back into their nursing homes to free up bed space, even when these patients were still actively sick with COVID. And this assumption was based on the fact that a younger or newer COVID case took precedence over someone who was already ill simply because of their age. Slightly later in the pandemic in the United Kingdom, the National Health Service gave automatic do not resuscitate orders to COVID patients who were diagnosed with learning disabilities. This means that people with Down syndrome and other similar conditions were 30 times more likely to die of COVID than normal patients. The shocking fact is that this decision was made in the second lockdown, not the first, which means that the National Health Service learned to prioritize cognitively normal people after the first wave. So the question that kind of arises from this is why would keep compromise from dying? The question is really whose dignity and on what basis that dignity is supported and protected. A second wave of this thinking with respect to structural violence came with the expectation of sacrifice from those deemed essential workers, which signals an explicit acknowledgement of social inequality and an expectation that because low wage jobs are in constant demand, that these individuals can be easily replaced. Now, I don't know how many of you ever watch, you know, mainstream TV, but what we called lockdown TV was flooded with advertisements from fast food companies, grocery stores, and other so locally serving businesses stating that we are here, we are here to keep you safe. As though the only people People locking down are white collar people who can work remotely, and it is the job, the work of essential workers to keep the middle class safe. And that this is the new normal, as though solidifying the idea of a completely bifurcated world is the sacrifice that is expected of low wage workers. These same essential workers have not been given priority for vaccines in any state. After healthcare workers were vaccinated, only an age gradient of vaccination was established, as though any 65 year old is more in need of a vaccine than a grocery store clerk or a bus driver, that one can be simultaneously essential and expendable. In California, essential workers were reclassified away from frontline workers um, in the early days of vaccine distribution and still do not have access to vaccines. On a global Seeing distribution reveals global inequalities more shockingly than any other metric for understanding the threat to human dignity that COVID revealed, not that it caused. So the WHO that 75% of the 128 million vaccines that have been distributed thus far were distributed in only 10 countries, with almost 130 countries comprising 2.5 billion people yet to get a single dose of vaccine. So this is the squeakiest wheel getting the grease with the countries that can leverage the most money for their own people getting the vaccines and willingly ignoring the rest. And I'm also particularly obsessed with the national and international registers of COVID cases and COVID dead. And this is because these, these hide much more than they reveal. So the people listed as COVID deaths on these websites are actually the we don't actually know how many people have died of COVID because the ones that we have seen on these registers received a positive test before they died, which means that some standard of care was made available to them that is not already made available to the vast majority of the world's population. So we cannot even contemplate how many silent deaths are occurring around the world because there's simply no way for most people to get tested, no way for them to go to the hospital, and if they get there, no way for them to pay for their care. Um, a research project that I'm initiating this year in South Bend is actually looking at the sort of hidden abode of the cost of COVID for the homeless population and for undocumented immigrants in South Bend. How has COVID affected them in ways that we don't know because we haven't actually bothered to shine a light in their direction? I actually started a COVID study in Sierra Leone um, when COVID reached Sierra Leone in April of last year, but I had to stop it after only three months because compared to the diseases that actually threaten people in Sierra Leone, COVID is a very minor concern. So to get worked up about a disease that kills only 3% of those who get sick. Um, their children die every day of dehydration, diarrhea, preventable diseases. They themselves die of malaria and typhoid, which will kill you if you cannot afford the $2 for standard treatment.
And this really let, begs the question about our own obsession with COVID related to the global South, especially places in Africa like Sierra Leone, which rank very low on the Human Development Index, which is a question. Why should countries with extremely high infant and mortality and maternal mortality rates care about COVID? Why should countries the 50s care about COVID. It is actually a luxury, luxury that our dignity is not assaulted so regularly by infectious disease and non-existent health care that we have the luxury of worrying about a disease with 3% mortality. I'm kind of in the um, habit of unpopular opinions and shining light in these deeply uncomfortable ways, but these are sort of my primary takeaways from COVID at the moment, and I thank you all for joining us. Thank you so much, Kat, also for taking us out of a North American European perspective. Thank you, dear panelists. Having listened to you, I, I have uh, five big takeaways, and obviously many more, but, but my five big takeaways are, number one, the pandemic is a big reveal, fragility of our vulnerability of uh, people, and the message some lives matter more than others, both on a national and on a global level. Words like essential workers and more vulnerable people come to mind. Secondly, a disruption of the script for being a person in the society and for growing up, and a, a necessity to rethink the way we interact with each other. Thirdly, new insights into interdependence and interconnectedness, a relational understanding of the person and a role Role of solidarity is necessary now. Fourthly, we need to invest in uh, resilience and a new internationalism. And fifthly, we should make use of the opportunity to reorient ourselves, ask the why questions with a special responsibility for Catholic institutions, uh, make sure that life comes before profit, and uh, trust that other worlds are not only possible but also partly exist. Friends, we have 18 minutes, I would say seven. 17 minutes for questions and comments. As you have seen in the chat, uh, Vice Rector Tara Stopko has uh, put a question to Dean Appleby. Um, how would you relationship between the concepts of IHD and the common good? I think I'll just ask this question in a very succinct way, Scott, please. Thank you uh, for the question, a terrific question. What is the common good of the person in community would be one way to phrase the question. What is the common good when we, not only the individual, but in Catholic social teaching, the individual is always embedded in community. IHD helps us elaborate what those who are daily defining the common good in practice, that is public officials, legislators, bureaucrats, NGO managers, religious leaders, they're always constantly struggling with what does it mean to, to implement the common good, IHD suggests what they must take into account. That is um, the whole person. So we, we talked about uh, all of the different dimensions of the person. And so we avoid reductionism, that the person is only a consumer or a producer or a believer or, or, or whatever it may be. So it's the whole person that must be taken to account. And also IHD, again, specifies the common good that we must take into account the situated contexts of all persons, which are very different. And all of our societies are beset by challenges to IHD, but they can be, as, as you've heard from uh, Kat Bolton and others, they can be quite specific to a particular society. Thus, when we talk about integral human development, we trade a bit on the word integral, stretching it to include not only the whole person who is one integrated uh, individual, but um, also to the need approach to problems, so that when we address the common good, we recognize that it's not only uh, the politicians, the economists, or the ethicists, or the anthropologists, but really a phenomenon like a pandemic affects health and governance and human rights and so much so that we take an integrated approach to serving the common good of the human person. Finally, I'll say 
uh, the question was also about the relationship between IHD and common good and other parts of Catholic social tradition. These are all organically connected. As you know, the Pope is such a fan of IHD and such a proponent of the major Vatican dicastery, integral human development. And so um, I will, um, here we do value family, as I mentioned, IHD, and two doors down, one door down actually, is my brother-in-law who directs the Center for Social Concerns. So I'll stroll down after this and say, Bill, would you put IHD on your website along with the common good? So you'll see a change in that soon. Thanks for the great question. Thank you, Dean Appleby. Um, Kat, could you please take Mike Talbot's question? And, and before that, can you, you read through that? And meanwhile, I would ask Julia, could you take the second question about IHD operational principles? Is this question about what difference does IHD make, you know, on the ground and in practice? Would you have any any insights also from your from your field work that you could share? And while Julia gives us her insights, Kat can read Mike Talbot's complicated question and prepare a response. Julia, please. Um, thanks, Clemens. Yeah, I feel a little put on the spot. Um, I know. I'm, I'm put in on terms time. of operationalizing anthropology, but but I do think that um, one thing that we could think about in terms of oper I mean, you know, in order to solve a problem, you first have to determine and frame what kind of a problem it is. And I think one of the things that we see, especially in economizing approaches to public policy, is that problems are often framed at the scale of the individual or the family, and that that makes it enormously difficult to solve problems that exceed those scales. And there's lots of examples of this um, within and, and across national borders. And so I think one way to operationalize these insights from IHD is to search for different and better ways to problematize the issues that we face in a manner that doesn't cut our gaze off at the boundaries of the self or the boundaries of the household. Um, so to go back to this example of care and care work, you know, our, you know, in the United States, as in many developed countries, care work is understood as a private issue to be resolved by individual households. In reality, every individual household relies on a pretty wide infrastructure to kind of get care work done. In the United States, this is enormously challenging and expensive. And one, one kind of reason for the sustained um, inability uh, of the United States, I think, to deal with these issues is an inability to understand society beyond the scale of the household. So I think one way to operationalize all of this is to think really deeply about that first step. So before you solve a problem, you have to, you have to think about and define what kind of problem is this. And integral human development, I think Dean Appleby put really well, these different valences of the word integral, I think encourages us to take a slightly wider gaze and to think better think about and perhaps better listen to social movements that are already doing this thinking about how to recognize problems that extend beyond individualistic or right. household level issues. Thank you, thank you, Julia. Great, great thinking on your feet. That's why we put you on a panel rather than on the spot. Thank you. Um, so we have this question from Mike Talbot, which is basically about uh, the disparity between resource rich and resource, uh, re sorry, resource poor countries. And the question is, is there a healthcare debt that we owe to those in resource poor countries as well as marginalized communities within our own countries? And Kat has touched upon these disparities in her talk a little bit. Please, Kat. So I, I actually love this question, Mike. I think this is a vitally important question because what it leads us to talk about is not necessarily just moral solidarity or self-interest, but in debt, there is no wealth anywhere in the world that was not earned um, somewhat unfairly on the backs of others, whether this is you know, racial and class disparities in the U.S. or the terrible legacy of colonialism around the world. We owe that wealth and therefore we owe that health care. And I think moral solidarity actually kind of undermines the fact that this debt is owed. This is not a benevolent be kind of taken towards the developing world because that's still very condescending and paternalistic. Um, the entire wealth of the North was built on the backs of the South and it was built on the backs of the marginalized in our own communities and therefore that debt is owed. 
Thank you so much, Kat. I got a question which I think I will direct to Father Jim. It's about the role of Catholic universities in building a post-pandemic new social ethics. As most of you know, the Nanovic Institute for European Studies established a Catholic university partnership where Ukrainian Catholic University is uh, an important uh, member and partner. Uh, Notre Dame International is trying to build a Catholic universities consortium. And Father Jim, as I mentioned, is now our um, president of a Catholic university. Do you have any insights on the role of Catholic uh, in universities when it comes to these post-pandemic ethical challenges? Thank you. I do. Um the uh, the vital role for our institutions. Uh, everyone takes up these questions differently, and I admit I'm a psychologist, so typically focused on the individual, not a uh, social ethicist. But I I will say I do think in our institutions, to Julia's earlier point, a lot of these questions are are swirling around in society. So I wouldn't even limit it to our Catholic institutions. But if we don't recognize that some of the movements and the sort of the radical justice movements that's happening, the reckoning that has to happen, the Black Lives Matter movement, all of them are addressing some of the very issues that are at the heart of this. So I think the challenge for us as Catholic institutions is to recognize that we need not be siloed, but that we can be conveners of a conversation that is really important. Um, I think what impresses me so much about the Keogh School's mission is that it boldly takes on something that is quite obviously Catholic, and, and Scott will often say that much of, of this language, though we, we claim it, is, is broadly considered in other traditions and, and, and religions. But um, that's impressive, and I, I think uh, Catholic institutions need to be about the business of, of gathering people of different perspectives and of, of different uh, points of view around this issue, but we can be the place where that happens, and I hope we are. Thank you, Father Jim. We got a question from Sofia Opatska, uh, and I would leave it open to our esteemed panelists who wants to take this question. It's about uh, the challenges for the students and the challenges students are facing over the last year. Can we do a better job even during these difficult times for our students? What can it be? How can we best support our students? Anyone from the panel, just unmute yourselves and uh, fire away. I will say- Father Jim, please. I'm on a team of, uh, we realized once our students came and they were, you know, struggling in quarantine and isolation that they needed more attention than we were able to give them. Food is one thing, you know, you know, adequate shelter is fine, but it became evident very quickly. And so we put together a team of people who do pastoral calling and we call each student a couple of days after they enter and then we open a dialogue if they wish to, you know, carry on. So that's one of the ways in which we've seen uh, the importance of that very, addressing that very issue. Thank you. Any other insights? Uh, at Notre Dame, we try, I think, very hard to help our students and support them. I Something that I um, discovered from a um, sociologist at, at Notre Dame who works on social networks is that um, the average person over the age of 25 generally makes sort of meaningful, sustained contact with a total of eight people over the course of one day. For someone between the ages of 18 and 25, that number is 21 people. This is a profound wow. crisis of mental health um, for young people who need that kind of meaningful, sustained interaction with many people in order to live a healthy life. And that's something that we definitely somehow need to find a way to address. Thank you so much, Kate. I didn't know that. So that's, that's really, yeah. Um, we have, let's say, five minutes left, six minutes left. Is there any panelist who would like to ask a question to the other panelists? Maybe Dean Appleby, you have a chance to talk to esteemed colleagues before they run off to their respective duties. What, what questions may I pose to our colleagues? <laughs> um, I, I, here's a question, and this is a question for universities, our partners in this conversation. How, and we, we uh, struggle with this a bit, or we, we uh, uh, grapple with it. How, does, how do we integrate IHD into the curriculum? Um, uh, we've, I think, come, come some way in the Keough School with our faculty using this term. If, you know, if there are 60 faculty uh, now at the Keough School, there may be 75 different views of what IHD means and how it might be applied. So how can we, uh, how do we address this within the higher educational structure and especially in our courses? 
Thank you, thank you, Scott. This goes nicely together with what I will call the last question for this panel, which we just got. And the question is, um, when we talk about development, the term seems, along with progress, confusing. Are we aiming at unending development and progress? Don't we need to limit our desire for progress as our present models of development and progress result in many people and species in danger? So the question to the higher ed responsibility connected with this question about the development in IHD. Maybe, well, I don't want to put anyone on the spot, and I'm a little traumatized, but I would be tempted to ask Julia again, but I don't, I don't. Maybe Scott. <laughs> Uh, I'll say one. I'll say one thing while people are uh, composing smarter responses, which is, um, you know, the the classroom, uh, the the professor is sovereign in the classroom, and so we don't obviously we don't present a, a list of points to make about IHD in any class, other than the the seminar on IHD, which Clemens teaches for our graduate students and our undergraduates, uh, that all of them take to be introduced to the concept. But I was heartened by an anecdote a couple of years ago when um, precisely this question about development and growth was raised by one of our master's students in an, a, a class on development economics taught by our terrific colleague, Lakshmi Iyer. And this student raised uh, her hand and said, well, is growth always a good thing? Economists seem to, and Lakshmi paused and opened up the conversation about that. And that, to me, was, uh, you know, just a great moment where the, the student body felt uh, comfortable raising a, a moral ethical question uh, about economics in this case. And and she was terrific in, in uh, having a discussion about it. So that was one way. That's one great way to thank you. To do thank you, Scott. Uh, we are already moving towards the, the final statements, and then now I really have to call on people. Uh, we still have Scott's question, and we also got the question, uh, Ken, uh, do you think that the COVID pandemic and its effects on the world will weaken the recent rise of populist politics around the world? So maybe I start with Father Jim, then I would ask Julia for her statement and reflection, and then we end with Kat, where we uh, you know, had our last panelist. Father Jim. Thank you. I, I think I would want to say that the um, then the question of development being this ongoing phenomenon, I, I do think we will ever be on our way to the kingdom. And so we will always be struggling to get this right. And so I, I think the word is rather wisely chosen because we're going to be on our way. And uh, please, God, it will be ever better for the effort that people make, but it's, it's going to be a challenge. Um, I think I'll leave my comments at that and, and turn it over to Thank you, Father Jim. Professor Kowalski, if I may. Um, yeah, I mean, so I, I'm not an expert in populist politics around the world, um, but it is something I have been watching with great alarm in my own country, as I'm sure we all have. Um, one thing that I will say is that um, to, to bring this conversation back to questions about um, gender and care. I think one thing that we see in populist politics is a kind of twofold reaction to shifts in gender labor in the economy. So one thing that we see is a sort of, um, so some scholars have argued that the rise of populism around the world is actually a response to the increasing feminization of the economy and what it values. Um, that's a we could spend a whole conference panel debating that insight, but I think there's something there. And so um, on the one hand, kind of understanding the ways in which and the effects of these shifts, for example, in the United States from a manufacturing economy to an economy where the worker, the working class wears scrubs um, has, has really kind of prompted a lot of these anxieties precisely because we have these very deeply gendered ideas about who is good at what. Um, so on the one hand, I think gender matters in that way and, and could shape how we think about the impact of the pandemic on these kinds of politics in the future. Um, I would also say that another kind of effect of populism and populist politics has been to, um, well, maybe I'll leave it there, actually, because I don't want to take Thank up you. too much Thank of Thank you, Julia. Time. Yeah. Kat, you have the last word, but no need to summarize anything, right? Just no need, no need. Just, just you know, okay. make a few observations on those open questions. 
I, I actually teach a course called The Cult of Personality, which is about political charisma. And we have addressed many different types of leaders over the years. The last time I taught the course in 20, fall 2017, we addressed Trump for the first time. And at that point, the students still weren't sure that he was a charismatic, but that he did express a particular emotional hold on people. Now, I was reading about the um, aftermath of the Capitol riots again this morning because I can't seem to stay away from it. And what they found is that 90% of the people who entered the Capitol were actually oddly small business owners. And that was the one thing that they all had in common. And that populist politics might be this notion of being squeezed from all sides. You are not the wealthy elite who is already prioritized to receive that kind of attention as marginal. You are in this liminal middle position and that's where populism is coming from. Thank you, Kate. Dear panelists, we are at time. We have one minute or 30 seconds left. Generous sharing of your wisdom, expertise and insights and for responding to our questions. I would just like to add that yesterday in our IHD class, we talked about the connection between understanding vulnerability and uh, respecting the dignity of people. And having a deep sense of our own vulnerability and the vulnerability of others would be, I think, the building block for a new social ethics. Thank you, dear Ukrainian Catholic University, for inviting us to host the panel here from the University of Notre Dame. Thank you, dear friends, from and please back to Laviv uh, for you to end this panel. Thank you so much. Obviously, I'm confused now. Am I the last speaker? So am I am I to say now goodbye and live well and enjoy the rest of your lives? Okay, I do that. So thank you so much for having us and uh, thank you for all those who made this possible, also the technological support people. Thank you, Dean Appleby, thank you, Father Tim, thank you, Julia, and thank you, Kat. And uh, as I said, enjoy the rest of the day and the rest of your lives. God bless you all. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Thank, thank, you. You. thank, thank you. Thank you, Professor, Professor Stadman, for, for your wonderful, wonderful and, and very, very time-accurate moderation and a special thanks to our honorable panelists for a very insightful um speeches and for the very interesting and um, inspiring deliberation thank you very much it was um, truly and a true blessing to have you with us today thank you um dear ladies and gentlemen as for um for our further agenda for today, uh, we cordially invite you to stay with us. Um, and after a 15 minutes break, um, join our next panel discussion, um, Human Rights in the Time of COVID, moderated by Director of UKU uh, Law School, Chairman of Advisory Board, Managing Partner of KPLT Attorneys Law. Mr. Uh, Andrei Kostyuk. So now let's have a cup of coffee, tea, and see you very soon. Thank you. Welcome to the Ukrainian Catholic University, aka Uku. As a student here, you'll be able to be in a room such as this one and where there's plenty of natural light, there are plenty of storage places, there's a refrigerator and probably the best feature of all is the bathroom with a shower. This is the elevator, which is very convenient. So now we're heading to the cafeteria, which is located in the academic building right here. This is our beautiful cafeteria right here. And so here you can eat as little as you want to as much as you want. So many options to choose from. Always a great variety. The staff here are, they're very friendly. And again, you will never be hungry at this place. And after you're done eating, if you're still hungry, you can go to one of our two cafes here on campus. So you can go there if you want some coffee or tea, or if you want some sweets. Mm -hmm. 
But when the weather is nice outside, you can go and eat outside in this seating area, which is absolutely wonderful. Just relaxing. It's a wonderful stay in here. The campus is really, really beautiful, and it's very, very modern. And the people are very friendly here. It's a very inviting atmosphere. And the other thing is that almost everyone has like an intermediate level of the English language. So if you don't understand something, you can always ask one of the people walking by you, which is really, really wonderful. And the next place that we'll go to is the Metropolitan Andriy Sheptetsky Center, which is, as I like to say, the masterpiece, the most beautiful building on campus. And this is where you will likely have your Ukrainian language classes. And additionally, there are two terraces here and plenty of study areas. And as you walk on the inside, on the right side, we have the second cafe. And to the right of that, we have the college store. And as you can see, this is a nice, wonderful, open, inviting area. And this window wall right in front of us, it overlooks the Streisky Park, which is one of the largest and most beautiful parks here in Lviv. And so here on the left is the library. It's located on numerous floors. And we're gonna go right now to the classroom. And this is the classroom where all of the learning happens. And we will interrupt them and we will say hi to the wonderful Ukrainian language teachers right here. And the great Pani Mariana. And this room, this room is wonderful. Look at it, it's very large and very spacious. And these wonderful, these wonderful lectures right here are working on the textbooks, which is absolutely wonderful. That, from which I am working in fact. And so yes, this is our wonderful, wonderful classroom. We will go up to the fourth floor, which is a popular study area. Colors, like everything's open. It kind of like creates a desire inside of you to study. The left right here does a nice little comfortable seating area. As you can see, the students look very comfortable. We're having an awesome time. Now we'll go out to the beautiful terrace right here. And look at it. When the weather is nice outside right here, you can grab a book, do your homework, just sit right here and enjoy the wonderful view. And to the left here is the Streisky Park. Right in front of us is the Collegium where you will be living. In front, directly in front, to the right of the Collegium, is the wonderful church here on campus. As you can see, it's just very relaxing out here and you can just sit here for hours enjoying your book or whatever it may be. It is relaxing here, isn't it? It's just so nice up here. Now we will go to the second floor where there's another terrace, another beautiful terrace. And again, just look at this wonderful modern area right here. It's the second floor of the library, and right there are more classrooms. And we'll go out here to we'll go out here to the wonderful terrace. As you can see, to the right there are students discussing life, pondering life, or discussing their studies, their future. And right here, as you can see again, it's another magnificent view right here. And there are plenty of seating areas right here. And the beautiful colors that they chose, a nice white color and a nice, like a light green color. It's absolutely, it's absolutely beautiful. And as you can see, just look at the architecture of this building. It's just like mind boggling how someone could come up with such a beautiful building. So additionally, here on campus, you have excellent Wi-Fi. You have free Wi-Fi and it's absolutely wonderful. You don't have to pay anything for it. And especially like in the rooms too. In the Collegium, you have free Wi-Fi. Everywhere on campus, you have free Wi-Fi. And it's, it works very, very well. It's very, very well, very fast. And now, and now we're gonna go down to the basement where there's another wonderful little study area. So you can see there's some students studying down here on the first floor. There are some books here to the right. And we'll go up these stairs to another comfortable study area. It's like a small little like unique area and the green carpet, the nice inviting colors and the little study areas. You can see some students are relaxing, you're sleeping. Some students are talking and doing homework and it's just like a wonderful inviting area. So this is a nice little area you can study at, yes. 
And again, just look at this nice little, I don't know if it's called a flower garden, like all of these different plants. You can just sit here and it's like as if you're outside and it's inside. And it's just really nice and relaxing. And again, it creates like, an, uh, like, a, like a basic environment that you're outside. So this is the University Church of God's Holy Wisdom. And in fact, on this ground was where the um, Communist Party's cultural center was supposed to be in Western Ukraine. But now, ironically, it's a church. How the times have changed. So now we are heading back to the Collegium, which is where you will be living. And the beautiful thing here is that everything is located very close. So for instance, the Collegium is right here, and to get to the Sheptitsky Center, it'll take you 25 seconds tops. And as a student here, it's very secure. So you need a special chip to gain access into the building. And now we scan the little chip, and now we can get into the building. So strangers are not gonna be able to get in here. Five flights of stairs. And if you didn't get much exercise in a day, it's a great workout. Now we'll walk to where the office of the School of Ukrainian Language and Culture is located. It's conveniently located at the end of the fifth floor. Here are pictures of previous programs. There are summer programs from previous years. The School of Ukrainian Language and Program offers many different um, programs and courses. They have the Summer Ukrainian Program, a Spring and Fall Ukrainian Program. They have individual Ukrainian courses. They have online Ukrainian courses. They have Skype sessions. They have short-term study courses. And basically anything your heart desires, they'll most likely come up with a program for you. And now we are going to the office of the School of Ukrainian Language and Culture. And as you can see, there is one individual here right now, or two individuals, and it's a very, they're very, very friendly and very helpful. We welcome you to study at the School of Ukrainian Language and Culture, which is located at the Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv, the cultural capital of Ukraine. Класно, що викладачі ставлять ті завдання для нас, які відповідні ринку. Ці проекти були іспитами, ці проекти були заліками, ці проекти були просто якимись проміжними завданнями, з якими отримували оцінки. Найбільш цікавим це був предмет пані Софії Опацької підприємницьке мислення або entrepreneurial mindset англійською мовою, тому що я люблю вивчати бізнес, мені цікаві бізнес-кейси і треба було дуже багато аналітично думати. Найкорисніший однозначно був піар та зв'язки з громадськістю. Для мене багато практичних кейсів, які давала пані Світлана, Кисельова, вона просто відмінний викладач, мені дуже було корисно. Те, що я протягом півтора роки навчання тут отримала більшість, така велика впевнена більшість, я точно буду застосовувати на практиці. Тут не лише про професійні якості, хоча це велика частина цього, але й про якісь певні такі ціннісні якості, які, як на мене, мають відмінно просто адаптовуватися з професійними якостями. Діпфейки — це був для мене такий дуже цікавий науковий, в першу чергу, виклик, тому що це така доволі інтердисциплінарна робота. Я тренувала власну нейронну мережу, зробила діпфейк-ролик. Цей інструмент дуже швидко зростає, і про нього не просто треба знати, потрібно розуміти весь контекст його адаптації в медійне середовище. Тому я і, власне, за це взялася. Нехай Ті студенти, які вже ставатимуть випускниками, будуть в хороших професійних таких відносинах і будуть повертати і сказати, гей, ваші кейси були мені корисні в роботі. Я думаю, для викладача це най... Най... найвища цінність. Однозначно ставити перед собою великі виклики і шукати найбільш сприятливе середовище їх реалізації — це раз. А по-друге, не боятися долати ці виклики і як на мене, завжди е, пам'ятати про якісь базові цінності, крізь які ти ніколи не переступиш. Це 
це рівень постакадемічний. Ну, це унікальний досвід. Це такий якийсь новий проєкт. Це фантастична ініціатива. Please with the quality of the participants. В одній аудиторії під керівництвом провідних науковців, викладачів зі Стенфорда ми усі маємо можливість виробляти нові напрями для розвитку приватно-публічного партнерства і вирішення основних проблем, які існують в нашій країні. Коли я дізнався, що на кейсі суспільного мовника буде збудовано цілий такий курс на лідершип, і... Після цього я дізнався, що там буде Френсі Спокуяма, все, що лепо відпало, я не міг нічого казати дуже довго. Це просто справжня історія. Це фантастична можливість поспілкуватися зі стейкхолдерами і в першу чергу, звичайно, з таким гуру, як професор Фукуяма. People sit here, they cross over their ideas, they have the advice from professors, and with that they come with refreshed minds, uh, and they can really uh, better apply the ideas in real world. Дуже сподобалися заняття з кейсами, що стосувалося України. Крім теоретичних знань, також і дає практичні навики. Ти вже просто, коли підходиш до тієї чи іншої проблеми, то ти шукаєш самостійно шляхи вирішення. Було цікаво те, що ви намагаються на такому одному курсі поєднувати різні компоненти з різних наук, з різних галузей, що дає більш широке розуміння у сучасному глобальному контексті. This leadership academy for development is an opportunity for SIP to develop the, the capacity and the, the strategies within government and within other civil society organizations to appreciate and implement the private sector perspectives in their form general. Кожен дійсно учасник може бути спікером, може дуже багато з чого розказати. Учасники програми допізна обмінюються ідеями, які стосуються розвивання різних секторів і державного управління, і економіки, і фінансів, і багато чого іншого. Поштовх, думаю, що дасть не стільки програма, скільки люди, які на ній зараз навчаються, сприятливо інтелектуальному, емоційному, духовному середовищі подумати про план дій, порядок денний того, щоб все-таки спричинити прорив в країні, який нам критично, критично не Є завжди проблема якісного персоналу. І саме програма навчання, яка показує практичні навички державного управління, вона, я вважаю, що дуже потрібна. You know, as an outsider, I can't affect uh, the decisions Ukraine makes directly. If the only thing I can do is help give people the skills by which they can change their own country. Ми отримали дуже багато схвальних відгуків про цей захід. І зважаючи на те, ми вирішили, що такі академії лідерства повинні відбуватися в нашій країні і надалі. Ми запрошуємо долучатися до наступної академії лідерства, яку ми запланували на наступне півріччя 2017 року. Uh, I'm extremely happy to convene this panel uh, focused on human rights in times of COVID, uh, which is undoubtedly an extremely important issue affecting not only Ukraine, but the whole world. And I'm happy to present the distinguished panelists uh, of our panel. It will include uh, Professor Jeremy McBride, barrister at the Moncton Chambers with considerable experience in uh, human rights litigation. Uh, Professor McBride has also taught human rights, public international law and public law at several universities, including the University of Birmingham, Cambridge, Oxford, as well as Central European University in Budapest, where I had the pleasure to be uh, a student of Professor McBride. Also among our panelists is Dr. Sandra Krahenman, uh, lecturer at the Geneva Academy of International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights, and also thematic legal advisor at Geneva Call, 
international non-governmental organization uh, working on strengthening the respect uh, of humanitarian norms by armed non-state actors in order to uh, promote and improve the protection of civilians. Also, uh, Pavlo Pushkar, PhD, division head in the Council of Europe and the Directorate of General Human Rights and the Rule of Law. And last but not least, Andriy Kostyuk, chairman of advisory board of the Ukrainian Catholic University Law School and managing partner of KPLT. Uh, I propose that we begin our panel with uh, the presentation from Dr. Sandra Krahenman, who will present about the limitation of human rights in times of emergency, as well as equal access to healthcare and the vaccines. Uh, Dr. Krahenman, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Taras, for the kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here. And um, I'm already going to make my apologies that I will have to leave immediately afterwards because I am teaching at 6 p.m. my time. So this is a, a speed panel. Um, and also I'm speaking obviously in my personal capacity and not as a thematic legal advisor of Geneva Call, as though more as an academic. Um, I don't want to go into too many details because also I know we have uh, Jeremy McBride here who has done a lot of litigation, so he knows probably much more about this. But just to set a little bit the scene for when we speak about human rights and uh, response to COVID, I wanted to flag three points. No? So the first is, you know, that obviously COVID is a health crisis. And I think we should not forget that states do not only have negative obligations to respect human rights, but they also have a positive obligation to ensure the respect for human rights. Meaning that, you know, state inactivity in the face of uh, this health crisis would actually also be a concern from a human rights perspective. If the state had seen the crisis unfolding with many people getting sick and not taken any measures, I think we would still have the discussion we are having today, but from a very different angle. So I think that's something to be kept in mind as we analyze um, specific measures. Um, the second aspect is, as Atar has explained, I, and I think we that's what part of the panel is about, of course, we have witnessed since March, and many of us are still living it, the extent to which there has been quite unprecedented, at least in my lifetime, quite unprecedented restrictions on individual human rights when it comes to public life, you know, the restrictions we have on, on freedom of assembly and um, to move around, to meet people. I think that has, a in, in my country, in Switzerland, that led to the, a lot of discussion of what this means for democracy itself, that uh, we are no longer able to participate in public life in a way how we would normally be doing, all at the same time, while as part of the democratic process, important debates are going on. Um, but we have more limited ways now to participate in that. Um, we have seen a lot of restrictions also in our private life and in our home life. Now with restriction of how many people you can receive, who you can see, which is quite unprecedented as well. And I think one other thing we should not forget, we have seen a lot of restrictions also on the right to ed education, particularly with the closures of schools and uh, children being homeschooled and everything that comes with that. So on its face, it's um, I could not myself imagine another Of time. And then as Taurus has explained, you know, from a human rights perspective, of course, restrictions may be lawful depending that they fulfill certain requirements. So I don't want to go uh, into individual restrictions, but just to give you an overview of these conditions. Um, so of course, you know, they must be based on laws. And I think when we say based on law, we need to keep in mind that it's not just a question of a formal requirement, so not just to have a law, but that that law should actually have certain qualities and features, including also guarantees against abuse. Because as with any kind of emergency measure, that emergency measures quickly tend to become uh, permanent, and then they tend to be used in 
circumstances that are very different from what they were originally proposed for. And I think in some contexts, we have started to see this happening with measures against COVID. Um, as Taras may know, my main expertise is on counterterrorism and human rights, which is a particular feature we have seen that emergency measures in the, fa in the fight against terrorism have become permanent and they have started to become uh, used in very different kinds of settings than the fight against terrorism. So I think that's something we may want to keep in mind. Um, and then, of course, they need to fulfill a legitimate objective. You know? And I think with the COVID response, we all agree there's a, it's a question of um, a healthcare emergency. Then the measures taken, they need to be necessary and proportionate to be able to achieve that. When I think about it with analogy of counterterrorism, there we would also say, you know, the longer a measure goes on, the more also you must, you would require the state to be able to adapt and to react in a different way or with more safeguards for human rights than when the measure was break or when the emergency started. I think today also we're in a different situation than in March when many of us and, and uh, when we knew less about the um, the the virus, you know, less about the threats and states quite often didn't quite know, you know, how to react and then you would just do what, what other states did. Well, now we are almost a year later and then you know more, you know more about how to um, prevent transmission and so on. And you would, from a human rights perspective, also expected to see that reflected in the measures that are being taken. And then my last point on this is, um, at least in my country, a lot of the discussions around the restriction, they often make an analogy with, you know, generally individuals' rights to make decisions for their own health, you know, the, the, the right to refuse treatment, for example. They say, you know, uh, normally in a, in a hospital, you can refuse certain treatments, and normally there are complex legal aspects to that, but quite frequently would say, well, the individual's freedom of choice and the right to their own bodily integrity can prevail and it gives them a right to refuse treatment. In the context of the COVID response, I think that analogy does not really hold up that much in the sense that refusing measures or refusing treatment that could actually also be vaccine wouldn't just affect you individually and your own um, physical health, but it also has an impact on the community at large. And um, I think I will stop here in case there are questions and so on. Thank you, Sandra, for your quite enlightening and elaborate speech and for touching on so many important aspects. Like, like uh, I will now turn the floor to Professor Jeremy McBride, uh, who will talk about the emergency powers, limitation of rights and the duty to protect in a pandemic, uh, focusing on uh, legitimacy of invoking a derogation. And before I turn the floor to Jeremy McBride, I, I would like to thank Dr. Krahenman for finding the time to present it in our today's panel. And thank you in advance. I know that you have to leave for your classes. But thank you for being with us today. So, so Professor, Professor McBride, McBride, the floor, the floor is, yours. is yours. Thank you very much. Um, this is a complex issue and uh, I agree with a lot of it's just been said by uh, Sandra. Um, you know, first, it's this issue of the health aspect is quite important in where you look at the question of emergency powers because of the issue of positive obligations. Um, and the difficulty with talking about positive obligations, particularly when you look at um, the, the past case law of the European Court is that we haven't been faced with a situation of this this character. There are situations where the state has failed to act and people have been uh, able to complain about the, the failure to act, but um, we are in a sense moving into uncharted territory where we have to suddenly work out what is the appropriate response. Now, there will be problems, I think, certainly will arise with some of the preparation states made, for example, in some countries where there was a failure to have adequate protective equipments, there will be difficulties which will arise in relation to that. Now, I, I think, as Sandra said, this is definitely an emergency, although it's an emergency quite unlike any of the other emergencies which have arisen um, before the European Court of Human Rights, which 
of concerned issues, particularly about terrorism. Um, this is fundamentally different, but I think there is no question that there has been an emergency situation. Um, what's been interesting about this emergency is that although some countries have adopted emergency powers, they haven't actually treated it as an emergency from the perspective of the European Convention on Human Rights. In other words, to, to justify possibly um, excessive restrictions which may be imposed. Um, there were in fact been 10 uh, member states of the Council of Europe which adopted derogations. Um, but um, that leaves 37 others which have adopted very similar measures, uh, and yet um, they, while well, possibly sometimes saying it's an emergency, they have not said there's a need to use um, extraordinary powers. Um, if you look at some of the case law of the court, you can see that there are elements of um, the treatment which is being adopted which might be used to allow restricting. So, for example, um, to test compulsorily people whether they have coronavirus might well be something which would be seen as an obligation um, provided by law, but comes back to the point that Sandra rightly made, which is the need to have proper law um, clearly prescribed. And that is, I think, one of the difficulties which we've seen with increased use of powers made under delegated authority uh, and often with inadequate scrutiny of, of those powers. So those issues will arise. Um, there have been issues of compulsory vaccination where this has been seen as justified, but this is still a question which will need to be much further explored. Um, the question of limitations on ability to uh, meet, to go out, uh, undoubtedly do affect the rights of liberty. Um, the, the variation, of course, has been from complete confinement of people to their homes um, and circumstances when they're able to go out for certain matters. And that would change the way in which you look at the issue, for example, whether it's really a deprivation of liberty under Article 5 or it's an interference with freedom of movement. The more, for example, that you have the possibility of going out at least for some hours during the day, the more likely it is, I think, the European Court would see this as an interference with freedom of movement. That doesn't mean to say it, it um, doesn't then have to be justified, but it may be easier to justify on that kind of, of basis. There's really only one case where you've had confinement to prevent the spread of infectious diseases, which was a case um, concerned with um, the action taken against someone who had HIV. Um, and in that instance, it was held not to be justified because there was no evidence that this individual was at risk of propagating that particular uh, virus to other people. Um, the difficulty with coronavirus is that it's much more uh, difficult to work out how the transmission takes place. Um, in terms of HIV, you need a conscious act. In terms of coronavirus, that clearly isn't the case. So you have those kind of difficulties which arise. One of the problems that definitely um, arises is the question of panic, the fear that people will be affected by uh, particular statements about the risks that exist. Um, and a number of countries have tried to adopt restrictions which will allow them to control the dissemination of information. Um, this was particularly true in a number of countries which adopted derogations where they tried in their derogation, although not actually so much in their practice, to centralise dissemination of information. And that, I think, is much harder to justify. Um, the situations the need particularly to criticize the authorities in terms of what they're doing, to dispute their views. Um, there have been some cases where people have uh, been prosecuted for uh, what they say on social media in particular. Um, now in the current time, we have people disputing whether or not there is really a threat posed by coronavirus. But I think 
the question is whether or not that those kind of statements on social media are really likely to cause people not to do particular things or to incite them to do certain things. And I think you have to be very careful in seeking to justify that kind of information. And there may be a difference, um, if you look at the gay store of the European court, between the way you would approach the situation of individuals posting material and the situation of organized media, where there is a clear responsibility of journalists to check the question that they have. So in those senses, um, there will be question marks about some of the restrictions which be imposed. The final thing I want to mention is, is the need for actually positive action in terms of another consequence about expression, which is the use of hate speech, which has followed from um, the presence of the virus. People, particularly from Asian countries, have been the target of um, the idea that they are personally responsible. And this gives rise to the need to look at whether or not sufficient measures have been taken to tackle such hate speech. Um, and it's clear from the case law of the European Court that there are some positive obligations to do that. And I think that's an area where serious problems still arise because it's very easy when you're in a state of panic uh, to speak unpleasantly about others. And you can see at an institutional level that came very much in the relationship between the UK and the European Union when there was a question of the shortage of vaccination. So that these, I think, are a number of the difficult issues which will arise. And I, I have no doubt that the European Court will be faced with a number of cases in the coming years. Already there are a number of communicated cases in which COVID has been mentioned, although most of them don't actually deal with the kind of restrictions which I've been referring to, but more I'm sure will follow. So at that point, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Thank you, my Professor McBride, for your presentation. Uh, I will now give the floor to Pavlo Pushkar, who will focus on the obligation under the European Convention of Human Rights in times of pandemic and the execution of the European Court of Human Rights judgment. Mr. Pushkar, the floor is yours. Uh, hello. Yes, I wasn't allowed to unmute myself uh, uh, by the organizer. So uh, now I hope uh, you can hear me. And uh, yes, uh, I will. Um, I will speak very briefly, probably uh, on um, the issues that uh, uh, actually Jeremy has already covered a bit, and probably focus uh, on several issues uh, relating to pandemic and its influence on the human rights situation in Europe and with some elements that pertain to Ukraine. Uh, one has to start probably and agree with the fact that indeed the pandemic uh, has changed our lives and the lives of the societies, European society as a whole. Um, the human rights pandemic restrictions, indeed, they occurred on a wide scale basis. And the main obvious reason for such restrictions was indeed the protection of health and rights of others. And this was uh, one of the uh, most frequently cited uh, substantiations for the use of restriction of rights and uh, uh, one of the most cited uh, uh, ideas for the restrictions and basis for the restrictions cited in the declarations made by a number of state parties. Jeremy has already mentioned that a number of declarations were made under the convention um, by uh, some states like Armenia, Estonia, Latvia, uh, Georgia, Albania, Romania, San Marino, Serbia. And th these restrictions, uh, uh, they ended in some situations. They, are, they were uh, prolonged uh, in some situations for some states in view of the ongoing pandemic situation and deterioration of the situation in, in the states concerned. But there is already a question, as Jeremy has uh, uh, already uh, mentioned, and I would fully subscribe to that point of view. Uh, there, there are some states who made these declarations, there are others who didn't and actually still impose these measures. So what kind of approach would the court choose in dealing with such cases? 
uh, with uh, declarations already made. I'm not going to analyze in detail the declarations made on the various provisions of the Convention. However, um, it has been a constant practice of the European Court of Human Rights, uh, which has already communicated uh, more than a dozen of applications concerning various countries and the facts related to uh, COVID-19. It has been a practice uh, to assess uh, the compliance of the declarations or restrictions imposed uh, on rights through declarations or reservations um, uh, to assess it on the compliance with the requirements of the convention in the first place, as well as to deal with the substance of the complaints if the court decides that these complaints would be admi admissible, notwithstanding the declarations made. I don't want to anticipate the outcomes of such cases. However, I would like to say that there are already now quite a number of elements that um, are um, available for this vivid academic discussion. And most obviously, the rights that are touched upon are the right to life, uh, prohibition of ill treatment in situations of poor conditions of detention, more specifically, lawfulness and length of detention, restrictions on fair hearing rights, right to privacy, freedom of religion and association, right to property is one of the rights cited in the cases communicated, for instance. These rights would be at the center of the discussions uh, by the court in the future. And uh, during the annual conference, uh, by the way, the president of the European Court of Human Rights has referred to the fact that a number of applications have already been lodged with the court uh, on these elements. I would possibly align myself, and that's something I intended to, to speak about. I, I don't want to, um, to go beyond the, the timing, but I wanted to, to focus specifically also on one of the rights that has been restricted in the course of the pandemic. And uh, I think uh, one has to speak about the phenomenon um, of manipulative information and disinformation that has been uh, spread throughout social media and quite frequently that was replicated in the classical media. Uh, of course, I'm speaking the special context of freedom of speech and uh, restrictions imposed in view of the COVID-19 uh, you know, pandemic by the states. Secondly, in this uh, sense, uh, I wanted to, to mention that it is quite important to speak about the limits of free speech in the context of the pandemic and the restrictions imposed. Um, and for instance, the discussions also mentioned by Professor McBride on, on the vaccinations or the spread of the pandemic, they are the ones that could be in the focus of uh, future uh, applications uh, lodged with the court or examined by the court. I'm not arguing in favor of um, uh, having restrictions or not having restrictions. On the contrary, I'm speaking more about the need in situations where restrictions seem to be logical and obviously necessary in order to protect general population or individuals uh, from the negative health effects of the pandemic to justify the restrictions in a proper manner and to substantiate them to allow a possibility for judicial review of the restrictions. These are very clear requirements of Article 10 of the Convention, and I think they are quite pertinent to the situation at hand and uh, the respective relevant limits of the margin of appreciation allowed to the states as well as are a part of the principle of uh, subsidiarity, which is at the heart of the functioning of the European Convention on Human Rights uh, at the domestic level, more specifically. Lastly, speaking about implementation and functioning of the Convention institution, institutions, one cannot avoid speaking about uh, the execution process uh, and the impact of the COVID pandemic on the obligations arising for the respondent states under Article 46 of the Convention. First of all, one has to underline the unconditional character of the obligations arising from Article 6 of the Convention and the obligation, more specifically, to comply with the final and binding judgments of the court de delivered uh, against a specific state. Indeed, this obligation, obligation of restitution and integrum, cessation of a breach of the Convention and providing guarantees of non-repetition are uh, arising from the judgments of the court and especially they are especially pertinent to situations of systemic and structural problems. Obviously, COVID had a negative impact on the pace of execution process for such cases. Uh, in some situations, the authorities referred to the difficulties arising from COVID 
and how they precluded compliance or made compliance difficult, protracting execution of judgments, delaying some measures of general nature. Committee of Ministers, as a body responsible for the supervision of execution of judgments, obviously took uh, these objective obstacles into some flexibility to the measures of general nature in view of the COVID-related complexities. Unfortunately, this also concerns some Ukrainian cases, including the key pilot judgments uh, pending against Ukraine, cases of Ivanov Burmich and Sukachev, uh, concerning respectively uh, non-execution of the domestic court's judgments delivered against the state and poor conditions of detention. Notably, the situation of the pandemic caused serious budgetary cuts to the much-needed reforms in the areas uh, that these judgments identified as problematic, and thus undertakings of general measures. However, more generally, the standing of the Committee of Ministers seemed to suggest that the state's obligation uh, to comply with the judgments of the court, notwithstanding the pandemic difficulties, is still unconditional. And it has to be effectuated on the basis of the principles of good faith and pacta sum servanda. So the pandemic as such and the general situation of the pandemic is not an excuse for honoring uh, the obligation to comply with the final and binding judgments of the European Court of Human Rights. I would stop at this and would be happy to participate in the discussion. challenges and touch so many practical aspects related, related to human, human rights right. that this is impossible to cover in, our, in, in one hour. Our final speaker, however, will reflect on a more philosophical questions, uh, focusing on the dichotomy between uh, so-called first-generation human rights and second-generation human rights, or political and civil liberties and economic social rights respectively, and on the priorities and hierarchy of human rights and whether we shall trust more people or political institution. Mr. Kustyuk, the floor is yours. Thank you, Taras. <clears throat> Being the last speaker, you always have this privilege of uh, summarizing something or reflecting on uh, other people's uh, input, which is given already. And uh, I'm kind of uh, surprised how all the speakers were talking uh, the same direction and raising uh, the same concerns. Basically, the concern about uh, whether human rights in general are weakened or strengthened during the last year of the pandemic situation. You know, human rights basically come to the question at times like this. They came to question during the time of revolutions at the end of 18th century, and we got Bill of Rights of the US Constitution and Declaration of uh, Rights in the French Revolution. After the Second World War, we got discussion about human rights, which ended in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and the uh, UN as one of the guards of human rights. In my opinion, we are more or less on the same edge of our civilizational development. The last decade, we face a lot of uh, different uh, dangers. And these dangers were so systematic, for example, terrorist danger, or money laundry that only systematic international response was possible and this systematic international response was always in the direction of uh, imposing new rules imposing new restrictions uh, after terrorist attacks uh, in 2001 we got the whole uh, bulk of legislation uh, which restricted uh, privacy, especially privacy of our electronic communication. We know that everything is recorded, everything is monitored now. We are accustomed to this. Nobody cares anymore, but this is a new reality which 20 years ago nobody could have imagined that uh, basically there is no such right as uh, privacy of your letters, for example. 
there is no privacy of emails or of your tweets. It's it's definitely over. Another thing is uh, financial privacy. At the time of banking secrecy, a gun, and perhaps for good reasons, uh, it's we are declaring everything to tax authorities, to financial monitoring. We are always answering the questions and trying to whatever. <coughs> pose uh, ourselves in front of different uh, authorities which check whether we have uh, done everything uh, lawfully in our financial transactions. Now we are on the edge of this uh, with our healthcare. Discussion about vaccination uh, is more and more sharp and uh, we will come to the con conclusion perhaps that uh, vaccination is obligatory at the same point of time and then if you're not vaccinated uh, you're not allowed to travel in some places they will say you're not allowed to work even to be employed uh, in a certain uh, whatever in a cafe or in a public institution or whatever else so it will interfere with your labor rights so at this point of time we have really to think about our priorities. Because so-called first and second generation of human rights is really the question of how we approach the whole issue. Do we approach human rights, as it was historically the case, as our liberties, as our immunities, and the main target from which we have this immunity is basically the state, because the main abuser of human rights at the beginning of discussion of whatever natural or unalienable rights, this was king, state, police, somebody who, using power, can interfere and coerce you. After the Second World War, discussion between Western democracies and uh, Eastern Communist bloc was about the priority. So Western Americans, first of all, uh, diplomats were stressing that uh, you need to have liberties. President Truman was saying we have to live in the world free from coercion, the way of life which shall not be imposed. We fought Nazis who were intending to impose their will on us. Soviets were responding, it's quite okay, but you know, what are your political liberties worth in case if you are hungry or in case you are not educated or your health care system is not uh, free and cannot be accessed by poor people? So basically, human rights is about protection and providing uh, minimum bulk of services to the people. And we still have this discussion. We got two treaties on human rights, one civic and uh, personal rights, and another economic and social rights, precisely because of these two approaches. And now COVID and pandemic discussion is about the same thing again. To which extent we are ready to give up our immunities and our liberties in order to get more services, more protection, more state support? Another philosophical question, whom we are trying to trust in more? Is it more the question of trusting people? or more question of trust in institutions. Who is more reliable? Of course, institutions have procedures, they have experts. Basically, we hope they are democratic, we can still influence them. Is it the case? Do we really so strongly believe that institutions uh, cannot be corrupt? Basically, human rights reports of UN say that most of the countries in this world are still very far from in the institutional development from uh, where we would like them to be, including such countries as Ukraine, for example. 
do we really think that we can give up personal immunities in order that they decide what uh, people are allowed to do or not. Just to mention one example, at the time of first lockdown in Ukraine, among different restrictions, there was a restriction on aged people to go out from their homes. So basically anybody who was uh, over 65 in April 2020 was not allowed to go out to the street from their homes. We have forgotten this, but it's very uh, remarkable uh, thing. So people having power are still people. If they want to protect us, if they want to do everything for the common good, they nevertheless can impose measures which are sometimes, even in case of emergency, obviously excessive. And this discussion about the limits of the state powers is uh, to be continued and to be continued uh, based on certain principles. What has priority? In other areas we have the same uh, problems. For example, uh, Guantanamo case. US government tortured people who are supposedly terrorists in order to get information about the possible plans or about their allies. Perhaps CIA people got valuable information from these terrorists. But where are they allowed? Can we do this? Can we torture people in order to prevent a terrorist attack uh, within the next 24 hours? Okay, perhaps the question of whether somebody still working at school can spread COVID is not the same burning issue as the question of terrorist attack within 24 hours at that school. But this is the question of the same order, about the question of priority, whether human right, personal immunity has priority, or social welfare, and the general security has priority in this concrete situation. The question is not easy to answer. So I uh, stop at this point and uh, just as the last sentence, I like to remind ourselves on a nice old saying, basically medieval saying that uh, people are the only animals, the only creatures who can choose not the means, the ends, but the ends themselves. We can choose our goals and the freedom to choose is something so precious, so valuable, that we shall not uh, give up this easily. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kostiuk. I just like to mention that you probably stopped at the most interesting point of your presentation, posing all this question and then just saying that at this moment you will not provide any answer to those. Uh, those questions indeed. Indeed. Uh, we still have 15 minutes, so if uh, anybody in the audience has any questions, then we can ask them to our presenters and as a uh, moderator, I'll, I will use my privilege and ask the first questions question to basically all the all the presenters. Uh, since uh, all of you touched in one way or another this issue of limitations, issue of restrictions, and mentioning also the the freedom of speech. So my question is whether it would be justified uh, under not only European Convention of Human Rights but also uh, ICCPR, for example. Uh, to limit freedom of speech of people who um, spread this disinformation or information regarding the the vaccines and all these uh, myths about the, the vaccines so the, all these anti-vaccine activists and closing their accounts on social media and so on so uh, dr krahenman you are still with us so maybe you will you will start 
Well, Beth, thank you for a very fascinating discussion. I just told my students I'm going to be five minutes late because I couldn't leave. Um, before I answer your question, I just wanted to mention something that came to my mind um, during the discussion. And it's maybe an aspect to consider as well when we speak about the legitimate aim, you know, which is protection of health. Something I was struck with in, in the discourse we have seen in many countries is a restriction of the notion of health to physical health. While I think as the measures have been going on, we have also seen a parallel mental health emergency appearing. Um, and maybe that's something that needs to be considered as well, in particular for young people, also the elderly people, so that we do not fall into this trap of having a very narrow vision of what health means. On your question of freedom of expression, um, I mean, I'm mostly familiar with freedom of expression issues when it comes to incitement of violence. And I think Professor McCride, he alluded to that normally, you know, to restrict freedom of expression, it's a very contextualized assessment and there needs to be also a certain proximity of the risk that you create and by what you are saying. So I think for, we have never seen anything where it comes to discussions, anti-vaccine movements and so on. But I think it would be a fairly high bar then also to, to say, you know, this is actually a justified restrictions. More of a policy consideration um, is, you know, quite often faced with that kind of challenge, just restricting freedom of speech may not be the best approach because it tends then also to feed into a discourse of censorship. Um, the last point I wanted to make, and, and I think that's another layer of complexity because you mentioned social media, no? I think what we may be seeing is that social media um, platforms may themselves start to censor. And that would then be a slightly different issue in the sense of it's a term of use issue. Um, and there's a general concern about, you know, private companies being able to restrict freedom of expression themselves, also using different criteria than what we would normally request from states. And with that, I will stop and I'll say thank you very much to everybody involved. Um, it was really fascinating. Thank you, Taras, and I hope we can continue this discussion. Thank you, thank Sandra, you Sandra, and thank, thank you for staying, staying with us until the end. Uh, Professor McBride? I think much depends upon the nature of the, um, the expression. Um, there's, there are lots of differences between news that is, or voices that are fake. It's, I think it would be very difficult to justify restrictions on individuals saying vaccine is no good. I mean, everyone is entitled to their opinion. Uh, the question is whether it's something more orchestrated. And, and, and even if you're using social media, I don't see that that's a, a, a reason why people should be prevented from saying this is, is nonsense. I mean, just as they also, people, a lot of people say um, unfounded things about a whole range of issues. Um, but where you have um, media organizations which may be putting out clearly fake information, so for example, saying that um, particular vaccines will lead to certain health consequences which are patently unsubstantiated, then in those circumstances, I think that there might be a basis for some restrictions. But as Sandra was saying, you need to be very careful. And one of the other problems, I think, which would need to be weighed quite carefully is that the more you try to censor, the more you will create a sense that there is a conspiracy uh, and that will actually uh, undo the, the, the goal that you're trying to achieve. So there you are. Thank you, Professor, Professor McBride. McBride. Um, um, Mr. Carr. Yes, I think it's uh, very difficult to say that uh, just uh, closing down, down a media outlet or suppressing a particular instance of speech, uh, whatever it can be qualified, would be the only measure that would be appropriate in a situation of a pandemic. 
I think uh, there are multiple examples uh, of dealing with fake news, uh, malinformation, disinformation, and information chaos. And I think the role of the state in, in, in this situation as the role of the neutral regulator is very important. Uh, the state not only has to deal with uh, untrue information, but also has an obligation to ensure that uh, correct information is circulated because people they also have a right of access to information uh, and uh, that's something that has to be ensured uh, so there, there can be two obligations to regulate and on the other hand also to uh, provide the forum for for uh, exchange of views on on particular matters of public interest i think uh, there are some examples where, of course, uh, uh, the restrictions on um, uh, discussions that uh, undermine the efforts of the state in dealing with pandemic, uh, they are uh, being quite harshly addressed by the states. And on the other hand, I think it's the role of the state once again to ensure that there is uh, a viable uh, selection of tools to um, uh, rebut untrue information, rebut uh, fake information, to provide the public with correct information on a regular basis. And this is one of the core obligations in the course of the pandemic as well. So I think it's quite important to concentrate on that as a primary mean, rather than on suppression of information that might lead to uh, negative uh, outcomes. But indeed, I, I would subscribe uh, to what uh, Jeremy has referred to as well. It's quite difficult to speak about uh, it in abstract. I think it's much better to have a concrete uh, situation and concrete case uh, where um, untrue information is uh, being circulated. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Mr. Carr. Mr. Kustyuk. Just a few words about the freedom of speech. <clears throat> you know, this is uh, exactly the case. Why do we have the freedom of speech? Basically, it arose at the time when uh, censorship was normal thing. So the states, they like something to be said. And the other things they just don't like. And this is the same now. So sometimes uh, those having power like what is said in the media, sometimes they dislike. If they dislike, they would rather shut down this. And yeah, perhaps they dislike for good reasons. Perhaps uh, this is bad what is told by those who are criticizing the state. Perhaps this is not true. But at the time when the freedom of speech was raising to the level of natural right, unalienable right, now we call it human right. The thesis was that it, it is so important that rational being, free being, human being, has the right to say what he thinks, or what he wants to say. He shall not be shut down. So in that sense, for example, the whole discussion about hate speech uh, is burning. For example, U.S. were not supporting those treaties which prohibit hate speech because U.S. said uh, we are for freedom of speech. It's very important for our culture. But then U.S. ended in uh, closing down Trump account on the Twitter. So there are limits or whatever there are priorities. So for me, the freedom of speech, including uh, discussion about vaccination uh, is another indicator of whom we are trusting. Are we trusting those who have power and they call themselves institutions? Or are we trusting common sense and uh, free rationality of us as human beings? Thank you for your responses. Uh, other questions from the audience? Can I can I just add one thing yes, uh, to, to this discussion very quickly? I think we are also omitting uh, the fact that uh, European Convention on Human Rights very much relies 
on the ideas of ethical journalism and fact-based journalism. So, uh, and I would also like to underline that the right uh, to freedom of expression under Article 10 is a right which can be restricted. So in a sense, um, one can speak about uh, the possibility to restrict this right and this right not being unlimited right. Uh, and also, once again, the idea of ethical journalism and fact-based journalism is something that is very much a part of the European Court's case law. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if there is no questions, then uh, yes, Professor McBride. Yeah, I'd like to come back to this question of priorities because I think that that's a very important question. Um, I, I accept that there was the whole dichotomy between East and West over economic and social and some political rights. But that really doesn't reflect, I think, the modern situation where if you look at what is happening within the framework of the Council of Europe, it's very clear that, that both sets of rights are of importance. And the emergence within the interpretation of the European Convention on Human Rights of a whole sense of positive obligations is precisely because we are prioritizing um, the need for good health, uh, the need for life even. Um, and this is some of the problems which will come out of the pandemic crisis, whether or not actually enough has been done. Uh, we talk about the restrictions on liberty, but that those restrictions on liberty are to secure health. Now, they may not all be justified, and some of them may not be adequate. Um, and there are many areas where there have been particular problems. But I think the notion that there's only one perspective being looked at is, is wrong. The idea is very much to see that we should have um, both sets of rights being protected. Uh, thank, thank you, Professor, Professor McBride. McBride. At, at this moment, I would like to maybe follow up with uh, the question I wanted to ask regarding the equal access to vaccines and also the positive obligation of states, but not only positive obligation of states towards its own citizens, but maybe on the more universal level. Because I distinctly remember when the disease was spreading all over the world, there were so many voices and reports that when the vaccine is developed, all the states should have equal access to, to the vaccines because this is like we are in we are all in this together and the UN report on this issue. And then when vaccine was actually developed, then it immediately appeared that the developed rich countries had have much better access to it and countries that are developing go so called third world countries will be uh, will receive their their share of the vaccines much later. Uh, so uh, is this a uh, human rights issue or is this merely a question of uh, economic possibilities of those states to, to buy those vaccines or to develop those vaccines? And maybe we can start with Mr. Kostyuk this time. Thank you. So me, for me, this is again the same dichotomy. It's still uh, somebody's property somebody's uh, inter intellectual property, somebody has invested billions in order to develop this. Unfortunately, these are the people who, again, have power and have money, the Western democracies and Western uh, superpowers. So yes, they have better access to this because they have produced it. The company Pfizer, the company AstraZeneca, they are all based there. If uh, there would be African uh, or whatever country, Latin America, who can develop uh, its own vaccine, they would supposedly vaccinate their own people first. So, in a sense, uh, it's the question of uh, freedom, uh, of... Uh, economy of market of course it's good to be able to give to everybody not just bread but also vaccine so we hope that at the end of the day everybody will have the possibility to be vaccinated with good healthy cheap and reliable vaccine including all people in Africa, all people in Ukraine, all people in Asia. 
but uh, does the company Pfizer have strict obligation to distribute all the vaccines like numerically, for example, according to the number of population uh, in different countries, or can it freely choose with whom to conclude contract first and uh, what money basically to charge for one portion of the vaccine? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Pushkar, would you like to comment? Uh, yes, I think um, the the idea that uh, vaccinations and healthcare services should be provided to all, notwithstanding the uh, social uh, level of the person concerned or, or belonging to particular societal and social groups uh, that are deprived of access to medical care and are especially vulnerable, it has been discussed a lot in Europe most recently. Even the European Court of Human Rights most recently dealt with a number of applications uh, coming from refugee camps uh, and uh, as regards migrants, uh, um, issues of migration that uh, were relating to the COVID pandemic. And I think um, more generally the issues of uh, protection of social rights became much more important in the discussions both before the Council of Europe and the European Union. And the, both of these organizations, they uh, reconfirm at the political level that uh, access to vaccination has to be provided on equal footing, not only uh, to the so-called rich countries, but also to the poor countries. And I think we are coming back to this discussion, uh, which is still very important, and it's becoming even more important in times of the pandemic, and the, it will be very important in the aftermath uh, of the pandemic is the issue of poverty. Poverty and how to um, uh, combat poverty and what kind of measures can be taken, both from the point of view of protection of fundamental rights, such as, for instance, right to life or uh, right to privacy, right to health care, which is becoming more and more a part of this uh, right to privacy. So in a sense, uh, this uh, connotation between the fundamental rights and social rights, which had depicted in the um, European Social Charter, is is becoming more and more actual. And uh, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that uh, in April 2020, the European Social Rights Committee has adopted a statement of interpretation uh, on the rights to protection of health in times of the pandemic, which gives guidance to the states uh, as to how they should uh, uh, treat their population and how they should provide health care in the times of the pandemic, it, with focus on especially vulnerable groups and uh, including those that are deprived of economic means. Thank you. Thank you. And Professor McBride? Yes, um, I think there's a difference between the situation of the companies, um, because in particular, standards in relation to business and human rights are still rather weak. But the, the issue of obligations to ensure distribution of the vaccines really are ones which apply to the states. And it's the states, therefore, dealing with their relationship with uh, the people who manufacture and supply the vaccines where those obligations arise. There are commitments made by members of the World Health Organization. Um, and so there are, uh, I think, obligations to ensure that there's distribution. So that's in terms of uh, rights of solidarity, which do have some basis in international law. But separately, um, if we don't do it, it's also a question of, um, from a self-interested point of view, because if there isn't global vaccination, then return to what we used to describe as normal life will not be possible because as long as there are places where the, vac where the virus can thrive, then we are all remaining at risk because as we've seen, um, variants in the vaccine develop and they may become more difficult uh, to deal with. So we are not safe by assuming that we vaccinate all our people in our particular country. Uh, that isn't the end of the story by any means. Thank you, Professor McBride. And I think we, we already, already over-exhausted our time. 
So I would like to thank to all the panelists for their speeches, for sharing with us their thoughts and ideas, and thank you to all of those who followed the discussion either in person or online. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much, dear dear panelists, dear speakers, for this instance of integrating Europe academically, intellectually. I've been informed that we had we had Geneva here, we had London, we had uh, Strasbourg, we had Lviv at least. Perhaps perhaps we had we had more of that. And uh, now we're going to have a brief coffee break for 12 minutes and we resume at 7.30 Eastern European time, which is 12.30 in Washington for the conversation between Jose Casanova and Catherine Marshall, uh, two world-class scholars of Georgetown University. And that is going to be on uh, integral human development uh, and religion in, in the global world. Uh, thank you very much once again, and please be sure to stay with us. Thank you. Welcome to the Ukrainian Catholic University, aka Uku. As a student here, you'll be able to be in a room such as this one. And where there's plenty of natural light, there are plenty of storage places, there's a refrigerator, and probably the best feature of all is the bathroom with a shower. This is the elevator, which is very convenient. So now we're heading to the cafeteria, which is located in the academic building right here. This is our beautiful cafeteria right here. And so here you can eat as little as you want to as much as you want. So many options to choose from. Always a great variety. The staff here are, they're very friendly and again, you will never be hungry at this place. And after you're done eating, if you're still hungry, you can go to one of our two cafes here on campus. So you can go there if you want some coffee or tea or if you want some sweets. When the weather is nice outside, you can go and eat outside in this seating area, which is absolutely wonderful, just relaxing. It's a wonderful stay in here. The campus is really, really beautiful and it's very, very modern. And the people are very friendly here. It's a very inviting atmosphere. And the other thing is that almost everyone has like an intermediate level of the English language. So if you don't understand something, you can always ask one of the people walking by you, which is really, really wonderful. And the next place that we'll go to is the Metropolitan Andriy Sheptetsky Center, which is, as I like to say, the masterpiece, the most beautiful building on campus. And this is where you will likely have your Ukrainian language classes. And additionally, there are two terraces here and plenty of study areas. And as you walk on the inside, on the right side, we have the second cafe, and to the right of that, we have the college store. And as you can see, this is a nice, wonderful, open, inviting area. And this window wall right in front of us, it overlooks the Streisky Park, which is one of the largest and most beautiful parks here in Lviv. And so here on the left is the library. It's located on numerous floors. And we're gonna go right now to the classroom. And this is the classroom where all of the learning happens. And we will interrupt them and we will say hi to the wonderful Ukrainian language teachers right here. And the great Pani Mariana. And this room, this room is wonderful. Look at it, it's very large and very spacious. And these wonderful, these wonderful lectures right here are working on the textbooks, which is absolutely wonderful. That, from which I am working, in fact. And so yes, this is our wonderful, wonderful classroom. 
we will go up to the fourth floor, which is a popular study area. Colors, like everything's open. It kind of like creates a desire inside of you to study. And to the left right here, there's a nice little comfortable seating area. As you can see, the students look very comfortable. All right, having an awesome time. Now, we'll go out to the beautiful terrace right here. And look at it, when the weather is nice outside right here, you can grab a book, do your homework, just sit right here, and enjoy the wonderful view. And to the left here is the Streski Park. Right in front of us is the Collegium, where you will be living. In front, directly in front, to the right of the Collegium, is the wonderful church here on campus. As you can see, it's just very relaxing out here, and you can just sit here for hours, enjoying your book or whatever it may be. It is relaxing here, isn't it? It's just so nice up here. Now we will go to the second floor where there's another terrace, another beautiful terrace. And again, just look at this wonderful modern area right here. It's the second floor of the library, and right there are more classrooms. And we'll go out here to we'll go out here to the wonderful terrace. As you can see, to the right there are students discussing life, pondering life, or discussing their studies, their future. And right here, as you can see again, it's another magnificent view right here. And there are plenty of seating areas right here, and the beautiful colors that they chose—a nice white color and a nice, like a light green color. It's absolutely, it's absolutely beautiful. And as you can see, just look at the architecture of this building. It's just like mind-boggling how someone could come up with such a beautiful building. So additionally, here on campus, you have excellent Wi-Fi. You have free Wi-Fi, and it's absolutely wonderful. You don't have to pay anything for it. And especially like in the rooms too. In the Collegium, you have free Wi-Fi. Everywhere on campus, you have free Wi-Fi. And it's, it works very, very well. It's very, very well, very fast. And now, and now we're gonna go down to the basement where there's another wonderful little study area. So you can see there's some students studying down here on the first floor. There are some books here to the right. And we'll go up these stairs to another comfortable study area. It's like a small little like unique area and the green carpet, the nice inviting colors and the little study areas. So you can see some students are relaxing, you're sleeping, some students are talking and doing homework and it's just like a wonderful inviting area. So this is a nice little area you can study at. Yes. And again, just look at this nice little, I don't know if it's called a flower garden, but like all of these different plants. You can just sit here and it's like as if you're outside and it's inside. Again, it's just really nice and relaxing. And again, it creates like an, uh, like a, like a basic environment that you're outside. So this is the University Church of God's Holy Wisdom. And in fact, on this ground, was where the um, Communist Party's cultural center was supposed to be in Western Ukraine. But now, ironically, it's a church. How the times have changed. So now we are heading back to the Collegium, which is where you will be living. And the beautiful thing here is that everything is located very close. So for instance, the Collegium is right here, and to get to the Sheptitsky Center, it'll take you 25 seconds tops. And as a student here, it's very secure. So you need a special chip to gain access into the building. And now, we scan the little chip, and now we can get into the building. So strangers are not gonna be able to get in here. Five flights of stairs. And if you didn't get much exercise in a day, it's a great workout. Now we'll walk to where the office of the School of Ukrainian Language and Culture is located. It's conveniently located at the end of the fifth floor. 
here are pictures of previous programs. There are summer programs from previous years. The School of Ukrainian Language and Program offers many different um, programs and courses. They have the summer Ukrainian program, a spring and fall Ukrainian program. They have individual Ukrainian courses. They have online Ukrainian courses. They have Skype sessions. They have short-term study courses. And basically anything your heart desires, they'll most likely come up with a program for you. And now we are going to the office of the School of Ukrainian Language and Culture. And as you can see, there is one individual here right now, uh, two individuals, and it's a very, they're very, very friendly and very helpful. We welcome you to study at the School of Ukrainian Language and Culture, which is located at the Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv, the cultural capital of Ukraine. Dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome back to our conference. We keep our agenda moving forward, uh, and I'm more than sure that many of you have been looking forward to the event I will now have an honor to announce. Religion and integral human development on the global level. This topic definitely resonates in the thought of each of us regardless the country of origin, social or economic status. I will have a great honor to announce a moderator of the interview with Catherine Marshall, a valued uh, friend of Ukrainian Catholic University, uh, Professor Jose Casanova, senior fellow at Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs at Georgetown University. Professor Casanova, I warmly welcome you um, to virtual Ukrainian Catholic University and now can give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. It's good afternoon here in the East Coast where Catherine and I are also separated, but uh, uh, and it's good evening for all of you in Ukraine. It's a great pleasure uh, to participate in this conference. Uh, as you may know, I am a member of the advisory board of the International Institute for Ethics and Contemporary Issues, which has been sponsoring, organizing these conferences on integral human development in the digital age. And of course, we didn't know that we will have to go digitally. And so here we are digitally, all of us, to discuss uh, development today, particularly development at the global level. And I have the honor and the pleasure to have uh, as uh, the interviewed or the conversationalist, my dear friend and my fellow also at the Berkeley Center, Catherine Marshall. Catherine, welcome. Catherine also has visited UKU. I'm delighted to be with you. Wish I were in Ukraine, but uh, the good news from Washington, D.C. is that there are signs of spring and the sun is out. 
So well, we still have a lot of snow here. I'm in Montclair, New Jersey, but yes, it's 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 almost. Um, Catherine, uh, you are the executive director of the World Faith Development Dialogue. You work for 36 years in the uh, World Bank, precisely first on all kinds of issues of development throughout the world, particularly in the poorest countries in the world, in Africa, Asia, Latin America. And then your last year, for six years, you led the Faith and Ethics Initiative. I assume this is what led you then to uh, uh, help create the faiths, the World Faiths Development Dialogue. So tell us about what it is, this World Faiths Development Dialogue that you are leading. Uh, in 1998, uh, in other words, uh, quite a bit before a, a major event that shifted people's thinking about the role of uh, religion in world affairs, which was 9-11 and some of the other uh, associated events, uh, the president of the World Bank at the time, Jim Wolfenson, and the Archbishop of Canterbury, along with um, um, Monsignor Echigaray from the Vatican, uh, Prince Talal, um, the Aga Khan, came together uh, with the idea that there was a very large missing piece in global approaches to international development, uh, which was religion, uh, that to this day, I don't think that the World Bank in its library has a category for religion. Uh, but that's true of most of the UN agencies, that even if they dealt with organizations, it was simply not on the formal agenda. Uh, but because of particularly such roles in health and education, uh, Wolfenson, Lord Carey, uh, and others uh, decided that there needed to be um, a, a dialogue, and I was asked to help uh, in turning what had been an idea into something much more practical. Um, I will continue for a minute here, which is because the story is an interesting one, that it seemed something particularly um, a good idea, but that was also uncontroversial, uh, which was to have a dialogue. Uh, but in practice, what happened is that there was almost unanimous opposition from the 193 member countries that were part of the World Bank board. Actually, it was 184 only in the World Bank at that time. Uh, and we spent a great deal of time trying to understand what the objections were. And they had a lot to do with the political roles of religious institutions. The sense, because the World Bank's mandate is to avoid being directly involved in politics. Uh, but it was also two other things. One was the sense that religion was no longer very important, which we all know now not to be true. But the other was the view that many uh, religious institutions were against some fundamental aspects, some fundamental issues on the development agenda, which were to a large extent, of course, uh, human rights. But above all, nothing was more prominent in those early discussions than gender roles and the role of women where religious institutions had the reputation of being very patriarchal uh, and of not appreciating the significance of equality for women. So to fast forward very quickly, uh, because uh, of this controversy, I was drawn deeper and deeper into an issue which was not my area, which I had not known much about, became fascinated by it, became fascinated by the people. And when Wolfenson left the bank, I moved to Georgetown University to the Berkeley Center, which was just being established. Well, now you are recognized as the world expert on faith and development. So after working for 20 years in this area, almost shaping the field through your initiatives, how are faith and development related? Positively, negatively, 
What is the relationship and why it's so important to consider the relationship at different levels? Well, first of all, the relationship is clearly important because both the sort of vast world of religious institutions, but also the complex global agenda, which is epitomized in the sustainable development goals, um, are enormously significant for the world's population, not just for the poor. Um, but to answer your question a bit more directly, I think we always need to appreciate that the religious worlds, which are very diverse, can be part of the problem. In other words, they can be an obstacle. And I think the most dramatic case is religiously inspired or colored conflicts in the world, but also some others that I mentioned before. But that religious institutions are also, in so many different ways, a part of the solution with many different factors involved, including direct service delivery, for example, the universities and the schools that are run by religious institutions. In the COVID crisis, we're acutely conscious of the health roles at many different levels. Uh, and the peace building, the peacekeeping roles of religious institutions. And so the whole broad development agenda uh, is missing very important pieces when they both the development and the religious actors are not at the table when decisions are made. Right. So you, we've mentioned health, education, gender. We'll come to each of these points. But let's first try to uh, see how it's because, as you know, this conference is about integral human development. Usually, uh, it's taken as the personal human development. Uh, obviously, you work at the societal level of development. How are these two uh, parts of the puzzle, the personal integral human development and societal integral development related? And why it's important to look at both aspects of the, 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 the relationship? Well, let me start with one of the important concepts uh, in thinking in a more sophisticated, nuanced way about what development means. Uh, and that is um, what's called the capabilities report uh, uh, <laughs> approach, which is to develop to get to develop each individual's capacities, to give them the freedom but also the support to develop through education or through many other aspects, uh, their, uh, their capabilities. So I think that that's a one piece of it. So that's one. A second, which I'm teaching at the moment, um, a class on ethics and development. And one of the critical issues is what is the motivation for people to support others. And part of the fascinating history is that in most pa of the past eras, uh, charity was as much for the benefit of the giver to improve their chance of, of, a, of, a, of a life after death, but also to improve their character, uh, because there was very little thought that it was possible to end poverty. The idea that you could actually end poverty is quite a modern and a new idea. So I think that this idea of shifting from a, an approach of charity to one that is founded in rights and the sense that every individual has the right to develop their capabilities is where you make this link between the personal compassion and sense of, of being a part of a human family to a new sense, which is really post-World War II, which is that it is both possible, and because it's possible, it is critically important to do something to end avoidable suffering and therefore extreme poverty. But also, avoidable diseases. You've worked for many years precisely on the health front. And also it was not thought that it would be possible to end all kinds of diseases that have basically uh, uh, burdened humanity for centuries. Malaria, all kinds of other, of other. 
and now come this issue of pandemics. You've worked uh, an issue of pandemics before. You work on the Ebola pandemic in Africa. Uh, what lessons did, have you learned from it? Uh, and what is new about the COVID-19? What is the relationship and why are we in a different world? What is going on? What is happening? Now, that's a, that's a great question and also um, a complicated one. In many ways, uh, and for various reasons, health was sort of the entry point. When you try to persuade someone uh, who doesn't think much about religion or who even might be hostile to religion, that they should be paying attention, health is the most obvious. And that's, first of all, because religious institutions run significant parts of the healthcare systems. The Catholic Church, for example, has many hospitals and clinics. That's true, especially in Africa, but in other parts of the world as well. But also the factors that are prevention of disease, that affect prevention of disease, uh, that are the community support, for example, for tuberculosis, Tuberculosis uh, have to do with um, with with religious beliefs and with the the community pressures. Uh, this came to a head particularly with the HIV/AIDS crisis um, because, in many ways, in the early years when it was seen as a disease of homosexuals above all, many uh, religious institutions railed against. Um, the action on HIV AIDS, which they saw as a disease of immorality, but at the same time, communities that cared for people were among the most compassionate in the world, uh, who cared for for children who were dying, who cared for people who were dying. So you had on the one hand, people priests who would refuse to bury someone who died of AIDS in the churchyard. Uh, encouraging stigma, and on the other, the growth of an enormous movement of compassion. So all of a sudden, there was a new awareness that the these communities needed to be together and to work together. Now, with the Ebola crisis, you had very similar phenomena than in the beginning, uh, the public health specialists didn't pay much attention to the churches. But then they realized First, that um, in terms of communications, the, the churches had and the other the mosques had enormous power to communicate, whether through social media or through uh, sermons or whatever. Um, and they also had more trust from communities than other sectors. And this came to a head in the Ebola crisis when it was understood that a lot of the transmission of Ebola was taking place through funerals um, and people handling bodies when, in fact, they were the most infectious. And finally, uh, they realized people were digging bodies up or hiding their dead uh, because they did not like the idea of people carting them away and cremating the bodies or burying them in an undignified way. So you had the World Health Organization and a number of others that came together uh, and came up with a protocol on dignified um, burial and respectful burials, which many described as a game changer. In other words, one that really brought the communities together. Now, you asked about the COVID crisis. Um, because of this past experience, very early in the crisis, in early March, we were reading even about some cases where religious communities were blamed for being a super spreader, were clearly involved. Um, the uh, churches in Korea, but the Tablighi Jamaat, Muslim communities had large gatherings where a lot of people got sick. So we decided to track uh, exactly what was happening with the COVID crisis of how religious communities were responding in different parts of the world. And that has led us to uh, a year long project. We're about to celebrate the first. I don't know if celebrate is the right word. We're about to mark um, the first anniversary of um, the gathering of a very large repository of information. Uh, we've sent out daily or weekly reports. We've held a number of webinars. We had a webinar last night that was focused on the challenges of the vaccination campaigns, uh, where there is there are many 
ethical issues and where religious communities are understood to be a pivotal part of society that will determine whether or not the global vaccination campaign is successful. Um, let's go back to the question of gender. You've also been uh, very much for a long time uh, uh, involved as an advocate for the need to take very seriously the questions of gender inequality, which are so related to questions of all kinds of inequality and development also faith. So why is gender so important in this whole area of integral human development, faith and development, and uh, simply development? Well, in your kind introduction of my bio, it's clear that I've been around for a long time. Uh, and therefore, I have been part of what is a sea change in thinking about relationships between men and women that includes the international development field. Uh, when I started, there were almost no women, except in secretarial positions, where they were all of the people who were involved. Uh, and it took some time uh, in many different institutions. It really went institution by institution for there to be a recognition that women should be, first of all, part of the of the people who were working on development. And secondly, uh, that they there needed to be an explicit focus on the welfare of women in development programs. And the what really changed the, the thinking uh, was, and it's a very interesting example, was research about the benefits of education of girls. Uh, this research demonstrated that there were remarkable improvements in welfare of the society at, at large when a significant number of girls were educated. And you could even measure it. Uh, one of my favorite examples was that there is a correlation between a woman's level of education and her child's head size, which is explained largely by education encouraging better nutrition. Uh, but this is true in looking at income, uh, looking at uh, family welfare, looking at the outcome for children, uh, and so forth. So within the development field, no respectable institution now uh, would not have gender equality as one of their central objectives. Uh, and of course, you point to the fact that there are many other inequalities, but gender is really the largest group because we're talking about more than half the world's population in societies which traditionally have been quite patriarchal. So that brings me to the question of religious institutions, uh, because um, it clearly within the development field, maybe behavior doesn't always follow what are the announced ideals and principles of equality and equity. Uh, but in religious institutions, there are many traditions that are deeply ingrained that really are unequal between men and women with the most obvious one, whether or not they can be uh, ordained members of a clergy or religious leaders, uh, but also many others that extend to relationships within families. The way that people think about domestic violence, for example, uh, the way that they view decision making. So, Clearly, there are some religious traditions which have been on the leadership in the world on women's equality, uh, but there are many others that have not. And that has been a major obstacle so that when you see a photograph of a group of religious leaders who are all men and who are all older, many people in the development sphere will simply say, why should we pay attention? to groups that do not accept what is a central premise of what makes for successful development. Since we are in Ukraine, and particularly in Galicia, in Halechena, let me, of course, uh, this is the stronghold of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. This is, of course, UKU is a, a Ukrainian Catholic University. Uh, it doesn't have married women, but it had married priests. And the wives of the priests 
and the daughters of the priests. I mean, the priests were the leaders of the community and issues of development, of education, literacy, health. But the women, the, the, the wives of the priests and the daughters were also at the, at the, at the forefront of uh, social issues development in Galicia in the 19th century and at the beginning of the 20th century. And this is crucial because, of course, they play the role of leadership. Uh, men, uh, 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 and this is an issue also precisely when we talk of religion, we should not only consider precisely the hierarchy of uh, male, uh, let's say, religious leaders, but the local level women play a crucial role in religious community development. So in because of that, it's also very important not to only, if you wish, go to the high level of um, the hierarchies, but especially at the local level where women are so much involved also in both development, education, religious issues. Yeah, we, um, um, we tend to speak now of religious actors. Uh, and when you say religious actors, you are looking to women who may play very informal leadership roles as well as ones who are, who are designated. But again, as you're, I think, highlighting, often religious beliefs are more held by more firmly held by women than by men the the that is something that many surveys uh have showed and of course they play critical roles in passing on the values uh and the ethics that are embedded in religious traditions to their children and of course in the catholic tradition since we are in this meets uh female uh, religious sisters have played a crucial role both in education, in health. I mean, hospitals, uh, of the Catholic Church, all the schools at all levels, uh, women have played a, a crucial role and still do. Um, you mentioned before dignified uh, burials. Uh, uh, one of the, of course, of the, if you wish, uh, hard lessons uh, uh, of COVID has been the impossibility of families coming together to bury their loved ones. Um, there are other issues uh, uh, that COVID-19 has affected social relations. Uh, there are a lot of paradoxes. On the one hand, it has made evident the fundamental divide between the knowledge class and the no-knowledge class. All of us that can work with computers, that can work basically with the digital age, have been affected, but not so much by the COVID. On the other hand, it is the people who actually do not work in these communications, the knowledge class that work, if you wish, with their bodies, with their uh, 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 hands that are needed, the essential workers, many of them are women. So you have, on the one hand, uh, the knowledge class that have been least affected by COVID. They may even have uh, gained uh, financially because they have not been spending money and they have not lost their jobs. But both women have been disproportionately affected because both uh, uh, many of them are essential workers, but also because they were precisely in the service industries that have been most affected by COVID and they lost their jobs. So throughout the world, we see that actually uh, the advantages that women have made in terms of uh, 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 wages and, 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 and uh, careers are again probably suffering and are going to suffer for uh, the foreseeable future. So what is the lesson, what it is that we must do uh, to make sure that uh, somehow out of COVID we get these lessons uh, uh, to make sure that somehow we can correct these imbalances? I think the, one of the first um, lessons from the COVID crisis is that it has made starkly obvious the inequalities in the world um, between countries, within countries, between genders, uh, between classes, between ethnic groups, religious communities. Uh, they were well known before, but they've been first accelerated, secondly accentuated, uh, and third made much more visible. Um, by the COVID crisis. So the, uh, well, the metaphor that's often used is that we're all in the same boat, the sense that the world is suffering from a 
from the same crisis that no one escapes, uh, there are no borders. Uh, and yet, if you use that analogy of a storm, that we're in a storm, first of all, the storm is hitting different countries at different times uh, and with different uh, force. Some are much, much more affected than others. Um, but also people are in, not in the same boat. They're clearly not in the same boat. They're in different boats. Uh, so some are in a huge lot, yacht or an ocean liner, whereas others are in a tiny craft or uh, hanging on to driftwood. So that analogy, I think, it, it enriches exactly what you were saying, that it's affecting right. different people. So there's a lot of thinking. We all know from history uh, that crises shape what happens, um, shape the, the path of history. Uh, and uh, it can shape it in negative ways. It can reinforce prejudices. It can reinforce class divides. Uh, uh, but it in positive directions. So that's where the idea of building back better, build back greener, build back fairer, um, all of these ideas uh, are very much in play. And I think it depends on all of you and all of us, whether people just simply try to go back to normal, accepting that they've lost 10 years or 20 years of progress, or whether there is a sincere, thoughtful, far-reaching effort to address the problems of inequality uh, that have been revealed by the COVID crisis. But of course, the problem is that on the one hand, it's actually the paradox. We are ever more aware of interdependence. COVID has made clear that indeed we are not only in it together, but there can be real no borders because the virus does not respect any border. And yet the reaction usually has been the Nietzsche reaction to close borders, to think of it in terms of our nation, our, and uh, we see it with the vaccines and how the uh, wealthiest countries have basically hoarded uh, until now the vaccines. They have already bought all of them. And uh, so the question is, how, what can we do to develop a kind of a global system of response to this global crisis, which uh, takes more into account the fact that um, uh, there should be a little more fairness and equity in solving these solutions for everybody, not just for the wealthiest nations or for the most uh, uh, educated classes. Well, I wouldn't put up with a little more. I think there needs to be a lot more. <laughs> and uh, again, I think it does come back to the ways in which religious leadership, and I'm using that term broadly, can help people to translate a general goodwill, uh, desire to work together into something much more practical. Um, the vaccine example is a stark example right now where people are talking about vaccine nationalism. Uh, and it does reflect a very human tendency to take care of oneself and one's, one's um, people close to you uh, first and then to look to the rest of the world. So uh, that doesn't, I don't think that that's something we can ignore, nor is it something that will be easily overcome. But there are also extensive and, and very creative efforts, first of all, to bring it to people's attention. Uh, the head of the World Health Organization calls this vaccine nationalism and the inequities a moral catastrophe. And other leaders, religious and non-religious, have come together to say that. Uh, but perhaps even more important, uh, there are, uh, with COVAX and with other efforts, there are genuine efforts to correct the balance quickly. Um, and it is using, as usual, the tactic of fear. So telling people, look, if, if people in across the world do not have the vaccine, we aren't going to be out of the crisis, but also they're altruistic, they're better angels, uh, so that they have some better appreciation that this is, this is uh, not something that's um, 
an, something nice to do, but that is something that's absolutely critical to our common welfare, to the common good. Besides your own World Faiths uh, uh, Development Dialogue, you also serve as Vice President of the G20 Interfaith Association. You've also worked on interfaith uh, relations, organizations dialogue for many, many years. Uh, in moments like that, uh, uh, all the work that has been done, how can be put to good use? Tell us about the next G20 and what are you preparing and how is this interfaith uh, association precisely contributing to uh, uh, raise issues, to look for solutions? What is being done? Well, you mentioned in the beginning that the effort in 1998-99 was something very new um, to bring together in dialogue, but also common action, uh, the best of religion and the best of development, but also to deal with the, with the challenges and the problems. Um, the G20 Interfaith Forum is a very interesting, relatively new effort, though um, ever since the G7 and the G8 uh, developed, there have been efforts to do something that we all talk about, which is to have the religious voices at. And we often say, if you're not at the table, you end up at the menu. So then you have to ask which tables. So there are discussions within the United Nations, within UNICEF, within World Food Program, within the refugee organization, uh, et cetera, to answer the question of where should religious actors um, be as part of, of the discussion. Uh, the G20 interfaith is, uh, the G20 itself was born out of crisis management. It was born in uh, 2008 uh, and with the financial crisis. Uh, and it has developed since it's um it's a smaller group than the United Nations, clearly. It's 20, but there are always a few other actors who are involved. Uh, it's potentially much more nimble than it doesn't have procedures. It doesn't have even a secretariat, permanent secretariat. And the leadership of the G20 moves from country to country uh, so that this year, um, the host and therefore setting the agenda is Italy. Uh, last year, it was Saudi Arabia, the year before Japan, the year before Argentina. And next year, it will be Indonesia uh, and India the year afterwards. So it is the host country that sets the agenda. And the objective of the, Glo the G20 interfaith has been not only to say, to move your elbows and say, we need to seat at the table because we're important and you should pay attention, but to come with specific ideas and specific proposals uh, that respond to the agenda of the G20 leaders, uh, but that also represent what religious actors care about. So one of the latter issues is clearly the question of religious freedom or freedom of religion or belief. Uh, but then you have to say, well, what do you want the G20 leaders to do? Um, last year and this year, inevitably, the COVID crisis is the central part of the agenda. And so the recommendations last year, which in the meeting that took place in October, focused very much on the COVID response in a couple of ways, one of them was pointing out that the vaccine issue will not be addressed, will not be resolved without engagement of religious communities, both positively, but also to deal with hesitation and misinformation, which we can come back to if, if you wish. But also, 1.6 billion children have been out of school, and many of them are still out of school. Uh, and again, religious actors play major roles in education, uh, but they also can do, and comes back to what we were talking about before, having um, more of a sense of the purpose of education and dealing with issues of quality and issues of how can education systems deal with the polarization that the world faces. 
how can they help in building the kinds of trust and social cohesion that are so critical for successful societies. So the G20 is a part of the very complicated, shifting uh, set of multilateral institutions, global institutions. It has a very special role, and that's why I've been putting a lot of effort into trying to build the the religious, the interreligious part of the G20 um, forum so that it is a major partner along with, by the way, the uh, W20, which is women, the T20 think tanks, B20, uh, which is um, business uh, and so forth. Now, this year is in Italy. Italy, of course, is the home of the Pope. This Pope has been very articulate in elaborating on all kinds of crucial global issues. Uh, Fratelli Tutti basically is an attempt to reflect morally, but also practically what is to be done mm -hmm. on the pandemic and how to it affects all issues of uh, global governance, of global uh, fairness, justice, the environment, inequality, etc. Uh, do you expect uh, that the Catholic Church will be very, very uh, much involved in the G20 meeting in, in Italy to a certain extent? Um, the Catholic Church is very deeply involved and has been for some years, but it will be particularly this year in the G20 Interfaith Forum. Uh, it will be held in Bologna, uh, and one of the partners is Cardinal Supi, uh, who uh, is, is very much involved with a number of uh, institutions, but clearly senior leaders of the Vatican, perhaps even the most senior, uh, we hope will participate. Uh, and uh, you, you were referring to the Vatican Commission um, that was established almost a year ago, that is doing some of the most interesting analytic work uh, on the COVID crisis, including some issues that are very much on the G20 agenda, which is debt restructuring, both the processes and immediate action, uh, dealing with the idea of, um, of the SDR uh, to try to make far more resources available to poor countries. But it's looking at universal basic income proposals, looking at food issues, uh, the fact that some people refer to COVID as opposed to COVID, meaning hunger, which is one of the horrible side effects of, of the shutdowns that have been necessary to try to contain um, the, um, uh, the COVID pandemic. So the, uh, the uh, involvement and the cooperation uh, with all uh, in all religious communities, but obviously with Italy, um, the, the Vatican will be especially involved. And I want to mention one other issue. This year, the G20 agenda set by Italy is peace, planet, prosperity. So, sorry, people, planet, prosperity. Um, so the, the people... CP, okay. Is it well? P, they, yeah, they, that was last year, um, okay. and it is one of five P's. The two that are not on the agenda this year are peace and partnership. Uh, okay. But they will implicitly be there. But the um, the idea is to focus very much on education and health, and that's um, and and for the uh, G twenty interfaith, it's healing. Uh, but uh, it is also planet. And that's the point I'm making here, that the with the COP26 um, in Glasgow, it is the UK and Italy that are the key partners on bringing, in many ways, post-COVID, uh, a very practical and demanding agenda for environmental protection dealing with climate change back onto the agenda. And of course, the complexity is that everything is related to everything else. So planet is related to COVID, COVID is related to planet, is related to education, is related to conflict and peace, and so forth. And of course, you use the word healing, which in most languages serve for both, for health and for salvation. Salus in Latin means both salvation and health. And obviously, they are very much interrelated. Uh, I assume that there is competition 
uh, among the religions when it comes to precisely uh, who is the best healer. On the other hand, or who brings more salvation, on the other hand, I assume they can work better together, more fruitfully, when they can, on the practical level of what is to be done together for the common good of humanity. So I assume that also this involvement of uh, the faiths in the development field is one of the most fruitful ways of advancing interreligious dialogue and cooperation. That's right. Yeah, and one of the things that we've been monitoring in the in the COVID crisis uh, has been the ways in which religious communities have responded. And we referred earlier to some of gathering um, of funerals, of celebration of marriage, um, even of pastoral care of people who are traumatized with so many problems of mental health that we're facing. So a lot of practices have changed. Uh, the digital issue is, is one. But perhaps even more important is the ways in which religious communities have responded in communities all over the world to help people who are homeless, people who are evicted, people who are hungry, people who've lost their jobs, children who are suffering, uh, child abuse, domestic abuse. So that is uh, one of the main areas we're tracking. And it's interesting that it's, it's something I don't think we will ever know fully what the response of religious communities has been, even looking, for example, at the Washington uh, DC area. I'm sure it's true in uh, um, uh, Ukraine as well, that there are just countless efforts of soup kitchens, of personal, um, personal outreach and care. And the Religions for Peace, which is a major global interreligious organization, has made a, um, has a special fund to encourage interfaith cooperation. Uh, I often think that cooperation between religious and secular is more difficult than interreligious cooperation, uh, that um, the language may be more different, uh, there may be a greater history of tensions. But it is this, this issue of partnership, of finding ways to break down the silos, is part of what I think we also know is one of the critical issues we all face, which is polarization and the levels of, of anger and fear that are driving some of the tensions uh, in the world. I would like to encourage all the, uh, the audience, if you have any question for Catherine, please write it down in the chat and so that uh, you have the opportunity also to raise whichever issue you want to raise. Now let's talk about uh, the role of our center or the work you do in uh, uh, the Berkeley Center, you've worked in many, many countries around the world. Uh, just give us some idea of the kind of work you do precisely at the level of linking the knowledge from the university, uh, grassroots level of organization, gathering information, the basic information. So what it is that, that you are centered this precisely at this level? Well, uh, one of the um, issues that we're grappling with is what we call faith literacy, uh, which is that many people who are in decision-making positions really know very little about religious work, um, and they may not even know very much about their own tradition that they were raised in, but when it comes to others, there are many gaps and many misunderstandings. But you could also say the same in many religious institutions that their development literacy is not very high. So a lot of what we do is, is essentially communication. And that means finding examples, which are not only good, but also bad examples, uh, and working on that. Um, we also are dealing, and this seems to be a theme, uh, with a lot of misunderstandings. So I, for example, find talking about religion too broad um, because there are so many very, very different traditions that when you say religion or even people of faith, I think that it can be very distorting, um, particularly when the implication is negative, as in uh, women, that religi religion does not 
support women's equality, for example, I think is a misnomer. It's not true. Uh, but we also, first of all, do some very practical projects, and I'll come back to that. But we also are very convinced that the situations of different countries and communities vary widely, and that if you do not have a country-focused or community-focused approach, uh, you live at the level of generalities, 30,000 feet, um, where you, you, you can talk about common good or whatever, but it doesn't translate into a school curriculum or into reaching most vulnerable communities uh, with health care uh, or dealing with land tenure issues that are preventing agricultural development or water supply or sanitation, uh, which is one of the worst performing of the um, global development goals. So we've done for 10 countries a review where we look at the development agenda uh, and we look at the religious agenda. Uh, and then see where they mesh and where they don't mesh. And I think we've even had a conversation, Jose, about the possibility of doing something like this for Ukraine, uh, but have not uh, so far at least uh, been able to move beyond that. We also uh, have worked a lot on um, projects. Um, so we're working in Senegal and Guinea, for example, uh, on family welfare which means partly family planning, but it's shifted. The focus has shifted to COVID uh, because that is the, the issue right now. Uh, in Southeast Asia, um, we're working on translating, on linking um, the freedom of religion or belief with peace building uh, because so many of the conflicts have both a religious as well as an ethnic and a class dimension to them. Um, in um, South Asia, the project we're working on that I was on a meeting uh, this morning is COVID related, and it is specifically dealing with communication. It's an European Union finance project that is trying to craft and to communicate positive and informative scientifically based messages about COVID, but also to follow and to respond to some of the misinformation, which may be, which may be unintentional, but which may also be intentional, designed to fuel tension among groups. I mean, you mentioned Ukraine. Usually, most of the work you've done is on the global south, but the issues of development in post-Soviet societies are unique. They are different. They are different from those in the global south, but they are also very serious problems of the health system, uh, different types of inequalities, different types also of misinformation, misunderstandings. Um, from uh, the little you know, uh, or from your uh, visits, which aspects of integral human development are, you think, most critical or most needed, let's say, if you look at post-Soviet societies? You've um, meant you also work on issues of corruption, for instance. You work in the very much on issues of corruption. So uh, well, the first just comment, some reflections for Ukraine. The first comment is that some time ago, maybe seven or eight decades ago, it was reasonable to think of the world as divided into two parts, the rich and the poor. That simply is not true. And so many organizations are trying not to use the word developing. And I find often the global South is quite distorted because the world is a much more complex place. Um, you're totally right that from 1989, 1990, when um, the former Soviet Union countries uh, came much more into the development sphere with the creation of the um, European Development Bank, for example, but also major programs. It was a whole new category of transition economies. Um, and I think one of the, uh, there, there are various issues that have been very important. One of them uh, clearly is thinking about the role of the private sector and of entrepreneurship um, as, a, as, a major, uh, as a major issue. Um, the issue of corruption uh, is, um, 
is not confined to any group of countries. Uh, and one of the frustrations that I have in an area that I've been working on is that in the major global integrity alliances, and I'd put Transparency International as a, a very dynamic and important uh, civil society organization, there has been very, very little religious participation, um, particularly at the global level, um, there has been in some countries. Um, and there's a good reason for that, which is that if you treat corruption purely as an as a moral issue of people's failings, uh, you can't really deal with a with the problem, which is an institutional structural problem. But there's now a recognition that without dealing with those complex ethical issues, uh, which inevitably involves the religious traditions uh, as well as non-religious, uh, it's very difficult to see a path forward. Uh, but clearly the issue of corruption, which is, as I said, um, sadly a universal one, is a major obstacle to development programs. Uh, it erodes trust and it wastes resources and it blocks the kinds of progress that we know is possible. Um, and I come back to the, the point I said before that we have a very different situation where we have, we know that it is possible for every person who's born to have the opportunity for a decent life, which was never true in the past, where large percentages of people lived their lives never moving from where they were and with almost no opportunity, almost in servitude or slavery. But the chance today to see the transformation of societies is real. And at least in my view, it puts a common responsibility to make that ideal, that possibility a reality. Um, again, I want to encourage anybody, we have five more minutes. If you want to raise uh, um, any question, um, let me um, basically, uh, let's go back to the question of uh, education uh, and what our institutions can do precisely in all these kind of uh, issues. Uh, on the one hand, also, it has been one of the most affected uh, uh, areas, children again, but also young people, young people that need particularly to be together for uh, their own development. So uh, to a certain extent, to we, can we rely on, what are the lessons? Can we rely on digital communication for integral human development, for real education, or do we still need ultimately a uh, uh, human being together uh, uh, real uh, uh, bodily relationships that basically make so tangible the fact that we are related and we are interdependent and not only mediated through media. I think most um, observers and most participants actually would say that things will never go back to exactly the way they were before the COVID crisis. If, if it had lasted three weeks, we might have talked about simply returning to normal, but it's clear that negatively, but also positively, there's, there's a major transformation, transformation, a disruption. And I think that the digital um, has negative, but also positive sides. It makes this kind of an encounter that we're having possible. So I think the the sense that that we need to learn from the positives as well as the negatives from the COVID crisis uh, is important. One of the most interesting uh, parts aspects of the um, G20 uh, interfaith uh, forum working is focusing on education. Uh, and it is working to bring some of the best experience that will be both global, both cross boundary, but also very local uh, in giving teachers more equipment to deal with some of the less mechanical parts of education, the social cohesion, the civic values, uh, the understandings of others 
religions, the uh, basic religious literacy. Um, so that that um, exercise is doing some very interesting work. But there is, um, it is striking that there are some very different discourses um, within the the international development world. If people ask, "What is the priority? What it, what is your absolute priority?" A very common answer will be education first, education second, and education third, with a sense that no society can really be successful, however you're defining it, without quality education. Quality is actually a very important term because there are major concerns about the poor quality of education and learning in many parts of the world. But in religious communities, you often sense an unease with this where people are more concerned with the values that education is transmitting than with numeracy uh, and with, um, with knowledge. So I think my sense, which I'm not, it goes beyond your question, is that there is a need for a dialogue which takes these quite different perspectives into account as we look to rebuild education systems in the future. Well, I, I'm very glad that we can communicate digitally, but I certainly miss going down the hall and seeing your office open and just <laughs> coming in and just sitting and just talking about all kinds of things. Um, uh, thank you so much. It has been great uh, 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 having you, Catherine. Uh, is there anybody that would like to raise the final question? Well, then, if not, uh, uh, again, um, you have the last word, Catherine. Well, thank you very much. I wish I could be with you, Jose, but also uh, with all of you who are listening. It's a very disembodied experience not to even see your faces on the screen. I've been <laughs> following part of the conference and finding it extremely interesting and look forward. Uh, I was teaching this morning, uh, so I missed some things to listening to it, to the recordings. So thank you so much and hope to see you in person as soon as possible. Well, and tomorrow we'll see Catherine again and me. We will be at the at the panel at uh, Georgetown together with Kim Daniels and David Hollenbach, the, again, continuing this conversation. So thank you so much to everybody and until next time. Um, yes. Dear friends, our esteemed virtual audience, I sincerely hope that you uh, enjoyed this interview as much as I did. Uh, thank you very much, uh, both Professor Marshall, Professor Casanova, for this fascinating uh, discussion and for the very, very rich um, takeaways from this deliberation. Um, it was a great honor to have, you know, such well-known experts in this field together with us today. Thank you so much. Um, thank you exciting and full of new reflections. The third day of the conference Integral uh, Human Development in the Digital Age is gradually coming to its end, but please do not uh, rush to leave us because we still have a very unique event um, scheduled in our program for today. And that is Lviv Lab format, Escape from Beijing, human rights and self-determination in the matrix of localism, nationalism, and globalism. So continuing um, the good tradition of the second day of the conference, Lviv LED format will be moderated by Joe Lindsay, uh, founder uh, of Lviv Lab uh, for uh, the activation of democracy, former protege to Fox News founder Roger um, Ellis, discussion what could our alternative vision be so we will come back to you at washington uh, time 2 p.m rome time 8 p.m and kiev time 9 p.m see you soon dear friends thank you
Пам'ятаємо, що зараз ковід, так? Правильно. Обнімань немає, є лише листки, листки жести. виправдав і перевершив всі мої очікування. Я коли вступала, я дуже сумнівалася. Мене мама казала, що ти робиш? Ти йдеш з державного університету, де тобі дадуть точно класний диплом, крутий. Я казала, мама, я знаю, що я роблю. Тому що я йшла за класною атмосферою, враженнями, новими, цікавими людьми і знайомствами і крутою, крутою системою освіти. Взагалі складно визначити найбільш цікавий предмет, але те, що він був найбільш викликаючий, це публічні комунікації. Це про те, як треба говорити, як треба сказати, про те, як треба постійно вчитися і працювати над собою. Це було дуже, дуже цікаво випробувати себе в різних ситуаціях. Найкорисніший предмет для мене це стало юридичне письмо про те, як писати коротко, зрозуміло, чітко і ясно, думати про того, кому ти пишеш. І я зараз, напевно, найбільше ним користуюся в роботі. Е, в майбутньому точно допоможе, тому що нам давали не тільки хард-скіли про те, що таке право, про, те, про різні галузі права, про ЄСПЛ. Ми дізнавалися, розширювали свій світогляд і вчилися софт-скілів. Зокрема, про те, як говорити і писати, а це взагалі просто потрібно. На своїй програмі, можливо, єдине, що було таким невеликою проблемою для нас під час навчання, це те, що у нас завжди мінялися пари, в нас був дуже гнучкий графік, от, і під нього треба було дуже гнучко підлаштовуватися. А взагалі мені все подобається. Така тема, яку я писала, це просто вона приводила в шок всіх, коли я говорила. Я писала про штучний інтелект, про правову регламентацію штучного інтелекту. І ніколи, напевно, навіть не знала, що це таке, якби не потрапила в оку. Мій курс і уявлення про право взагалі кардинально змінилися і розвернулися з них на голову. Це було викликом для мене таку тему обрати для мого нахового керівника і, напевно, для всіх, хто слухав мене на захисті. У нас є е, юридична клініка в школі права. І завдяки пані Христині Ковсні, її менеджерці, юристи створили гру, комп'ютерну гру про фінансову грамотність і, і настільну гру. І нам завжди будь-які наші ідеї дозволяли і допомагали реалізувати. Нас семеро аж поїхало в Нідерланди навчатися в Роттердам по програмі Erasmus+. Ми цілий семестр там були, вивчали предмети, які ми самі обирали, і писали паралельно магістерську роботу, і нам дуже-дуже сподобалось. Е, напевно, я побажала і майбутнім студентам, і, і викладачам, які тут, продовжувати надихати один одного, мотивувати один одного, е, працювати, відкривати якісь нові можливості, е, рухатися в тому ж напрямку, якому на, насправді тут всі рухаються. Але єдине таке найбільше побажання – не забувати відпочивати. Тому що за дедлайнами ми іноді це забуваємо. Протягом чотирьох років ми набираємо найкращих студентів в Україні. Кожного року наші студенти мають найвищий середній бал зі всіх предметів серед всіх вступників по комп'ютерних науках в Україні. Талановита дослідниця Соломія Леню мала можливість обирати свою майбутню альма-матер з-поміж кількох найкращих університетів світу. В першу чергу, як мені допомагає університет, то це саме дає цю базу математики, базу програмування. Разом з командою студентів факультету прикладних наук Соломія здобула друге місце на міжнародних змаганнях Microsoft у Варшаві. Якщо в ОКУ займатися тільки академічною діяльністю, то тоді може стати трішки скучно. Нас не перенавантажують тут не потрібними знаннями, і, відповідно, це залишає в нас місце в голові і в часі, в нашому розпорядку для того, щоб вивчати щось інше. Наш диригент, пані Олена, вона завжди каже, що ми, тобто співці, ми є проповідники, ми цим маємо доносити Слово Боже до людей. Студентський хор став окрасою святкувань у Філадельфії, де церква піднесла владику Бориса до митрополичого служіння. Чотири тридцять три випускники бакалаврських та магістерських програм склали свій останній іспит. Участь в урочистостях взяв митрополит філадельфійський Борис Гудзяк. 
до університету я буду, очевидно, далі приїжджати, але він стоїть, він стабільний, він розвивається, і я можу просто сказати, він переростає мене і моє. Раніше нагороду університету Нотр-Дам одержували президент США Джиммі Картер, свята мати Тереза з Калькутти, засновник спільноти Ларш Ковчек Жан Ваньє. Цього року нагороди удостоєний президент УКУ Борис Гудзяк. Осередком багатьох студентських ініціатив є студентський уряд. Уряд студентів нашого університету виявив ініціативу, яка була підтримана дев'ятьма іншими університетами з різних куточків нашої країни щодо програми студентського обміну. У нас трохи інше самоврядування, ніж в інших університетів. У нас воно таке більш креативне, бо в нас такі базові потреби забезпечені повністю. Нам нема потреби ходити і бігати, там, домовлятися за пралки чи за я не знаю, там, аудиторії, щоб були чисті. І для того, щоб бути активними, ми придумаємо щось, щось інше. За останні п'ять років Кількість студентських організацій зросла вдвічі. Сьогодні їх 16. Ми маємо на меті активізувати власне, музичне життя спільноти УКУ. Збір коштів для онкохворих людей через соціальні ініціативи. Ми допомагаємо бабусям і дідусям, які мешкають в будинках престарілих. Кожного разу ми складаємо нові оригінальні питання, беремо інформацію з різних книг, з фільмів. Розвиваємо спортивну культуру університету. А також займаємося з малозабезпеченими дітьми у світлиці. До університету вступають щораз то більше студентів зі Сходу та Півдня України. Будівництво нового колегіуму є відповіддю на зростаючу потребу житла для студентів. Сподіваємося, що новий корпус колегіуму імені патріарха Йосипа слугуватиме багатьом поколінням українців як місце здобування знання і мудрості та буде пам'яткою нашої церкви на славу Божу та добра Христової церкви українського народу. Вже у вересні 2020 року в новому колегіумі житимуть близько 300 студентів з різних куточків країни. Я дуже люблю наше крило через те, що в нас дуже душевне якось завжди виходить. Найцікавіше – це дивитися на людей, які, які зі Сходу, і вони знають літературну українську мову, яку вони вивчали в школі. І тут вони приїжджають до нас і чують такі слова, як «бульба», і вони такі, якою мовою ви розмовляєте. Починається дружба, починається таке будування нації. Для Олега Рязанова УКУ став четвертим університетом. Вади слуху не дозволили йому надовше затриматися у попередніх. Можна дуже багато разів переконувати людину з інвалідністю, що вона нічим не відрізняється від решти, але треба бути свідомим ось того, що я можу все, але дещо я роблю інакше. Я запросив його на каву піти поговорити. Ми говорили, як він вступив. Звичайно, знайомство з першокурсником. Вже допиваючи каву, він мене просить, каже, Михайло, говори голосніше. Я просто на одне вухо не чую. Друзі, одногрупники організували цілу кампанію зі збору коштів на новий слуховий апарат для Олега. Я був дуже вражений. Ну, напевно, це... Це дуже важливий момент, коли цінності в певному середовищі спрацьовують у такий спосіб. Три фундації УКУ діють в Америці, Канаді та Великій Британії. І ще 21 комітет у шести країнах світу. Ця мережа підтримки Українського католицького університету постійно зростає. Цього року вперше бенкет на підтримку університету відбувся в Австралії. Дай 
Боже, дай Боже, щоб ми мали ту сильну громаду. Ми її маємо тут. Тому good luck. Thank you. УКУ – це глобальний університет. Свого часу патріарх Йосиф Сліпий створив велику мережу філій університету у шести країнах світу. Український інститут у Лондоні є однією з цих філій. Ukrainian Institute London is a window into Ukraine in the UK. It consolidates the community, but it goes well beyond that and forges partnerships with leading British institutions. It serves as a platform for debate and engages most influential speakers. And it's very clear to me that uh, it can be very hard for Ukraine to find a voice for itself in the world, to overcome existing stereotypes and develop its own narrative. And that's why the work of the Ukrainian Institute London is so important. Випускниця магістерської програми з прав людини Христина Деркач залишає свою працю в успішній юридичній агенції і йде працювати у зону війни. Тут вона допомагає людям без документів повернути свої громадянські права. Для людини відсутність документів означає те, що її життєвий шлях ламається. Ламається навіть частково не через неї, а через конфлікт, який стався. Крім того, що ти юрист, ти і психолог, і мама, і хто тільки хоче для цієї людини. Тобто ти насправді остання надія цієї людини для того, щоб їй допомогти. Маркіян Прохасько мріяв написати книжку про Антарктиду. І ось мрія стає реальністю. В УКУ у нас була ця постійна практика, і вона дуже допомагає в житті будь-де. І це теж допомогло мені здійснити цю мрію, тому що мати ідею, вміти її висловити, обґрунтувати, пояснити. І це начебто не випливає з історичної освіти, але це випливає з історичної освіти в УКУ. Випускник програми «Історія» Павло Бакунець у 2015 році став мером Яворова на Львівщині. А вже через три роки краяни довірили йому представляти їхні інтереси у Верховній Раді України. Одне з основних правил життя в УКУ для студента було – ти повинен зробити все сам, не можна домовитись і не можна давати хабарів. Це мені допомогло як міському голові Яворова. Люди повірили в це і побачили, як це працює на практиці. Депутатами Верховної Ради України 9-го скликання стали ще шість випускників Українського католицького університету. Добро – це безкорисливо ділитися тим, чим ти можеш поділитися. Добро – це розуміти, тримати руку на пульсі і не зупинятися, як би важко тобі не було. У нас є певний перелік магазинів, які складають такий умовний маршрут. Кожного дня відповідальна особа з того чи іншого магазину відписує про готовність передати нам їжу. У випадку того, коли магазин готовий нам передати їжу, так, він відписує в чатику. І відповідно, наш координатор бачить, що в такій локації такий магазин може передати їжу. Наприклад, до 13.00 ми збираємо повний перелік всіх магазинів, які згідні нам передати їжу. Після того формується маршрут, і вже волонтер, який виходить на маршрут, він знає конкретно, в якій локації йому треба заїхати, щоб зібрати продукти. В Україні є дуже багато різноманітних проблем. Значна частина нашого населення проживає за межею бідності. З другого боку, українці входять в десятку країн, які викидують або продукують найбільше сміття в світі. 
Значну частину того сміття, власне, складає органічна продукція, так? І значну частину тої органічної продукції складають продукти харчування, які би можна було врятувати. Власне, тарілка є таким універсальним інструментом, який одночасно мінімізує от таких дві проблеми. Тобто ми, рятуючи продукти від потрапляння на смітник в межах терміну придатності, передаємо їх малозабезпеченим особам. Добрий день. Ми від тарілки по продуктах. Добре. Ви до нас, як ми вас чекали, чекали. Ми є унікальним таким проєктом, тому що ми виконуємо одночасно і еко, і соціальну функцію. І, власне, от в, такому, в такому ідеальному симбіозі так, от тарілка продовжує функціонувати станом на зараз. Практика продовольчих банків вона є загальносвітовою. І в різних країнах Європи і Америки і такий інструмент, як продовольчий банк, він дуже дієвий і активно впроваджується. Ідея продовольчого створення продовольчого банку в Україні вона належить Ростиславу Косюрі. Це львів'янин, він народився тут у нас у Львові. До шести років він проживав тут в нас. Пізніше разом з батьками він був вимушений приїхати в Німеччину. Там проживав близько 20 років, і власне Німеччина є тою країною, в якій культура продовольчих банків дуже розвинута. І власне він після певного часу вирішив повернутися назад до Львова, побачив, що. Є проблема, так, яку можуть вирішити продовольчі банки, і чому б не спробувати. Так, ми стараємося зробити культуру продовольчого банку загальнонаціональною. Тому що уявіть собі, якщо б декілька тарілок було у Львові, якщо б в кожному обласному центрі була своя власна тарілка чи декілька тарілок, скільки їжі ми б могли врятувати і скільки людей, які перебувають потреби, ми б змогли нагодувати. Тому дуже важливо власне, бачення і розуміння тарілки як такого дуже-дуже хорошого інструменту, який може зробити дуже-дуже багато добра. Аня, можна я попрошу тебе, щоб ти забрала продукцію, а я просто тут буду з машиною, раптом би хтось приїжджав? Ясне туди. О, тако, а, там, а там є якісь овочі, фрукти? Нема нічого такого. Червона рибка. Добре. Я почула це від своєї знайомої з пласту, і це мав бути як мій пластовий додатковий проект для того, щоб перейти на інший ступінь в пласті. Але так сталося, що ступінь став мені неважливим, а організація вийшла на перше місце. І я вже давним-давно забула, що я хотіла робити тут, а зараз займаюся всім, чим тільки можна. В моїй сім'ї якась вийшло інше ставлення до продуктів. Я тепер завжди всіх контролюю, щоб вони часом чогось зайвого не купили. І е, всі якісь мої родичі і друзі також часто запитують про проекти. Так що е, в цьому залучена, можна сказати, що не тільки я, а й все моє оточення. У нас була дуже важка початкова комунікація з нашими сусідами, тобто за браком інформації, за браком розуміння діяльності продовольчого банку, вони ну, практично всі виступили проти відкриття тарілки ту саме тут. Нам довелося провести таку зустріч, зустріч знайомства з ними. Так? Ми запросили всіх таких активістів, так? розказали їм про проект. Відповідно, були запрошені представники міської влади, які пояснили, що Тарілка на цілком законних засадах користується тим приміщенням. Так? Також ми залучили представників духовенства, які могли більш з релігійної точки зору пояснити, так, що тарілка – це про добро. І, ну, як мінімум, так, релігія будь-яка вчить так, добром ділитися. І нічого поганого немає, що якісь молоді люди тут організовують власне, таке маленьке добро. 
І за результатами зустрічі ми отримали дуже позитивний фідбек. Тобто люди, які прийшли нас насварити, чим ми тут займаєтеся, що ви хочете тут зробити, в результаті стали нашими прихильниками. Є молоді сім'ї, з, власне, конкретно з того приміщення, які тут нам приходять, допомагають по ремонту, систематично передають якісь кошти. Тобто нам вдалося, власне, переламати отакий стереотип, тарілки тут на місці. Так? І я сподіваюся, що зовсім скоро весь мікрорайончик, де ми знаходимося, буде теж нашими або волонтерами, ну і швидше за все нашими відвідувачами. Так, ну ми сьогодні об'їхали сім магазинів, зібрали дуже багато класних паштетів, я бачу. Є сосиски дуже класні, є багато молочної продукції, є фактично цілий кошик овочів. Маємо навіть тут імбир, якщо бачите, є баклажани, огірки, помідори. От, частинка є хліба, різних паніні. От, ну і є різні солоності, картопля, тобто, в принципі, досить непоганий такий продуктовий кошик, якщо можна так сказати. Привіт, як справи? Чудово. Файно. Добрий день. Сергій. Аня. Е, відкривай багажник, будемо тебе заховувати. Кожного дня ми маємо іншого партнера, благодійника, який займається харчуванням малозабезпеченого осіб, кому ми передаємо нашу їжу. І відповідно обирається якась така точка зустрічі, де наш волонтер передає їжу представнику тої чи іншої організації. Вівторок друзі твої приїжджають. Потім. Чудово, то не дзвонили. Ти Києва. будеш теж на зустрічі чи ні? Я думаю, що так. Угу. Як, якщо треба, якби. Можуть бути присутні. Бо горять вони, я думаю, що вони зроблять класно, як Добре. буде в Києві. Потрібно буде їх вести, підтримувати якби словесно і координувати дії. Ну, ми залучили, там близько 7-8 місць зараз є на зв'язку, що, що хочуть розвивати. Ну, окей. Добре, все, щасливо. На зв'язку тобі. Є люди навіть, які кажуть, ми от живемо в Києві, але ми хочемо приїхати до вас, щоб зсередини подивитися, як воно виглядає. Я думаю, ми ближчим часом знову ж таки будемо мати таку зустріч, і я думаю, після того, як людина вийде з нами на маршрут, побачить, власне, от загориться тою ідеєю, то точно можна говорити про те, що ближчим часом в Києві буде теж своя тарілка. Зараз ми йдемо до багатодітної сім'ї такої, яка живе в досить таких складних умовах, і веземо їм продукти, оскільки вони зверталися і просили про допомогу. Завдяки такому проекту, як тарілка в супермаркеті, ми маємо змогу допомогти таким сім'ям. Це є, це є класно, це є добре. Це є е, надія навіть в мене, коли до мене дзвонять люди. Хтось дзвонить, треба цукор, хтось дзвонить, треба там ще щось. Я допомагаю людям, які вже 15 років не виходять з хати. Дай Боже здоров'я. І вам теж. Я не сам, я з друзями. Привіт. Заходьте. Що, уроки прямо тут робимо, так? Ще я ще зайнятий, передзвоню. Ви просто будете приїжджати і в один день забирати кульочки. Угу. Домовились? Домовились. І все. Це авокадо, напевно. Це буряк. Або буряк. Авокадо. <рес> <рес> я буду йти вже з друзями. Я радий було вас бачити. <рес> Будемо допомагати частіше. Вот, вот там лампочка така. Яка? Дивна. Вот така. Яка? Вот вот там. Наверху. Ну, і що? І там... Там світло є. Є світло. Люблю те дуже. Добре, ми тоді вже будемо йти потрішки, не будемо вам цей. На здоров'я. Це завдяки зусиллям багатьох людей ми можемо так якось робити щось на краще. Все, до побачення. Все, щасливо. Щасливо.
функціонування тарілки, воно теж є і показником, можливо, ну, не, можливо, не зовсім зрілості, так, але хоча б формування такого громадянського суспільства і показником того, що вже почало все рухатися в нас якось правильному напрямку. Важливо зрозуміти, що не всі е, ми потрапляємо з народження в рівні умови. Е, дуже часто люди потрапляють в ту чи іншу життєву ситуацію через різні обставини. Так? Не всім щось в житті вдається, так? але потрібно завжди залишатися людиною. Е, це зовсім не важко, якщо в тебе є можливість комусь допомогти, поділитися своїм часом, маленькими ресурсами і зробити добро. Людина, якій ти допоможеш, Візьме з тебе приклад і почне допомагати іншим. І таким чином ми створимо таку, знову ж таки, піраміду добра, яка зможе допомогти великій кількості людей. Melanie from Ukraine, one second. One moment, y'all.
Uh, do we have Melanie P Podolak? All right. I'll be back in 20 seconds and we'll get started. All right, everyone, Dobry Vetcher to uh, those in Ukraine. Uh, good afternoon and good morning to uh, to the Americans. And uh, uh, good night, probably, to some people listening uh, far and from the Far East. Um, we have um, uh, one little thing we're adding tonight, and that's why it took us a second to get started. And uh, hopefully that goes smoothly. A bit of breaking news, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, but uh, I want to welcome everyone to, to this evening's Lviv Lab format of the 2021 Integral Human Development Conference. My name is Joe Lindsley, uh, and I guess as most of you know now, I'm an American who initially got stuck here. I came here for the conference a year ago, and uh, I'm still here and uh, happy to be in Ukraine and working with a great group of people, especially with the folks at the Ukrainian Catholic University. Uh, I first heard about the university watching an advertisement uh, for my alma mater, Notre Dame, a few years ago during a football game. And uh, so it's great, it's great to be here now to, to be part of this uh, uh, educational ecosystem. Uh, this conference is produced by the Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv and co-hosted by inst uh, institutions and institutes at Georgetown University in Washington, Notre Dame in South Bend, and the Angelicum in Rome. Today, on the third conference day, uh, there, really every panel throughout the day has focused on human rights. Uh, and most of the discussion today was looking at human rights in, in light of the pandemic. Uh, for example, there were student debates today, uh, Oxford-style debates on the, um, the goodness and the wisdom of lockdowns. Uh, and we also have discussed, uh, you know, how the pandemic has affected uh, those in impoverished nations and and sort of uh, human rights in, in, in light of in light of this pandemic. Now, for this discussion tonight, we're going to sort of step back from the pandemic proper, although it's going certainly to to feature into the conversation. Um, we're step outside the, uh, of COVID. But we are going to look to the country where it seems that, that where the virus began and where uh, with that initial extremely strict lockdown in Wuhan provided a blueprint, um, provided a blueprint for uh, the, how the lockdowns would uh, would work uh, throughout the world. And we um, and sorry, our special guest is I, I need to help our special guest. So give me one. Okay, I'm back, and I'll explain why I had to do that in a second. Um, but uh, so we are uh, we're stepping back, and we're, we're looking at uh, uh, specifically at China and uh, uh, the global influence of China and uh, how China's influence affects human rights and, and self determination. Uh, in in uh, maybe about April of this year, the Secretary General uh, of NATO. Uh, Warned, he said, some allies of NATO are more vulnerable for situations where critical infrastructure can be sold out during this time of the pandemic. Uh, he didn't mention China. He didn't mention Ukraine. He did not mention countries of Eastern Europe, but it was widely considered that is what he was talking about. Uh, here in the ground in Ukraine, we, we've certainly seen uh, you know, increased investments from, from, from certain sectors, including from China. So it's one thing we're going to explore today. Um, is you know what 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 is the mission and purpose of of of, of the Beijing government uh, and how does that affect you know should it affect us and, and should we care about it uh, so in order to have that discussion we've assembled um, I think a, a fantastic panel uh, we are going to um, uh, after our special guest we're going to start with uh, uh, three amazing individuals from Hong Kong uh, they uh, uh, led by six Bajio, uh, Bajio uh, was duly elected by the people in his district of Hong Kong to serve in the in the LegCo, the Legislative Council, uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, our assistant here, Karen from from Georgetown, uh, from the School of Foreign Service, Karen Samby, will, will, she will she will as I talk, she will share uh, some links in the chat, so you guys can can look at these later or take a look at them now. 
But Baggio, when he entered the, the, the alleged code to take his oath of office, um, he was refused uh, his seat. And uh, he, it is said that he mispronounced the name of China and insulted uh, the Beijing regime. And uh, he was refused his seat. Uh, that got him into a lot of trouble. Uh, five years later, he ended up in jail. And, uh, and, and then somehow, quite luckily, and we're going we're gonna to hear the story of his escape uh, last December, uh, from from Hong Kong to the United States. Uh, we're also joined by his colleagues, Daniel Wong in Washington and Simon Chang in London. Simon also suffered much abuse at the hands of uh, the Beijing regime in Hong Kong, but he was able to flee to London and Daniel Wong is in Washington. They are the co-founders of the Hong Kong Shadow Parliament Initiative. Then we will hear from Alexandra Gazala Tirzu, uh, a friend of mine for, for some years, and she's a uh, head of research at the Singularity Group and senior non-resident fellow at the Atlantic Council. Uh, she's got her master's in philosophy and her, uh, and, and her doctorate from the University of Oxford. And uh, she will discuss China's ideological influence in Africa. She's the author of Africa and China, How Africans and Their Governments Are Shaping Relations with China. Uh, and we will hear from Arthur Karitonov, the Ukrainian founder of the Free Hong Kong Center. Uh, and he will help us uh, analyze current Chinese campaigns in Europe. The reason why I'm introducing everyone now is because uh, I, the, the panelists have been welcomed to, as I interviewed the guests, to jump in if they have any pertinent questions. Uh, we were going to be joined this evening by, uh, by Drew Pavlov, who is uh, in, in, in Brisbane, and he's an Australian human rights activist. Uh, and a former student senator at the University of Queensland. Last summer, uh, he began to, um, when, uh, I'm sorry, in the summer of, uh, of 2019, uh, before the, 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 the coronavirus crisis, uh, the people of Hong Kong were uh, making great moves to, to, to push away from Beijing. And uh, Drew led student protests uh, at the University of Queensland. And this amazing story uh, has, has sort of been developing that on, at Australian universities, there's not free speech, and uh, if you speak out against uh, China, you can you can get into trouble. Uh, we wanted to hear from Drew tonight, uh, but he has been facing a lot of difficulties. He's in legal battles. Uh, they kicked him out of his university, and uh, and so uh, I talked to him today, and he's facing exhaustion, and especially in this time of the virus, we got to keep our health up. So we will have to arrange a, a conversation with him at a later date. Uh, but I wanted to mention him, and I want you all to be aware of him. Uh, you can follow us, uh, Lviv Lab, on Facebook, and we'll announce any future events like that. Um, and now I can ask, uh, M Melanie, have you joined us? Yes, as a matter of fact, I have. Melanie, welcome. Um, and now I will, I will introduce you. We, we are going to begin uh, with, with, with a, a, a small um, uh, side, side uh, discuss, brief side discussion here, no more than five minutes, but very relevant uh, to the matter of human rights. Uh, in, uh, on Tuesday, I think it was Tuesday night here in Lviv, there were thousands of, of protesters uh, on the main square, just a few blocks from, from where I am right now. And they were protesting the, uh, the, uh, the, a prison sentence that had just been handed down that day to uh, uh, um, uh, an activist in, in, um, in Odessa. Uh, and, uh, I, and we will, anyone will correct me on my pronunciations, but uh, uh, Sergei Starnenko. And uh, he was sentenced to seven years. And, uh, and it, it, the case seems to be sort of, that he had everything against him from the from the authorities and and other figures in Odessa uh, simply for 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 his uh, free speech on his popular YouTube channel where he's got two hundred thousand followers um, and uh, and so we wanted to get the scoop on on why he's in jail and what's going on and why the past week there have been protests uh, little mini you know mini maidans uh, uh, throughout throughout this country and uh, so. To get the scoop on that, and I think I, I love the fact that we're going to hear this story because he, we, even after Euromaidan, there's still problems here and things that need to be addressed. And so I love the fact that we had the Hong Kongers here to, to be a part of this conversation as well. So now I'm not going to talk much more anymore because we're going to listen to uh, what everyone else has to say. But we're going to start with you, Melanie. Uh, Melanie Podolak, did, did, I did I pronounce your name correctly? Yeah, Podolak works fine, yeah. Greetings. Well, Melanie, thank you for joining us from Kiev. Now, you have been a friend of, of Sergei and, and his girlfriend for a few years, and so you're, you're a media consultant um, by, uh, you know, that's your profession, but your passion now is helping your friend uh, get out of this mess and, and 
helping him, uh, you know, spread spread his message. So can you tell us first who, who Serhei is and, and how he got into the situation? Um, thank you very much. So, um, friends, uh, for people who don't know, so he um, is a Ukrainian, used to be Odessa-based activist, and his main concern had to do with criticizing and fighting uh, pro-Russian uh, politicians as well, because Odessa is a very complex region. So the criminality and the local government authorities and the police are deeply intertwined within the region. So basically, he had a you know, had to fight on all the fronts. And he was opposed to pro-Russian policies. I mean, the mayor of Odessa currently holds a a Russian citizenship. Uh, Moreover, there are he was an active participant in the Euromaidan uh, revolutions and whatnot. Um, and so he was one of the people who actually helped uh, uh, the city of Odessa not becoming, uh, you know, a battlefield for Russian-Ukrainian war the way we see it in the east of Ukraine. So he was basically, um, he was mostly concerned with, as I said, pro-Russian narratives, uh, also the illegitimate illegal constructions in the cities, uh, on the places of, uh, you know, public gatherings and whatnot. But what happened was um, he does have a YouTube channel, which has been highly successful in, in, you know, on that front. What happened was uh, he was attacked three times, and all three attacks we ha- do have evidence. They were commissioned by um, the... Uh, uh, Odessa Regional um, uh, Council had so like the mayor of Odessa in in, in so in in collaboration with with the police. Uh, he was attacked first on the seventh of February two thousand eighteen, where he was he was with his girlfriend during all three attacks. They were beaten with with bats in the car, and he was severely injured. And then on the May first two thousand eighteen, he was shot in the back of the neck, and uh, he actually did uh, commit a citizen arrest of his the perpetrator however that has not the court case has not been successful as of now yeah, and, and Melly, so we only have a, a minute more but he, he was shot with a rubber bullet and but he and he uh was able to fight back he was then, able uh, yet to uh, subdue him and, and yeah and we we will share with everyone too because there needs to be a lot of reporting done on this because because there's a lot of you know because yeah, sure. there there was a famous case where uh, he in self in self def- he was there was an assassin after him yeah so and, third, and third, two assassins third attack yeah, he had two assassins yeah. attack him, and he, then he, one of them, uh, I mean, I'm sorry to say that, but died, uh, and that was self-defense mm-hmm. case. And coming back to what happened, so because the local authorities and government authorities have seen that they have are, are having big trouble with trying to pin a murder charge on him during that trial, what they did, they pulled out an old case from 2015, which was basically based on far-fetched facts. And what happened was, because we do have analysis from lawyers who can read it on his page, we're posting there all the time. So basically, they took that case, which is a non-story, which might as well have been written in crayon, and um, he was sentenced to seven years in prison for that. Uh, So as of now, uh, we are going to have more uh, protests uh, in that regard. We're going to... uh, we we will basically we will not stop. That's the very point until he's out of jail. And most people criticize us for not directing our uh, anger at the people responsible, so the judiciary system, the whatnot. However, we do have a president who's a guarantor of the constitution. So we 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 do not care at this point. So our friend who is in jail, by the way, he's in jail in Odessa, where obviously the criminality is being controlled by the state. Uh, the state uh, government. So we do believe that he is in danger in jail. And so we need him out. It's not, it's not a point of, you know, like, you know, it's about justice and it's about keeping our friends mm. safe. It's about keeping a, a person who is fighting for Ukraine's independence for years now. It's a matter of keeping him safe and, and, and sound and out of jail. Great. Hey, Melanie, thank you so much for sharing that with us. And, and I, I hope that, you know, people can start doing their own research and, and we can get some more reporting on this topic. But oh, please do follow and, our official yeah. page, Sternanko's official page, and then also his YouTube channel. Please, please put that in the chat and then so people can follow it. Uh, we'll directly. do that. And uh, Melanie, thank you very much. And now um, we're going to move to, to the Hong Kong segment. So, uh, and um, now we return to our Hong Kong friends, um, uh, Baggio, uh, Daniel, and Simon. Uh, and just a, a note, uh, Simon and Daniel, they, they have launched uh, the Free Hong Kong Democrats Movement. Their idea is to make a shadow government. And so far, 17 legislators from the U.S., U.K., and Canada, Australia uh, have signed their petition. So they're trying to build momentum. But first, uh, let's start. Um, uh, Baggio, what, um, 
if you if you could tell us what is the um uh i need to start with this day you know your day of escape and and when you left hong kong did you know that you know i mean you knew what you were doing that this was you were you were leaving for a long time and and walk us through what happened that day Yes, uh, I'm Bajil. So uh, I'm a former legislator who was elected by the people of Hong Kong back in 2016. And one of the first people that was forcefully disqualified by the Chinese Communist Party from our local parliament. And then I was charged at an awful assembly, which respectively, for entering the parliament chamber as well after I was disqualified from a body that I had been elected to. And then I was jailed for a month for such a ridiculous so-called crime. And when I got released in September 2020, I noticed that some people were always following me. We had no idea who they are, but judging from experience, that usually was a bad sign that being on the regime's radars again. And nothing good follows. Uh, that's Hong Kong right now. I would say that, that is a, like a city of white terror under the evil CCP regime. And that's the reason why I'm here, because I'm no longer feel safe at home. And uh, what, and, but, and, and your actual escape was sort of, I mean, it, it was not so dramatic, right? You were, you were surprised, you were, able, you were able just to get on a plane and go, is that correct? Yes, uh, the, the, the story is normal. Actually, I bought the airline ticket three hours before the departure as late as possible to make sure it is secure. And then after I bought the uh, uh, airline ticket, I go to the airport. Uh, there's some strange person in, in Hong Kong air, airport that, that, uh, but that is somehow a new normal. In, in these days, but uh, finally, I, I I I can get into and and then and then now I'm in Washington D.C. And can can you describe? Was there? I mean, because from afar, watching the events of 2019, you know, you still had. Well, I mean, you you personally were living in sort of this white terror, you know, with people following you around. But you still had freedom of speech. You still had some rights. Uh, and what was the, like, to, to correct me if that's a tell me if that's a correct assessment of it, but and it seemed that you had a chance, you know, something you guys were building towards something. I don't know what it was, and then all of a sudden everything changed. Maybe with the virus, or was it with the the introduction of the security law? But but tell us about how things have changed in the past in the past year, past two years. Actually, in 2019, I think uh, most of you know that Hong Kong do have a uh, rank of uh, protest movement uh, to against the, the extradition bill amendment. Uh, but uh, both the pandemic and also a new launch, uh, a national security law in Hong Kong give the movement a big hit and give Hong Kong is a big hit as well. The pandemic basically shut down all um, activities in, in Hong Kong. And also the national security law actually grant the government powers to establish uh, national security agents forces in, in Hong Kong lawfully. And also if they arrest any people in Hong Kong, uh, they can ban you from leaving Hong Kong before they, they, they put it, the case onto, into the court. So basically, uh, uh, the law grant uh, Hong government powers to ban any people in Hong Kong to leave. And um, from experience, like some well-known activists, uh, Agnes Chow, Joshua Wong, before they were arrested, they will be followed by someone. And so that's why I mentioned um, uh, uh, Usually, if there was a sign that being on regime's radars again, being followed by someone who you don't know, that is usually bad news in Hong Kong right now. And this With is, um, I would say, uh, a bit normal life that are facing daily uh, by every Hong Kongers. And when you ran for office, did you think that things would turn this bad this quickly? You know, was that a surprise that, 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 that you're in this situation now? Actually, from starting from 2014, we have an umbrella movement. And in 2016, we have a fishbowl revolution. Uh, 
Uh, in the past few years, I would say that Hong Kong situation go, uh, go worse at, at a really quick speed and even quicker uh, than most of our expectation. Uh, and and National Security actually is the last big hit that that uh, uh, what CCP do. What CCP do is simply uh, destroy everything in Hong Kong, destroy the system, and destroy the the goodwill that Hong Kong as a financial center in the common world. And so this is one of the last big hit that the CCP do to Hong Kong right now. And let's uh, uh, also bring uh, Daniel and Simon into it, and because here we can talk about, I mean, you have an enormous challenge. But what, 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 what is your game plan? What's your objective? What do you got? You like Daniel and Baggio? You're in Washington now. What are you trying to do? And, and Daniel, maybe you want to answer answer that. Sure. So basically, what we are seeing here, uh, the the anti extradition movement in Hong Kong has been remarkable. I think it's uh signifies not only about you know the Hong Kong protests, you know, or Hong Kong versus China, or you know, or even U.S. versus China. It's a battle between dignity and authoritarianism. It's a battle between liberty and tyranny here. So uh, what we are seeing here that that like you know, I have been here in D.C. since um 2018. So uh, about six months since I, I've stayed here, like you know, I um there was a one million march, a march in Hong Kong, uh, against the extradition protest here, and then uh we had, I I've met a lot of like my activists in Washington D.C. and then uh they actually co-founded an organization called DC for HK. I was a member of that, of that as well, and then actually at the time there's actually uh, a lot of different global cities, like 50, 60 global cities, march in life of the Hong Kong protests as well. I remember on the day um, on um, July, uh, on June 16, 2019, there were actually 2 million march on the street protesting against this law, the, anti the extradition law here. So imagine in Hong Kong, it's only 7 million sit, uh, people, population in Hong Kong. Two of every seven people march on the street protesting against a specific law here. We once thought that would be successful because uh, at the time we have a slogan saying that like if if we if we burn, you burn with us. However, with the sweeping national security law here, uh, you know, which was you know uh, enacted in Hong Kong uh, back in July 2020, there has been a uh, su suppressive threat down of the Hong Kong pro-democracy movement. Uh, I remember actually a, a lot of different Hong Kong stars from around the globe, we have not given a fight here. In uh, in America alone, a lot of different advocacy groups have, have been you know, advocate, advocating some bills in, uh, in support of Hong Kong freedom. For example, in November um, 2019, the, uh, the Congress actually passed the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act. In July, the Congress also passed the Hong Kong Autonomy Act. So we see that Hong Kong issue has always been a bipartisan issue that's have both uh, the support of both sides, both aisles of, of, uh, of, of, of the crap Congress here. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are thinking what we can do here. So um, at first uh, we talk, uh, I, for, for myself, I established an organization uh, with uh, other like my edifice called uh, Hong Kong for US because we are thinking how do we repay our gratitude to this country in standing up instead of for freedom here. So basically we uh we actually crowdfunded about three hundred thousand uh, US dollars within 37 days. We call uh, and then we use those money to purchase the surgical masks and PPEs and distributing distributing around the medical workers and hospitals around this across this country. We call this a citizen diplomacy here. We also uh, co founded an organization called Hong Kong Professional Network, which was basically the the, uh, the organization for Hong Kong diaspora. But most recently, uh, me and Simon, uh, we are actually like good friends back then because we were classmates back in the the School of Economics. Uh, we were studying international relations at the time. So by the time um, when he got his asylum in the UK, I was in the US front and he was in the UK front. And we were thinking what we can collaborate together in face of this sweeping national security law. So at the time we have founded the, uh, we have founded the Hong Kong Shared Parliament. Well, um, just give you a, a news basically just three days ago. Um, the district council in Hong Kong, which is actually the last outpost of Hong Kong democracy has you not know, been suppressed because they, the requirement required those 
uh, uh, legislators who have public mandate to preach allegiance to the Communist Party. Basically, we do Wait, not- if I could say, because because they they never let people like Baggio into the parliament, right? And so it's not it does not represent the people. You're saying. Well, uh, what Baji has strong would be the lucky legislature, the Hong Kong Legislative Council. And right now it has been fully suppressed. The people have been disqualified mm-hmm. and those people who run for candidates has been arrested. Now we do have some regional district uh, this council in Hong Kong, which do have the full democratic body. This is actually the last outpost, but which was also suppressed as well. So basically, with the draconian national security law, we do not see there will be any form of democratic platform in Hong Kong. And that's why the Hong Kong Shadow Parliament comes into place, because we were to provide the only democratic platform for Hong Kongers all around the globe. For people like, you know, activists like Ba Jiu Leung, who were the, the, the former legislator, and the only former legislator who is seeking a sub in the United States could also run for the election for the Hong Kong Shadow Parliament. And we also welcome you know, a lot of activists around the globe to also run for the election as well, because we want to provide a public mandate to them. And also, uh, we do welcome people from all, all Hong Kongers from all over the globe, including he, the Hong Kongers in Hong Kong, to have the right to vote for the own candidate through the Hong Kong Shadow Parliament, Shadow Parliament as well. I would have to say this is a very unprecedented, and we are trailblazer in organizing this because we are actually collaborating with different uh, internet VPN companies with their technical technical capacity to provide a free and secure me- uh, method for people mm. to vote for the for the uh, for the uh, 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 for the politicians as well. But what I think is very remarkable that we do see there's more up uh, more and more Assam seekers in Hong Kong, from Hong Kong, who are going to other countries. And we do see anticipate there will be overwhelming Hong Kong's immigration to all over the world in light of this lifeboat saving scheme. Like in US, they will be discussing Hong Kong Safe Harbor Act. UK, they've already opened yeah. the door for millions of BNO holders as well. So I think they will, this will be successful and a lot of people will also we welcome them to join the cause to sustain our political participation as well. Because it seems that yeah, as more and more people hopefully are able to 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 get out, unfortunately, of Hong Kong, this structure will be created, uh, and, and sort of it reminds me of the great tradition of shadow parliaments, you know, during during the Iron Curtain during World War II, and uh, so and we want to. It's another big thing we need to follow and learn more about. If we could bring uh, uh, Simon in, uh, also from London, uh, or from London, uh, and uh, to to hear. Um, your take on you know what, what what how you're advancing this idea uh, in London that would be great, um, Simon. Yeah, so uh, thanks for uh, for the invitation. Um, actually, now in the UK, uh, we are quite busy on receiving over you know suspected thousands of millions of people if they're supposed to come to the UK. And previously, we also set up the groups for those people. Uh, who may seeking asylum in here. So that would be a long-term landscape, uh, what we can think, how to keep the flame of democracy, which is we have to recognize that the, those people now living in Hong Kong, they need to take greater risk uh, ever uh, to achieve democracy. So we, we are thinking right after 2019, quite many new Hong Kongers groups that have a strong sense of identity have been set up overseas. We need to keep continuous to build the desperate community around the world. So that's why at this moment, I'm also focusing on setting up the expat groups in the UK. The name is Hong Kongers in Britain. And of course, that the shared parliament at this moment uh, to be honest, like the spotlights of the news and most of the people concerned how to seek asylum, how to leave the place they regarded as the dangers. And we gradually feel the fatigue happening in Hong Kong. And that naturally, that's they were a little bit, you know, doubtful and even skeptical to see, you know, whether Hong Kong was, uh, whether Hong Kong should have would works or not. But we received over thousands and uh, the public submissions feedback. And we understood, you know, the major parties from Hong Kong, and then they both quite supportive. They would feel, well, no matter you like it or not, but there's no another, another way. So we, that is the things that we should try. 
So that's why uh, we have this golf idea, and we wanted to push it. And at this moment, just as Daniel said, uh, we are uh, in talk with the uh, NGOs to seek the funding opportunities, and also we're in talk with the VPNs and cybersecurity companies to be more uh, technically prepared, which is make it more deliverable. We are moving on from the concept level, which is most of us most of us agree that we should do something, but how to deliver to make sure those people back in Hong Kong could be safely to vote. That will be the issue we're working on. Great, Simon, thanks. And we're gonna uh, go over to uh, Alexander now in, in a moment, but I, I, I want, and then as we, uh, when we bring Arthur in after that, we can talk about, um, uh, bring, we'll bring everyone back into conversation. Uh, so think of some questions we all wanna ask each other, but uh, we all, I also wanna, in that segment here a bit about how your families are doing back home and, and, and what that struggle is like, um, especially given your high profile. Uh, so, so we'll look into that and then we'll hear the story of how uh, Ukraine, and Euromaidan uh, influenced um, uh, Hong Kong as well, um, despite what we just heard about is happening in, in Odessa. But uh, with that, uh, can we, uh, we'll, we'll switch over to, to you, Alexandra, in, in Switzerland. And, um, and uh, uh, Alexandra uh, has you know, a, a varied career doing many things, but uh, she has spent a lot of time studying uh, Africa and in particular Chinese influence in Africa. And she's, she's got a book about it. And, uh, you know, Africa, we haven't heard much about that continent in most media about, you know, during the COVID time. And we certainly haven't uh, heard much about Chinese influence there um, through its uh, Belt and um, Roads Initiative. But now I will give, uh, Alexander, I'll give you the floor. And uh, uh, hello from Lviv to, to, to Switzerland. <laughs> Thanks so much, Joe. It's an honor to be part of this important conversation. And uh, yeah, I'll um, maybe sh shift shift the, the dialogue slightly from to a, a bit of a policy uh, policy discussion around uh, some of China's ideological uh, ideological influence, ideological uh, initiatives across the the African region, which is a region that I've been studying for. Uh, the better part of the last decade, if not if not longer, I may be dating myself a little bit. Um, but I want to uh, maybe frame the conversation actually uh, from the perspective of Africa's significance uh, to China, because I think that'll help us grasp some of the reasons um, for and the contours of some of Beijing's ideological influence in the region. And there's, of course, a lot of lot to unpack. Um, but I'll maybe highlight just a few points. And the first being, and I think that this is more, more broadly applicable, that in the West, uh, when it comes to addressing the various challenges that China poses, the thinking that we see coming out of Washington or the thinking that we often see coming out of Brussels tends to be quite siloed and quite bilateral. So far, there isn't a clear China strategy that would be embedded in a broader regional strategy or even a, a more global strategy. On both sides the, of the Atlantic, the issue is still somewhat treated in isolation. And this is very different from how Beijing thinks. Um, Beijing, and especially since she assumed the presidency, has a kind of developed a global strategy, which uh, I would argue quite simply involves chipping away at various tenets of the Western liberal democratic order. And I think we have to be quite clear about that. And with that in mind, Beijing's efforts, whether it's respect with respect to the US or to Europe, or in this case, Africa, they're all intertwined. Um, so for Beijing, there isn't a specific US-China policy per se. There is an approach to dealing with the United States that fits and helps a broader, uh, advance a broader policy agenda. And the same is true with respect to other regions. And in this context, Africa becomes important in the first instance as diplomatic partners. Like any other country, if China wants to achieve its, its broader policy aims, it needs alliances. And historically, African states have shown themselves to be quite laudable partners. Already back in the 1950s, soon after the establishment of the PRC, around the time of many African lib liberation movements, Beijing was already courting African leaders. You had the Bandung Conference in 55, which was the first encounter between communist China and many of the newly independent African states. And that event really laid down the parameters of, of the relations, um, some of which continue today, if, if only in, in rhetoric alone. But in Bandung, um, that you already saw this idea emerging of Beijing positioning itself in opposition to what it saw as Western imperialism and as this kind of self-defined anti-hegemonic power, which for African states that were at the time emerging from decades of colonialism, this was 
understandably appealing. And without going into too much historical detail, when in 1971 China became a member of the UN Security Council, this was at least in part helped um, by the 26 African member states at the time. So with that history in mind, a big part of Beijing's recent efforts in the African region since the early 2000s have been with a similar aim. I would argue that the tactics they've shifted a bit over the last 20 years from a bit more of a purely economic and realist approach to a more normative, I would argue, almost more moralistic one. But the objective of gaining African diplomatic support, it remains largely unchanged. And I would say has even strengthened over the last few years, given geopol various geopolitical dynamics. The second reason for Africa's significance, particularly as it relates to our conversation today, is a product of its demographics. So we know it's the world's youngest continent, nearly 60% of its population, uh, of the continent's population is under the age of 25. And often we tend to discuss this in the context of either its market potential and or the development challenges that it might pose. But Beijing, again, has a different lens on this. And it sees it arguably quite rightly, and it sees this, this usefulness as the next generation of leaders, political leaders, business leaders, tech entrepreneurs, and so on. And if you look at where the CCP has increasingly been directing its attention, it's less on the current leadership, except to the extent that it has to engage with it, and more on Africa's youth. Every year, Beijing is tra training over a thousand up-and-coming African journalists. It's providing political training, training on the CCP's ideology, its governance structures, its economic development model to over 10,000 uh, future perceived future African political leaders. So it's playing a very, very long game to ensure that the next generation shares the CCP's conception of the global order and its value system rooted in a kind of collective memory. And I just want to spend a few minutes on that notion of collective memory. It cuts across many dimensions. So the trainings, education, news media, and also cultural institutions, film, TV, music, tech, social media apps like TikTok, for instance, are becoming incredibly popular across most of the African region, particularly in Nigeria, Kenya, Ghana, some other markets. And another sector that, interestingly, Chinese companies are pushing into uh, in Africa, but also elsewhere, is the mobile gaming industry. And if you stick with me for a minute, uh, there, there is a there is an interesting point to be made here. Um, in so far as mobile gaming is becoming very popular across the African region, as more and more uh, people gain access to mobile communications, um, and if you uh, just to, to give an example, so two of the continent's largest uh, gaming markets, Nigeria, South Africa, they're growing by about 30% to 2023. And the Chinese are, companies are pushing um, quite aggressively into this. And part of the reason is that the CCP has long objected to the dominance of Western narratives and global discourse, right? Western history, Western mythology, religious symbolism. And especially in the last five years or so, it started to make marked efforts to seize global discursive power, to insert Chinese or rather CCP sanctioned narratives into various international occasions, various international institutions to create what an Oxford professor, Ron Amitter, he calls a new kind of a remembering, tells China stories well, spread China's voice well. These are phrases that you start to hear more and more in many of Xi's speeches. And the cultural industries, including gaming, are excellent vehicles for doing exactly that. And I'll maybe just give one, one brief example from within the, the gaming sector in particular. You have developers like Tencent or NetEase. They're developing games that are intended to, and I'll briefly, it's a quote that appeared in, in China Daily back in 12, 2017, quote, inspire Westerners to learn about Chinese history and legends. So you have developers that last year, there was a gaming developer, MiHoYo, that released a game called Genshin Impact. This game has become big on the global gaming stage, also in Africa and Ghana and Nigeria and South Africa. It's based entirely on Chinese mythologies, of course, filtered through the communist lens, and it censors terms. It censors terms like Hong Kong, like Taiwan, like Tibet, other terms that the CCP likely finds objectionable. And so video games and mobile games, they're quickly becoming another tool for Beijing to spread its ideology and its worldview and to do so in quite a subtle way. Um, the aim of many of these modern games, right, is to create this wholly immersive experience for the players. The players become characters in these fictional worlds. And in that kind of setting, messaging, even or especially of covert messaging, that becomes extremely, extremely powerful. Um, one other quick example, if I may, Chinese television has become quite dominant on the African continent, news media, Xinhua and others, but also 
television shows, films, movies, etc. There's a television show. It's kind of a romantic comedy. That's become quite a favorite among various East African audiences. It entered the Tanzanian market in 2011, um, and it just expanded throughout the region. It's produced by the Shanghai Media Group, which is China's biggest media and cultural conglomerate. And it just very simply tells the story of a family living in, in urban China. Um, when she visited Tanzania in 2013, he referred to this show, and he said that it would, quote, help Africans learn the joys and sorrows of an ordinary Chinese family, this kind of idea what the German thinker Hans Morgenthau referred to, I think, as strategic empathy. Uh, and that the numbers on, on these kinds of initiatives, they are, for obvious reasons, a little bit fuzzy. But it's estimated that Beijing has a budget of over 8 billion US dollars just to expand this kind of media presence and cultural presence throughout the African region. So a few years ago, Xinhua shifted its uh, EU uh, Africa network out of its Paris office to Nairobi. And you have other networks that have multiple offices and are broadcasting very widely across the continent. And they're operating with this aim of telling China stories well and changing and shaping the global narrative in the CCP's favor, not only now, but also in the long term with this view to future partnership and future alliances uh, among, among others. And I think the question for those of us here today, you know, and those who believe in the tenets of a liberal democratic world order, however imperfect it may sometimes times be. Uh, the question is, is what to what to do about that? And I'll, I'll maybe pause there having gone on for a little bit. Um, but that's a little bit from the African continent. Lots to unpack. <laughs> Alexandra, that, that was uh, fantastic and fascinating, fantastic. And it's a great segue now to Arthur, because on, on two, uh, one that we're not going to really talk about now, but uh, one thing you hear about in Ukraine so much is the influence of Russian media. Um, and that's been a problem here. But uh, but what but a story that we don't hear uh, is what Arthur has been focused on uh, as the founder of the Free Hong Kong Center. Uh, he was writing a, a book and went to do research in Hong Kong and became captivated by the people there, people like Baggio and Daniel and Simon and, and their passion for liberty and their love for Ukraine and for the Euromaidan revolution. And so, Arthur, if you could, uh, you know, give give us an overview of, of you know, what, what is uh, specifically in Ukraine? What what is China's influence here right now, and what what are uh, Beijing's aims? Um, thank you very much. Good evening, guys. From K for a second. Yeah, so um, I just would love to continue what Alexander mentioned before about Africa and China. And actually, you know, it's very easily we could take on the example of China and Russia, because I think the biggest colony of China is, of course, Russia. And impact of China on Russia right now is incredible. Like, even from the side of mobile games or TV shows, like China is everywhere in Russia. And once we're talking about Russia, we, of course, would need to mention Ukraine, because the fight uh, of Ukraine against Russia is a geopolitical fight uh, of the Western world against Russia and China. And uh, right now in Ukraine, we could follow really a lot of corruption scandals connected to China because China is everywhere where Russia is. Like even main Russian TV channels are very related to China. Russian media sharing Chinese narratives and etc. And uh, of course, um, like the biggest street is uh, security one because, you know, Ukraine is the last gate of Europe to Asian Chinese world. And um, it is very big trouble to us because, for example, in the case of motor siege, the biggest, like, let's say, military uh, factory in Europe, which was tried to be bought by Chinese government. Uh, right now, we could see that Ukraine established sanctions against Wanjin and uh, allies of CCP in this case, um, just after integration of Joe Biden in America. And I think like it's something like good signs Ukraine finally started to fight uh, against Chinese corruption and um, to do some good steps. But from other hand, for example, right now Ukraine is facing extremely big corruption scandal over Shinovac vaccine from coronavirus, because, you know, like it is the biggest scandal in the world. Like we could compare cases of Ukraine and Philippines, but let's say Philippines is not democracy or so far due to their own regime. But Ukraine is democracy and we are facing different challenges. And um, since, you know, in Ukrainian Minister of Health bought in a legal way Shinovac vaccine, and told that uh, this corrupted schemes was proposed by actually Shinovac. So that means that right now Ukraine could be the biggest epicenter of um, 
Chinese vaccine corruption scandal, which is making a lot of troubles to CCP. And uh, as far as I know, like China uh, is extremely mad. They're pressing a lot our government. And just two weeks ago, the ambassador of Ukraine, China, was eventually died. Uh, from heart attack, but without no facts what happened to him. And from my sources, I know that it was very big pressure from CCP on him to solve all these corruption issues and to whitewash China in Ukraine. Arthur, if you could tell, what, what was the corruption regarding the vaccine? What, 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 what was the, what, what's the problem as you see it? Mm-hmm. So, firstly, it was like a situation that Ukraine government did very bad in the case of communication with Western um, farm companies. But uh, they thought, okay, we will not go ahead with, with the West. We will go to China and to talk about Sinovac. And Ukraine was one of the more first countries in the world bought Sinovac and paid, prepaid it uh, with very high price. Like, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's something like uh, 13 or $18 per. Uh, uh, one dose, but like it's a, a very high price actually for this shit. Uh, and uh, the problem is that uh, it was bought via proxy firm of Raisa Bakhatyova, who was the head of Security Council of Yanukovych regime and also ex Minister of Health, extremely related to Kremlin. And this proxy firm told that um, actually all these price issues and all these contracts between Ukraine and China should be via proxy just because uh, China told to do it via this corrupted proxy of Raisa Bakhtarova, who is extremely related to Yanukovych, who was dictator of Ukraine during revolution of dignity times. So um, it's very, very complicated. But what we could say so far is that um, China is trying to be everywhere in healthcare uh, sphere. And the last Last report of Estonian uh, intelligence forces they just uh, proven that everything is so bad because it's very first time when our region started to speak up um, about Chinese influence and told that China is the biggest threat to the world, not Russia. Well, and, and Arthur, I've heard and I've read, I've read uh, your words on this, but you refer to Russia and China as the the red hydra, like the, the two sided, yeah. uh, two faced red hydra. Uh, and if you explain that idea, but then why? What do they want from Ukraine? Why, you know, why? What, what, mm-hmm. what does Ukraine offer that that they want so so much? If that is what, if if they do want something from from Ukraine. Well, Ukraine is the biggest country of Europe. We should always remember it. And it's a very strong one. Like, we have a lot of, um, like, let's say, infrastructure, infrastructure, technical, military heritage from uh, Soviet Union, the same one as Russia has, but right now is more developed because of the war on the East. Um, and also, from other hand, Ukraine is, let's, uh, as I told before, is a gate to the West. So probably once China is there, first of all, it could, um, you know, steal some information from our military factories or our different security objects. From other hand, they always could show to the world that, well, Ukraine is a country where we are presented. So from Ukraine, we could go to our regional countries near the European Union, because let's say Poland right now is facing democracy crisis. Hungary is facing extremely huge democracy crisis. And let's say Balkan region, which is also very important to China, because China tried firstly to impact, for example, Bulgaria strongly but it was kicked out by a force, a joint force of NATO and European Union. So um, for China, Ukraine is something like very big proxy um, territory where they could gain really a lot. And of course, uh, the last point in core one, agriculture. You know, Ukraine is agricultural leader of the world, probably one of them among them. And uh, China is extremely, extremely aggressive. Just imagine that as a head of Chinese diaspora in Ukraine is the owner of the majority of agricultural firms in uh, Kharkiv region, and uh, like he's very aggressive and very connected, to, for example, with Russian oligarchs. Well, thanks. And I, uh, I want to, as, uh, for, for our last segment, uh, I will. Uh, I'd like for you guys to ask each other questions because I think you have a lot of, you know, I think you can extract some great information and you know the right questions to ask. And maybe I'll, I'll start that though with. Uh, say Baggio or Daniel or Simon, maybe one of you could say to someone sitting, a Ukrainian in Ukraine, you know, say, you know, uh, you know, hearing Arthur talk about China or, or someone sitting in, in Nairobi or even in, in, in the United States, uh, based on your experience closely with, with the regi- regime of Beijing, 
you know, should we be caring about these things? Should we be alert to these things? And, and you know, what's your advice to us? Should I go first? Please, Bajil, yeah. Uh, I would say that um, basically we can see the case from Africa, from Ukraine, from everywhere among the world that to struggle your country with your own system, that is what CCP doing. They are using other countries. Wait, I'm sorry, sorry, Bajil, can, can, you, can, you, can you say that again? To struggle CCP your says with your own system. This is what CCP mm -hmm. is doing. And they are using other countries' system to twist things around, to cause chaos, to mess things up, and to, to use it against them. When you believe in free speech, they will do protests in your backyard to call you out. When you believe in free press, they will establish auto finance the media and use those medias to lie to your population, to spread their, their propaganda, including uh, not only medias, maybe like in Africa, they, they do game industry, uh, they do it in the game industry, but similar um, logic. When you believe in free market, they will bring state run or state support companies that can sell at a low cost to put your company in some industry out of business. This is what they do. And of course, the free world need to be aware of this. And more importantly, we should act now to stop the silent invasion. The modern, the modern war is not about sending tanks and soldiers to, to, to another uh, country and try to do, do an invasion. This is not. But this is like you can do it politically, you can do it economically. And you can do it in, in your daily life. So we should act now before it is too late and don't follow the track of Hong Kong or state, I will say. In Hong Kong, uh, most of our uh, uh, companies that, that related to our daily life is greatly controlled by, by the Beijing government right now. And, and China is not only a problem for Hong Kong, not just for Asia, but a looming threat to the international order, you can see, and democracy everywhere. From the denial responsibility for the COVID-19 pandemic to bullying other countries like uh, 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 Australia, Canada, they all show that the free world leadership role in confronting that the China problem has never been more important. I want to echo. Uh, yeah. Oh, maybe Simon, after you. Sorry, after you. Simon. Yeah, I, I I wanted to ask a question um, to Alex Sandra. Um, because I'm so impressed um, that uh, Alexandra has a very great knowledge and sense of the propaganda, um, which the CCP is running around the world. Um, why is because that um, I've been one of the victims by the propaganda machine. I've been broadcast my enforced confection videotapes through CGTN. So I fly the compla complaint to Ofcom in the UK. And finally, I'm so glad to see Ofcom decide to revoke the license of the CGTN in London. Um, we're not sure what's the next destination, um, but at least that would be quite significant so far because um, in London, that would be the European headquarters. And I also can see, um, for example, when I um, study at LC in London with Danny, we, we, we saw quite a lot of the students and even some of the teachers, they have lots of relations with Chinese embassy or the funding from the Confucius Institute. And then they try to reshape the dialogues and try to match with, you know, to justify why China is a democratic country. And I'm not sure, just one of the questions is that, would you feel after the protests in Hong Kong, we can see, seems like at least the West and, you know, democratic countries, they seems like waking up. And would you feel now um, the the propaganda campaign is like a little bit declining of the CCP? And would you feel in the future whether that they were back on the water? Because a few days ago, I watched the news from Guardian. It seems like Boyd Johnson uh, in Downing Street, they have the uh, pro China business groups meeting and said, you know, they wanted to uh, relaunch the dialogue in terms of economic trade and et cetera. So I'm not sure what, what, what you feel in the future about this. 
Yeah, that's a it's a interesting point. And also here in in Western Europe, you had the EU recently signing the uh, China investment agreement, also opening doors, kind of largely spearheaded by by Germany in that context, with France also backing, spearheading, uh, opening the door to significant investment. And you know, also you know, I, I lecture at several universities here, and the um, Chinese influence is also quite strongly felt from an ideological perspective. So I actually personally don't see the propaganda machine slowing down, at least not from my perspective. I, I see maybe it becoming um, a little bit more embedded in various systems and institutions that make it more difficult to identify if you don't know what you're mm -hmm. looking for. Um, but mm -hmm. I wouldn't say that it's necessarily slowing down. And I mean, I, arguably, you can speak to it better than I can to some extent with the aims of uh, the CCP, its long term policy goals. I, I think uh, Bajo re referred to, you referred to this in your remarks as well. I think we need to realize that, you know, when we speak about China, sometimes we speak about economic competition or technological competition or whatever it might be. But I think we need to be quite clear that it's also a struggle of ideas that we're in. This is, this is an ideological kind of struggle and ideological warfare. So not boots on the ground, um, but a different kind of mentality that we have to adopt. Um, Speaking from the African region, just to circle back there, the propaganda machine is is incredibly incredibly strong and penetrates. You know, I, I really just kind of scratch the surface, and there it's a little bit more uh, difficult to push back, even if citizens in genre that don't necessarily. Uh, kind of propaganda to the fore or highlight it as as problematic because in some cases it benefits the governments in power as well uh, so it's it's a very difficult um, a very difficult issue to to tackle and unpack but I personally see it strengthening not not um, not waning anytime soon um, I see. I, thank you I do have some of the following questions as well. Uh, one is to Alexandra as well, and another one would be over uh, specific about Europe. Uh, so um, let me give you like a little bit heads up here because what we have witnessed in this year long, 2020, right? Um, what is the biggest issue in in the last year, 2020? That would be COVID-19, uh, undeniably. But what we actually talk about COVID-19, I would say this is not only about a global health or epidemic issue. This is a political issue. This is politics. Well, when the um, when the coronavirus first broke up in Wuhan as early, probably in November 2019, what the CCP does, they try, they did not try to contain the virus. They contain the people. They control the dissemination of the information. They arrest the whistleblowers, the nurses, and doctors as well. Actually, what this actually happened to Hong Kongers back in 2003 during the SARS pandemic. Uh, that took away more uh, about 299 Hong Kongers' life at the time. Also, because China was not able to con uh, was not able uh, to you know to try to be transparent in terms of the virus information, but they just control everything here. They did not learn from mistake, and now they uh, the virus swept across the globe in. This country alone, in the United States, there has been more than 200,000 people lost their life because of COVID-19, way more than the First World War, Second World War, and Vietnam combined here. But like, you know what we have seen here, I have to say, um, what happened in Hong Kong in 2019 and what, Hong Kong, what happened to the world in 2020, is, I think it's, it's, it has been a process. And I feel like the world has been awakening towards the Chinese flag. What uh, sometimes when I was doing my advocacy work with Baggio or with other like many editors, I was telling the biggest problem that we are seeing is would not be a domestic problem. The biggest threat to humanity would be the Chinese Communist Party. But I want to know, especially uh, to uh, Alexandra, because uh, also in echo with what Baggio said about uh, Chinese ethnic statecraft as demonstrated in the Belt and Road Initiative. Do you think this year onwards, there will be more and more, you know, multilateral effort towards the CCP, especially with the new administration? Uh, this is my question to Alexandra. And my follow up question to offer, uh, I would uh, ask in, in, in one go here. Like, you know, I think in Europe, as you mentioned that EU is trying, uh, you know, some of them, uh, some members in within EU parliament, they do want to sign their 
trade agreement with China. But what we are seeing here, because uh, what Hong Kong, we also learned from the Ukrainian revolution uh, back in 2014, earlier in 2014. And a lot, I feel like Ukraine is waking up, especially, you know, a lot of Eastern European countries who has been suppressed by Soviet Union at the time, they stood alongside Hong Kong, especially with the border states here. Do you think at some point, like, you know, some sort of these, like, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, Eastern European nations or even Scandinavian countries could make a change for uh, 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 influencing the other EU member states as well in seeing what is the common enemy as well? So these would be my two questions. Thank you. Do you like to go first, Arthur? <laughs> Do you want to go first, Arthur? <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. Uh, I mean, like, yeah, please, please, oh, Arthur, go, go first. Please yeah, go. I'm just... Ah, okay. Sorry, please, because like I, I don't know, like my mic was on and like I was surprised. Yeah, uh, I'm trying to be for quite quite short in these um, frames. Like you know, European Union is a very complicated um, but a very beautiful um, platform t in our region. And the problem is that like we are very different. But uh, talking about Eastern Europe and Eastern European nations, of course, we are much more uh, vaccinated from Soviet virus and communist viruses. That, for example, Western Europeans. And I think like the biggest trouble, uh, like not actually in Eastern Europe or even in Scandinavia, but of course in the, let's say, you know, like the most Western part of Europe, like in France, maybe somewhere in Spain, Italy, Greece, countries where um, people are very used to left ideas, let's say, and they're very um, like easily taking everything from socialist societies, especially France. France is a very big problem because, um, you know, it's like even Macron, he is very, very um, sympathetic to Putin. He is very, very sympathetic to Xi Jinping. And even what we have seen at the last um, Munich Security Conference, like Macron just told us, like, okay, we have a true, like, something like seems to be treated from China, but uh, like, let's say it's not like a very clear message to Europe or to the world. So uh, we need to really work to, to, with France to make them understand that, like, uh, China is a problem. But talking about uh, Eastern Europe, I think, like, um, we are quite, quite strong enough to, to make other part of Europe understand that China is just a second Soviet Union. Not more, not less. Yeah, maybe quickly picking up uh, a little bit of, of Arthur's thinking to, to answer your question, Daniel, as well. Um, in terms of uh, Western Europe, it's an uh, interesting discussion that happens here between the economic trade-offs and the, uh, let's say, more ideological normative issues that, that surround China. And depending on who you talk to, people fall on different different sides on that aisle, as, as Arthur mentioned. I think France is a problem. I would also potentially put Germany in, the, in that bucket um, as well. And so in terms of uh, multilateral efforts, I think the answer is, is yes and no. Um, no, for the reason that some are still going to put the economics before the, the normative uh, questions that we're discussing here today, unfortunately. Um, but yes, in the sense that, uh, as you mentioned, there is a steady awakening. Um, and I think that that awakening is happening, though, in regions that previously were not part of the traditional Western multilateral alliance. So moving away a little bit from traditional Western European allies and looking, for instance, to Australia, looking to India, looking to South Korea, looking to Japan, the so-called quad that has emerged. And I think that working in concert with to, to the United States under the Biden administration, and he's putting quite uh, significant emphasis early on on emphasizing democracy and emphasizing human rights um, as quite a cornerstone of the foreign policy agenda. I think there, there will be a bit of a coalescence, but it won't come from where we have traditionally seen it come from uh, before. So it'll take a little bit of time to emerge, but I very much hope that it will emerge because I, I agree with what's been said here. It's, it's one of the biggest uh, threats that we're facing at the moment uh, as a global community. Thank you very much. Thanks, Daniel. Wow. Uh, yeah, th thank you. Uh, for, uh, that was a great kind of concluding uh, question and answer. I know we, we could continue talking about this for, for much longer, and I hope we will continue uh, in multiple capacities. And uh, what an honor to bring all, all of you people together, uh, people that have lived through this in different ways, uh, most intensely, uh, you Hong Kongers. And, um, and just a quick thing before we go, but are you guys, are your families okay? Are you, I mean, how are you guys, how are you holding up? How are you doing? Well, I can say first, um, 
Um, I, I actually cut ties uh, with my family due to the uh, security concern um, because I am still active and vocal internationally. So um, based on the back track record of the CCP, what's one of the examples we can raise is like Blue Xiaobo and quite many dissidents, even in mainland China. They would use their family members as their hostage. And for example, like to me, I even I, I flagged and le- I left Hong Kong and I maintained basic communication with my families in Hong Kong. But after a few months, when the first time I start to receive the interview with the Cantonese and Chinese media, and my you know my family members gave me a call, and they never ever you know admit that you know I asked him I asked them whether you have some someone approach you, and then they said you know uh, if so what can you help us? So I understood that you know better uh, to live it. Um, so. I just wanted to make sure that the secret police that uh, they can't find any way to convey any message to me anymore. So that is the things I I I have to make this tough decision. Well, well, man, and then commendations to you guys. I mean, I think you know, as I walk these streets uh, of Lviv, uh, you know, recalling the history of you know 30, 40, 50 years ago, where people lived in that type of fear, and to know that it. It still exists and, and it's still it's a growing threat, uh, and so we will uh, we'll continue talking. We're we're going to package this into a podcast uh, to to share this and because it's just a great conversation. So if you'll please follow us, uh, follow the Lviv Lab on Facebook. And Karen from Georgetown has put that in the in the chat. Um, and I'd like to thank um, Dean Vladimir Turchinovsky uh, of the Ukrainian Catholic University and all the team uh, for for letting us uh, have this conversation. And uh, and we will also this was also broadcast on YouTube and we'll continue sharing it um, across all of our platforms. And so many thanks to uh, Arthur in Kiev, uh, Daniel and Baggio in Washington, Simon in London and Alexandra. And you're in Geneva, right? It's Geneva, right? Zurich. In Zurich. Correct. OK, I was going to say Zurich, but in Zurich. Sorry, Zurich. I knew I had it wrong. But <laughs> thanks to Alexandra in Zurich. And uh and with that, um, I will uh, yeah, tr- truly many thanks. And let's also we'll thank Melanie, who's already off the call. But for that, uh, let's not forget about that that that, that situation in uh, in Odessa um, with uh, with Sergei. So anyway, many thanks to you all, and uh, uh, good night. How would you guys say goodbye in, uh, in 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 Hong Kong? Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, you know, in your language. In your language. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Don't provide you no from Ukraine. Good night. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.